Hello? Hel hello? What's in a glass? <sighs> very peaty, very smoky scotch. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like the last bottle of, like, super peaty scotch that I have. It's not great. It's not a Laphroaig. I like a Laphroaig. This is maybe a bit too much. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say uh, if I like it or not. It's not terrible. I like, I like it because it's causing me to, like, you know, explore a little bit. But it's not necessarily something I would pick to eat regularly. Or drink regularly. Even more pe Oh, yeah, it's much peatier than a Laphroaig. It's fucking crazy, dude. It's fucking crazy. My wife loves the 10-year Laphroaig. Uh, any others you'd recommend? Um, the, like, if you're talking peaty scotch, I can't say I'm super familiar. I do like a good Laphroaig here and there. Um, personally, for scotches... So, I really like, well, not necessarily scotches, but just in general, uh, for, like, sipping drinks, I really like, um, I really like, uh, first of all, like, in order of maybe price, I really like, uh, Angel's Envy Rye. I don't know why I like the rye variant more, because everyone gives me shit for it. Not like they give me shit, but basically no one agrees with me. But I really like the Angel's Envy Rye. I also just like Angel's Envy in general, and I pretty much always keep Angel's Envy stocked. Um, what else? I do like an occasional dark rum, like a like a super fucking dark rum, like almost like kind of like a Kraken. Although Kraken isn't the best rum in my opinion. Uh, to be honest, I don't know, like, most of the names of the rums that I've drank when I've gone out to, like, places, you know, you know the place where the liquor menu is, like, literally hundreds and hundreds of options. Um, I also really like ports. Obviously, I like wines and whatever. Beers suck. Beers are just objectively bad. We just know that. Um, but I really like, uh, ports. I, basically, if port is offered on the fucking menu, I'll probably have a port... Uh, for like dessert or something. I fucking love port. I think port is really underrated. And it's surprising to me how many people I've introduced to port who I've like said, have you had port before? And they haven't, uh, which is pretty crazy to me. I think, I think port is fantastic. Um, and <laughs> port, basically anything over like 15 or 20 years is just going to be, you're going to be fine. Uh, in terms of scotches and other whiskeys, uh, I really like the Belvini line. I know it's a very basic scotch, very neutral, very, you know, pretty, pretty bland. Uh, but the, like, 13-year Caribbean cask, I think, is the, like, the best cheap scotch you can get, right? It's, it's aged in rum barrels, so it's a little bit sweeter, uh, than most scotches are. There's really no smokiness or anything really in any of the Belvini, uh, series. Um, and I had a friend who would do scotch nights, uh, once a year, like the scotch party, right? A big thing where basically everyone brings a bottle of scotch and then you all compare and whatever. Um, and one of my friends brought a uh, Belvini 13 Caribbean cask, or 12, or I think it's 13. Um, and they won. Basically, like, everyone thought it was the best scotch there in, like, a blind test. And I guess I don't know if it was 100% blind. But whatever. No one, no one there gave a shit about the cost. Um, it was not like it won based on cost. It won just objectively as, like, what people like the most in a scotch. Uh, so I think that is a great place to start if you've never done scotches before. It's very sweet. It's not like overly sweet, right? It, it's got a sweet hint to it. And I think it's uh, really an easy way to get into scotches. Other than that, I kind of just like going up the scale of the Belvinius. I think the 17 double wood is really good. They have like a 12 or a 13 double wood. Maybe it's a 15. I don't know what it is, but I know there's like a 17. 
Um, and that I think it's a 12 that they have that's the other double wood. It's not good. It's too, it's too sharp it, and, and not in a good flavory way. It just feels unrefined. Uh, I think the 17 is really good. So that double wood is, is really good. Um, and then I'll usually have like some scotch basically from any company that's like a, a 25 to a 35 year. Um, and I think those are all pretty fantastic across the board, especially when I'm not super picky about the undertones, whether it's super like peaty or whether it's super smoky or both or neither or sweet. Uh, I'm not super picky. I can kind of appreciate anything. I like smooth is the, the biggest thing that I like. Favorite hundred dollar scotch? I think the seventeen double wood. Um, I don't know if that's a hundred dollars. It might. It might be eighty. It might be one thirty. I honestly don't know. I don't drink enough anything to really care about the cost, especially for a scotch where I'm not going to drink that much of it. Um, port is delicious if you're into sweet drinks. Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of people are into sweet drinks. Like, ultimately. If you make a sweet drink or a sweet cocktail, it will very quickly become the most like popular cocktail at, at wherever you are. Even though old fashions are kind of in style, there's a reason they come in and out of phase and things like margaritas never go out, right? They're always in style. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's see here. Um, my wife loves the 10 year of Floyd. Oh yeah, that's how I started this conversation. But yeah, uh, I... I normally don't do Laphroaigs, but I'll always have them if they're available. And sometimes I'll do them to just piss people off. Uh, <laughs> like, like, I have definitely ordered, like, a super peaty scotch because uh, my mom was being annoying <laughs> just because it's, like, really potent. <laughs> do not recommend. Uh, but it was it was in good taste. <laughs> Buffer Buster, thank you so much for the six months of support. Hell yeah. Any tips on get it into embedded programming? Uh, fuck. I was going to say don't because that was that's the meme thing. Um, but yeah, just learn C. <laughs> just learn C. That's pretty much it. If you want to go deeper than that, just pick up a random dev board that's 20 to 30 bucks and start tinkering with it. Uh, that'll get you basically in, in the door pretty quickly and pretty easily. But uh, it's important to note that embedded development is typically not necessarily the pinnacle of code quality or productivity or just in general good practice with coding. So it's not necessarily, like that's why I say don't, is not actually don't do embedded dev. Uh, just in general, embedded dev is a little bit shittier development world. Uh, like it's just typically lower quality done by hardware engineers. Uh, and that's not a fucking jab at hardware engineers. It's just literally software engineering is a full-time job. And so is hardware engineering, right? So I wouldn't really expect my software devs to be able to put together a board really well in the same way that I don't really expect hardware devs to write very good software. Even though hardware devs typically can write software, mm, uh, you know, not definitely it is not universal, although it is overwhelmingly typically the case. Um, let's see. Uh, she likes the Eiley scotches. Yeah, this is, uh, I actually don't know if I know what scotch I'm drinking right now, and that's why I didn't say, uh, because it's like, uh, it came from like a, a scotch, um, like event sort of thing and I think the bottles were like relabeled or something maybe somewhere in fine print uh it, it says but I think it was like some weird thing where they were either blind or bulk or something I can't can't remember the what happened there um okay let's see um your monitor is way below eye level it's it's not really to be honest, I think that's more the, the camera angle that gives that appearance, that vibe. That's not really the case. Um, I got a gift of a Jack Daniels Sinatra Select uh, that I'm afraid to try because it's too good. Well, fucking open, crack that bad boy open. That sounds fantastic. Um, 
Know the mem mapped IO and IOCTLs for the device. Oh, yeah. We, we like... Oh, I think someone asked, like, where we got. Basically, we... We're kind of confused. We understand, basically, all of the components of the firmware now in terms of the compressed blobs and where things are relocated and where things are copied and where things are decompressed. Uh, but we do actually have one blob that seems to be a superset of the other blobs that get decompressed. So there's maybe reason to believe that some of them are the original ones, or maybe the firmware like has remnants of an old firmware version, uh, where like some of it's unused. There's a lot of unused space on the flash, so there's little reason to believe that they are hard pressed to like squeeze every you know bit they have on the flash. So potentially there's just duplicate things or different versions or maybe in certain modes like in a soft reboot one is like a differential reset and one is like the full reset everything it's really hard to say uh what's going on but we do have like the one big blob in fact all of the blobs we have decoded one was gzipped um it was actually like four pieces that were gzipped independently then we had a, another blob that used like a custom looks like kind of run length encoded compressed blob and then another run length encoded blob honestly i don't know if they're using the same code they're not using the same actual code in the firmware but i didn't look at the function shape to see if they actually are are functionally the same compression algo maybe they are um but those look hand rolled uh or like a bog standard rle implementation maybe hoffman tables i don't think so though um and there's like some standard, you know, check some stuff going on there. So we understand that. And we kind of popped open. I know it seemed like a lot of time, but when we were looking through the, the firmware yesterday, we were mainly looking at uh, finding addresses, figuring out where m RAM is mapped, figuring out where MMIO devices are, figuring out if RAM is duplicated or aliased multiple times in the address space. That's where like it might be mapped at zero, but then you can also view the exact same memory at you know 18 million hex or something if it's repeated uh, and that's something you will often see in the embedded devices and the way that that is typically done um, is the address lines like the top bits of the address lines are just not connected or they're you know they're not used, you know, they're probably connected in some way, but not used. Uh, and that basically has the effect that the top bits, even though you're at 18 million hex, those lines aren't connected. So if you were to mask off those top bits, you'll find you're just at zero again. Um, so basically, some of the things that I want to figure out, and that's kind of what we're in the process of doing, even though we kind of poked around and looked for some bugs, and some people might be wondering why I wasn't like renaming things or making structures or putting good names on the things that I'm reversing. Ultimately, I still don't consider uh, us to be at a reversing stage. I don't consider us to be at a level where we understand the device well enough and understand how things are mapped, where things are in memory, what regions I need to have defined in my databases. Uh, and since I don't have those things, um, I don't really invest in a database. You saw that yesterday. We probably deleted our database and recreated it 10, 20 times as we found, you know, different instruction sets that we slightly needed to tweak or endianness changes or address locations or aliasing issues, or maybe we found another section of the firmware that gets mapped in at a later stage, and then we added it at a later stage to the database, but the database or Ghidra didn't really take it well. Um, and that's universal to really all tools. Ida suffers from that pr same problem. Ghidra does. I don't know about Binja, but I would imagine it does. It's not a negative thing. It's just that once you have analyzed a database and started naming structures and you find how things are XREFed and interact with each other, introducing a bunch of new code and a bunch of new data that maybe is conflicting uh, or used in place of other things can completely fuck up your databases. And that's why we haven't like seriously really started looking for bugs. Obviously like the VF table stuff yesterday was kind of just taking a glance at what to be ready for and basically the level of confidence that I want to have going forwards. Um, and one of the really big things that I took out of that and why we're on this process today that you have no idea what we're doing um, is ultimately the 
the firmware does not contain enough information for us to really do the thorough reverse engineering that I would like to do. Now that doesn't mean the information doesn't exist because it gets created by that same firmware, but that requires that you understand the whole initialization process of that firmware. So what I would like to do instead is get an in-memory dump off of the printer, and that would be obtaining basically dumping all of RAM or as much RAM as I possibly can from the device while it is running. And then that means that certain globals that are initialized, like yesterday when we're looking around, we're like, it looks like there's a heap here, but I don't know, like maybe this is the heap global. Um, when you're looking at a RAM image, instead of just like the, the basically the text section and the uninitialized BSS section, which we have with our firmware dump, when we are looking at the actual RAM dump, those structures are filled in. And while on a lot of like real devices, like computer -y sort of things and phones, sometimes in RAM dumps can be harder to work with just because you lose uh, information about like permissions and stuff. Although if you save those, you can get those. Um, on embedded devices, typically those globals and that storage for things like the heap and you know big data structures, Embedded TLDR, embedded devices use globals so much. They just spew globals everywhere, especially single threaded, single core devices like this printer probably is. I mean, I don't know for sure, but it's probably single core. And on devices like that, in-memory dumps are so much nicer because those globals have been initialized, especially like everything I'm saying here is raised to the nth degree when you have the fact that this printer makes liberal use of C++. And with C++, you can't really do anything until you figure out VF tables. And when you have an in-memory dump, if you have a global you know, uh, service, like a network service or something that binds to a socket, well, that's probably stored in a global for the this pointer, and we can just find that, and we can look at the actual VF table. We don't have to go through the 50 constructors that get nested that create this massive VF table and variants of that VF table and interfaces. Um, we don't have to look at that because we can just look at what, in, what actually is being used as the VF table for this object, not what was it at some arbitrary stage of initialization, but what did it end up truly being. Um, so that's basically the goal. Now that is personally how I work and it's not necessarily a common workflow. I do a lot of dynamic analysis. I will pretty much always be working with debuggers and snapshots of in-memory uh, contents as well as working with emulators and, and pulling those into emulators. Um, and I don't think that's a super common thing for people to do. Uh, I personally find it much easier, but I also recognize that the process, the things that we're probably going to do today uh, are considered massive undertakings for a lot of people, especially for like a preliminary research. Uh, and thus, it's not necessarily that other people wouldn't apply these techniques. It's that I use these techniques for throwaway random stream projects that I don't actually care about the bugs on, right? Um... It's just, I, I've done it so much that it just has become the way that I do stuff. Uh, and it's definitely unique to me. That being said, I do think it is a better way of doing a lot of research. You're actually looking at the real contents uh, and you can emulate an in-memory dump trivially. We've done it a few times on stream before and we'll do it again probably with this printer, you know, unless something really gets in our way. Um, that's just kind of how I roll. If you have, if you have a firmware and you want to emulate, uh, if you want to emulate it for fuzzing or even just analysis, even just stepping through it for analysis, you will be required to basically go through and figure out exactly how all of the devices work such that things can initialize, boot up, interrupts can happen, timers can happen, those timers cause events to happen, which cause threads to get kicked off, which cause things to get created in globals, which cause sleeps to happen. Like, all of these things happen. But for most things, even complex things like fucking browsers or phones, an in-memory dump is typically fuzzable without emulating any devices because device accesses pretty much never happen, right? 
a device gets accessed so rarely. Like, yeah, your frame buffer is probably getting updated, you know, 60 to 100 times a second. But other than that, how often is a file being read off disk? Once every two seconds? Like, that is an eternity in terms of fuzzing. And the other thing is when you don't have to act, when you aren't working with an uninitialized blob that you have to go through the initialization stages and you're working with the actual contents, we can probably just literally find, oh, the this pointer for the IPP protocol is stored at this address, which we can figure out pretty easily. And then we can just say, you know what, fuck it. We can just, in our emulator, set PC to the start of, like, handle packet set the this pointer, set R0 argument to that global, and then maybe fill in the packet and length fields, and congratulations, it's parsing a packet that we can now analyze and step and debug. Um, and yeah, that's basically the plan. Um, that was kind of the plan all along, but I didn't really tell anyone that. Uh, but yeah, that's effectively uh, how it goes. Um, it's, it's typically pretty easy to dump memory i mean it's 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 not easy uh it's you can basically when you're working with a memory dump an arm processor is an arm processor it doesn't really matter if it's a v5 a v4 a v7 a v8 it doesn't really matter it's just a blob that has arm instructions now obviously if you use an arm v7 instruction you need arm v7 but for most of these embedded devices, you can just take this firmware and throw it in a V7 or a V8 emulator, and you're fine, because it's just running instructions and it's accessing memory. Every once in a while, it'll maybe go and uh, write to a device, and we'll likely see that when it hits like a log file, when it writes or prints to serial or whatever its logging device is. But that's pretty easy. You just go into printf and you change the first instruction to a ret. And congratulations, it no longer hits the I.O. device. Even further, you can set a breakpoint in your emulator and you can actually capture those log messages so you can see the log messages. And for a device like this, I, we didn't actually really look if there is a JTAG or serial port on the board. Um, I don't remember seeing any uh, pads that really were indicative of it, uh, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. Uh, that being said... In an emulator, you just put a breakpoint on it and then just dump it to the screen. And congratulations, you now have, have log messages that you can't obtain on the real device. Even if we can obtain it on this device, we're still taking some liberties here, some artistic liberties, to pretend as if this printer is a harder device than it is. And that's why yesterday we didn't go find a wiki page of someone who's reversed the firmware. We didn't use Binwalk liberally to actually process the things. We wrote our own tools. We looked at how... They did decompression. We pretended like this is a device that we're the only people in the world who have, and thus we have to figure out how it works to a level that we can find, hey, we need to gzip this, or hey, they have a custom thing, or hey, they have a checksum here. This is where they load memory. Um, and that's why, like, it's kind of frustrating, to be honest, when people in chat are like, have you just tried this? Have you tried this? When ultimately we're not, we're not trying to do that, right? It's, there's... There's really no learning involved from going online and finding a Canon printer exploit and pulling it down in Python and then adding parentheses to print so that it works in Python 3 and then throwing it. That's not really learning anything, right? It doesn't mean that you can't learn from that. If, if you're very new and, and getting into things, understanding how these things work is important. Um, but I don't consider that a super valuable thing to teach or talk about on Twitch because it's not, it's not really a unique skill or a hard skill to get. So I like to keep things to a much more primitive level of what do you do with unknowns. Because when you know what to do with things or you have source, it shit's a lot easier, right? So that's pretty important. Um... What's the best way to get C++ structures in Ghidra? I don't know. To be honest, I haven't done any reverse engineering with C++ in Ghidra. I have typically done IDA, and I think IDA has a little bit better support, and I used, like, a couple plugins. I forget what they were. I think... I don't know if it was Rolf Rolls' plugin or someone's plugin for, like, working with vtables and stuff in IDA, uh, and that made life a lot better. Uh, so, honestly, I haven't done much C++ honestly, in general, but even further, I haven't done really any in Ghidra, so uh, I don't want to pretend like I'm an expert there. So, 
Rolf is a G. Hell yeah. Rolf is fucking amazing, dude. All right. Okay. So, what we're going to do today is we are going to... Um, well, I'm going to try to be more interactive with chat. So, I... Well, basically, you'll notice in my streams... Uh, <laughs> The first four hours are always a lot better than the last eight hours because, you know, eventually, like, in reality, when I'm actually doing real work, um, I will get up from my computer and make food and run around or run an errand or go for a walk or go for a bike ride or, you know, call a friend or play a game of WoW or go do a raid or some random shit, right? Um, I often don't really work for more than, like, two hours at a time. Uh, so I, I noticed that I get pretty antsy after like four hours, which kind of sucks. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes down to I just want to keep momentum going. And ultimately, I, I'm i wrong. <laughs> like my gut instinct is like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's keep this going. Let's get, let's find these bugs. Let's rip this apart. Let's, let's try and find the next, you know, point of code. But ultimately, like... My stream does much better, and I have much more fun when I just interact with chat. So if that means that we get half as much done in the same amount of time, I think it's just better. Uh, so I'm going to try. I'm going to try to do that, but I won't be successful because it's just natural for me to just not do that. Um, but yeah, ultimately, that's kind of just how it fucking is, right? Um, and, and I hate that. I just feel like at the end of the stream, I'm not interacting with chat. I'm just head down writing code or, you know, auditing something or reading through stuff. And, and that's, that's not great. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try and improve that. So, um, yeah. Did you hear about that rust foundation? No, I haven't heard anything about it. I, I don't know what happened. Um, did they, did they get kicked from Mozilla? <laughs> that's just my random guess or that they like split off from Mozilla if they did, that would actually be, I think, awesome and probably healthier for the language. But um, they split off. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. <laughs> that totally makes sense. Like, uh, Mozilla is... Um, look, I, I like Firefox. I like Rust. I like Mozilla's views. I like a lot of the ways that they approach problems. And I typically think Mozilla has a better approach to open sourcing software than, than most people. But it's very obvious that Mozilla is trying to make money. Um, not necessarily Mozilla Foundation, like the open source counterpart, but Mozilla uh, is clearly trying to make money, which they're a fucking business. That's totally fine. But they're, uh, they've been doing a lot of stuff recently that's is indicative that they want to actually be a profitable or, you know, not even profitable, but a uh, higher revenue company. Um, and unfortunately, that's just kind of the only good thing Mozilla has going for them, right? Their, their software is typically number two, like Firefox. Honestly, Firefox is worse than Edge and Chromium, I would say. Um, I still, well, I used to use uh, Firefox. I just switched over to ungoogled Chromium. Um, but the big things that they had going for them was was privacy and the, the a little bit more open, open software. And, and I don't necessarily mean in terms of the software being public, but the way they approach the community and, and interact with the community and handle PRs and communicate the things they want to do and change and blog. Um, and... Once again, I'm not saying Mozilla is just shit now and it's like completely written off, but I would say some of the things that made them very strong before uh, and basically made up for some of the, the lackings of their uh, software at times um, are starting to disappear a little bit more. Uh, so I'm actually pretty happy. Uh, I mean, if chat is right, I don't, I don't know. I haven't even looked, uh, if, if the Rust Foundation has split off from Mozilla, I think that makes more sense. Uh, now that being said, I think Mozilla has kind of the longest history of good open source interactions. And that's not saying that this new Rust Foundation won't have that because they're probably inspired by those ways. In fact, they're probably more inspired by those ways than Mozilla is now. But Mozilla has weathered through various economic and technical, uh, you know, shifts in, in 
the world uh, and still kind of always come out to have really good open source software and really good communications. Um, so I do think Rust splitting off hopefully should be for the better, but it also, uh, it doesn't have as much momentum, if that makes sense, right? It, it, Rust is not the only thing that Mozilla does, and thus if Rust has a shitty day, right, or shitty week or shitty month, maybe they lose a big contributor, or maybe there's some adoption stuff that is, that is up in the air, or maybe people are pissed off, or whatever reason, right? If Rust has a shitty day, there's still the momentum of Mozilla to kind of carry them through that. So splitting off into your own foundation leads to having kind of a higher upside where you can go faster, but sometimes it's harder to get better momentum. And when I say faster, I don't necessarily mean faster or more features or anything. I just mean better, right? And that that could mean better outreach. That could mean better documentation. That could mean better open source or whatever it is, right? Um, and it's really hard to measure those things. But... Mozilla is a failed company. Really happy they let Rust go rather than try to monetize it. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that, right? I mean, you can't, you can't really monetize a language, right? Like, you, Java, right? You, you kind of can, uh, but not anymore, right? All of the languages that we kind of use nowadays aren't really monetized. In fact, they're kind of hacked together, right? We switch, we switch languages pretty frequently nowadays. Even though people say like, oh, C and C++, tried and true. Dude, so much shit is written in new languages, right? All the Electron stuff, Node.js. Even though JavaScript goes back older, the like Node concept is basically a different language, right? Syntactically, it's just JavaScript, but come on, it's a... It's a different language. Um, and all of these things are, are kind of becoming a thing. So, I don't know. It's not... I don't really care, right? Ultimately, um, like, I, I have some gripes with Rust, and I would love to see competition in the, you know, safe systems language space. It doesn't take me more than a week to pretty thoroughly learn a new language. Um, so I don't really care about what the language is. Um, there are a bunch of things that I would like to see differently, uh, in a language than what Rust has done and, and things that I think Rust has, you know, dug themselves in a hole, uh, for. So it, it can be kind of tough. Um, tell it to the people who made Power Builder, of course. Uh, but it does help to have an established language. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I could actually see Rust becoming the new C and C++ but then quickly uh, a lot of people move like, a, you know, someone like me move to like a, a different, you know, faster paced language uh, as it becomes more stable and less dynamic, right? Ultimately, Rust has some pretty big compile time and uh, build scalability issues, right? Like I have a, I have a 192 thread machine and when I build Rusty, right, it takes like an hour and I look at the cores and like, yeah, between two and eight are actually being utilized at a given time. But when I look at something like C, I see literally all of the cores are pegged, right? All 192 threads are pegged until it gets to like a linking stage or it gets to like a pre-compiled header or some code gen stage, right? But for the actual like compilation, it's just blasting through. Um, and I... I think there are just some performance issues and scalability issues that are kind of fundamental to Rust that I just don't really see changing. Um, yeah, kind of sucks. But it, it, like, I hope those things would change. And it's not to be negative to, to the, the people who have worked on Rust, but ultimately... Um, it scales better by default. And basically, if you've ever had something that works better out of the box, right? Like Rust will use multiple cores to build any project without you having to custom make your make file or specify your dependencies correctly, right? It, it will just do it. Um, and basically, the more generic and easier something is to work, typically, the, the more you sacrifice performance or like serious top-end performance. Um, and that is not a runtime complaint about Rust because there's no reason why you can't build a super parallelizable Rust compiler in Rust itself. The language has all of the things there. It's just that there's, there's such 
Um, there's such a focus on doing Rust like Rust, and I'm sorry, Clang doesn't have great code gen in general, but especially when it comes to closures and iterators. And Rust is a language that's built very heavily on closures and iterators. And there are situations where using closures and iterators ends up just fucking your performance, right? You just end up, you know, wrapping structures over and over again or moving things or making copies of things, right? Even when you have something that's by move, you might end up be, you might end up, I guess by move, you shouldn't ever be copying it. But uh, even when you have something that's easily copied and it's not a clone, it's not like a complex deep copy sort of thing, they still can really add up and get expensive. And unfortunately, that's going to be suffered by any high-level language when you write, you know, that intended style. Uh, and that's why, you know, I've ripped on C++, where we saw it, you know, overwrite the same VF table like five or six times as it gets reinitialized five or six times. That's really common to see in high-level code, regardless of language. Um, and that's why C++ typically compile slower, and that's why C++ programs typically compile slower. It's not necessarily that you can't write fast things in C++ or compile C++ quickly. It's that the features and the things that are promoted in those languages are typically easier to use and friendlier, but then lead to probably a lower upside. Same can be said for anything high performance. Basically, if you have a high performance database, hash table, whatever crazy whiz bang high performance thing, if it uses generics, if it uses like, you know, some polymorphic code or dynamic dispatch to make it easier to use or that you can hold more types in it than you could if you, you know, have more restrictions on what you can hold in those structures, it's just going to be slower than what you could specialize and make. And that's, I am a specialist, right? And that's why when you see a lot of the code that I write, it is absurdly fast. And that's also because I'm typically only writing that for myself for a specific task. And I rewrite code when I have a new task at hand. I reuse ideas and methods, but I don't really often reuse code. Uh, and that's not really scalable. So I'm not really faulting anyone for doing that. But it is, uh, you know, an important characteristic of the way that I do work. Um... Want a quick compile? Use assembly? Ooh, I've had some pretty slow assembly builds. Uh, typically, it is fast, but sometimes assembly just really performs poorly on, like, you know, macros or, you know, repeated things. Sometimes it really performs poorly, just because those features are often not used, and thus they're not really, you know, they're not forefront optimization paths for the, the teams working on them. Heard Microsoft is putting together a Rust compiler team. Uh, hopefully they figure some shit out. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, so you'll be alive through embedded systems for sure. Although there's no reason to not use Rust on embedded systems. It's fucking identical, right? C and Rust are basically identical when you have embedded stuff, right? I was working on this the other day. I made up like... 900 byte RTOS that had like threading and context switching that wrapped some shit in Rust. And like Rust really has no problem with competing with C in size and performance. In fact, it can beat C in size and performance just because it's a little bit stricter of a language. But you can't use formatters. You can't use iterators. You can't use, you know, these big sort of heavy things. And it makes sense. You don't use those things in C. It's not a fair comparison to say, well, in Rust, when I have it in debug mode and I print 10 gigs of strings to a log file that I use pretty printers for, for some reason, my binary is bigger than the C version of the same thing that is built in release mode and has no strings, no debug output, and no printf implementation. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> And that's the, that's the thing that I just see so much. There, there's really no difference in C and Rust in size or performance. The only thing that you maybe can give C as a leg up for size or performance is that you can maybe avoid Clang. And Clang sometimes has bad code gen for size and performance. That's it. <laughs> that's really the only argument. There's nothing fundamental about the language that is bad for size, right? Um... 
length checks are not a big deal, right? If you write your code in a way that makes it easy for the compiler to understand what length checks happen, even if you do 50 length checks in a function, as long as you make sure the compiler understands by the way you structure your code and make it obvious that you are going to read 50 bytes from this thing, right? And maybe you read them randomly, but it doesn't matter. As long as you just... As long as the compiler knows, it'll do one length check. It's, it should be, seriously, it should be less code being generated than C because C typically is a little bit more explicit with the code down to the binary. Uh, and you're going to probably have to write more assertions and more checks and more things in C. And since you're going to do them manually, the compiler might not be able to remove those things because they're not implied, right? Uh, and sometimes those can be an issue. But yeah. Um, Striker, thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah, how was your stream? Hope you had a great time. Um, the biggest differences uh, are in paradigm. Switching from Java to Clojure, from type to untyped languages, and so on. Yeah, I'm, I totally agree with you there. I do think paradigms are the biggest reason why, like, C++ is so slow and the compile times are so bad. It's paradigms. It's templating. It's high uses of macros. It's high uses of, you know, uh, inheritance and massive, massive header files and complex dependency structures. Um, it's just kind of how it is. Um... Cargo encourages Rust programmers to add bloat to their project. I do agree with that. Um, the amount of times that I grab a random thing and it pulls down like 140 dependencies drives me nuts. That being said, <laughs> Cargo is not doing that. Uh, arguably, Rust has pushed for some things that I think should be in the standard library to be in Cargo. Kind of like getting a date or a t like working with dates and time. That should be in a standard library, in my opinion. Um, and there's a lot of push to make sure those things stay in crates and use the crates and whatever. So there is non-zero push in that direction. But if using dependencies in C and C++ was as easy as it is in Rust, it'd be the same fucking thing, right? Um, so it doesn't necessarily promote it. It just allows what people would do otherwise. The reason why people don't have massive dependencies on their C and C++, I mean, they do, right? They do anyways, uh, is because you basically have to manually bolt together all of the build systems to get it to work. Uh, where in Rust, you don't have to do that. It, it just works. Um, so, yeah. But fortunately, that also means that Rust has much better cross-platform support because it's just kind of ingrained in the build systems that it just works the same on all OSs. Obviously, you can do OS-specific things, uh, but typically the common, the big crates have the wrappers that make those agnostic uh, between um, platforms. So, I don't know. It's pretty good. So, I like those concepts of Rust. I, I really wish that somehow... I don't know exactly how their compiler works. It probably already does this. I wish that somehow they could figure out the dependency structure, even if it takes a second or two for a large project to pre-process the dependency structure such that all of the files can just be compiled in parallel, right? Um, that, to me, I would expect that really, barring LTO and linking stuff, I would expect that even a high-level language like Rust should be capable of basically building all files or modules inside of files. Basically, all of those compile units should be completely independent and should be 100% linearly parallelizable with cores. Um, and unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, I don't know if that is due to those things not being parallelizable, which maybe isn't the case. Uh, maybe it has to do with the way the build system, maybe it keeps going through dependencies over and over and over again and keeps recomputing them or doesn't cache them or doesn't compute all the dependencies first. So it has to keep doing these things, which causes like synchronization barriers uh, between all the cores. I and mean, if you have 192 threads on a machine, waiting for like the last thread to finish its compiling means most of the cores are doing nothing because if one file takes two seconds and the other files take half a second, you are wasting 99.9% .9 of your CPU time doing nothing. Uh, so 
I don't know if it is a com compilation bottleneck issue where some for some reason they can't compile individually and then link them together at the end or do like basically an intermediate step where maybe they do like an LT or something in post. Um, I don't quite understand. Uh, I know that there are dependencies with inline functions and public functions and templated things, and maybe that's the main issue is templates. Templates causing, uh, basically, if you use a template, which is a lot of Rust, and same with C++, if you use a template, templates are inlined and require new code generation. Uh, but I would still hope that um, in a super developed, like, I, I'm not saying I expect Rust to have this. It takes time to do this. I would expect that you would be able to, first of all, you should be able to parse all of your files 100% independently, pulling them into a ASTs and figuring out all of those things you should be able to do independently. Um, and then you should have some representation of a function that is very close to what you want to operate on to actually compile or optimize that function, such that you can just pass that on to things that use those templates. But maybe that is the problem. Maybe templating is the reason why it hits those snags, because it can't compile until the templates are available, and if the templates are just a chain of templates all the way down, then yeah, of course, you're just going to get stuck, because you're waiting for the last template to make the new template, to make the next template, to make the next template. Uh, and that maybe would be an example, but I don't necessarily have a solution off the top of my head, but I imagine that there is probably a way to do the solutions with some way that you can, you know, basically start working on some form of the code even before the template is available to drop in, if that makes sense. So, but yeah, definitely very difficult. Um, okay, um... <laughs> the original date library was awful, which ended up uh, working well because they um, could just kill it off since it wasn't part of standard. Oh, interesting. In the worst case, it's uh, fully serialized and non-parallelizable. Yeah, of course. Um, but I feel like there's probably a way to do something. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can compile everything, but like, there's got to be something that you can do with those cores while waiting for that template to be resolved. Obviously, worst case, maybe not, but you can at least be, like, processing TOML files, parsing things to ASTs, working on dependency structures. Maybe, maybe if you have 192 cores and you are using 8 cores to compile because you keep bottlenecking on templates, maybe start doing some LTO on the stuff you've already compiled and start optimizing stuff that's already been compiled, right? There's got to be a way, right? I, I just, I'm really skeptical that there's nothing that you can do while waiting for those. Because you always have stuff behind you. That means you can start working on linking, relocations, LTO, profiling, running te like tests on the things that have already built. There's, there's stuff you can do, in my opinion. So, um, is that a DOS keyboard? It is, yeah. I have had this DOS keyboard for a, a long time. Uh, actually, not this one, but I think that keyboard I've had since I was in high school. Um, it's fantastic. It's super straightforward, and it's exactly what I want in the keyboard. Um, my M1 compiles Rust faster than my Threadripper because the individual cores are faster. Yeah, so when I make computers or build computers, um, I build my desktops and my workstations with literally the highest single thread performance machines I can get. I go to the benchmarks, I go to various benchmarks, and I literally find whichever one has the highest single core performance. I don't care if it's a fucking quad core, I don't care if it's a 20 core. I don't give a shit. I'm just buying it, right? I, it, it's so much better. I, I don't care how good you are at writing parallelizable code, it will be better for your workstation or desktop or development environment, as long as you have compute nodes like I have, or use EC2 or something for compute. Um, it just, you don't write all of your code to be threaded and perfect as you are creating the code. Even for myself, I'll typically write things with threading in mind, such that adding threading is easy, but that doesn't mean I have threading immediately when it goes in. And that is time where you're not benefiting from having your, you know, 
50 core crazy workstation that has quad socket Xeons that are clocked at 1.8 gigahertz because there are so many cores and you have thermal issues. Um, that's, that's my viewpoint. Just find whatever has the absolute maximum single core performance Go with that for your workstations. It's amazing. It's better for games. It's better for things like Ida, Ghidra, pretty much anything else, because most things don't use threads at all. Um, yeah. All right. So, I think it is time to start drilling into a printer. Uh, I might have missed it, but what is the overall goal of the printer hack? To teach people how to uh, do hacking stuff. Uh, and to bring to light some more sophisticated uh, hacking skills and techniques that you'll basically never find anyone promoting because people usually promote the simple basic solution or, you know, templated solutions. Uh, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that if you want to write a ROP gadget, you read a book on ROP gadgets because no ROP gadgets are the same. No targets are the same. No targets have the same mitigations, the same modules, the same code available, the same amount of code, the same alignment allowances. It's just, in theory, you could explain all these things and, and write a book for it. But ultimately, um, I don't like most conventional teaching and literature and those sorts of things. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying, in general, I think people undersell how much in any line of work, regardless of if it's hacking, programming, or building bridges, how much shit is winging it, right? And I think it's really important to just wing stuff on stream. So that's why we're hacking this. All right. Um, <laughs> can you make it? Can you make it so my can printer can scan when it's out of ink? I don't know. I I just, I feel like printers just really need to have ink uh, when you do a scan. Like, how is the printer company going to profit off you scanning stuff? That, that just doesn't sound right to me. I'm sorry. I it just, you have mean goals. You're bullying them. <laughs> How did they not think of that? They did. It's intentional. <laughs> it's literally intentional. <laughs> they definitely thought about it. They thought, oh, the scanner works when the ink is out. Huh. And some people use their home printers to only scan things to their computer. So we're not actually profiting off of these printers because we make all of our money off of ink. Fuck. What do we do? I don't know. Have them buy ink to scan. Brilliant idea. Done. 100% was premeditated, planned, and engineered. There's no fucking way that was a mistake or an oversight. No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> the poor multinational conglomerate. <laughs> printers are cheap as shit. Yeah, uh, printers are often sold at a loss, right? People shit on printers. And this is actually a pet peeve of mine where people are like, Printers suck. Printers don't work. Printers are one of the most mechanically sophisticated devices that you use on a regular basis, and you expect it to be 50 bucks, right? It has to roll out paper from multiple trays of multiple thicknesses of different sizes. It has to deal with ink jams, ink getting dry, things getting clogged, slippage in gears, compensate for those calibration being neglected and like having ink dry up and get crusty in there. Like mechanically, there is so much shit going on in a printer that I find it outrageous that people get mad at printers, right? You can get mad at ink for being expensive and all of those things and whatever you want to do. But printers mechanically have a very, very complex job to do. And with most things in the world, if you say like, oh, this thing has not gotten better for the past 30 years, then there's a fucking reason, right? If, if basically no one has found a better way to do this, it, it, they keep being shit. There's a reason. It means that fundamentally there is something difficult there. I mean, maybe in some situations people are just not actually improving things. But typically that is the case, right? It's just how it is. So it, it's, it's frustrating to me because I understand the mechanical and engineering complexities that go into printers. Um, 
and I find it frustrating when people are surprised that this $50 thing that is more complex than multi-thousand dollar appliances they have in their house doesn't work, right? Like, would you be mad that your $50 refrigerator doesn't cool well or doesn't work well? I would hope not. <laughs> And your printer is much more complex than a refrigerator or an oven or a microwave or any of these devices. It is way more complex than anything you probably have in your house as a mechanical device. And they're cheap as shit. <laughs> so I can't really say I complain. Also, most printer issues, along with most issues and everything in general, usually user error. Loading the paper in sideways, being too aggressive with it, not setting the, the, you know, trim correctly on where the paper should come out or the size of the paper, right? Usually a user error. Personally, I've never had a problem with a printer in my life. I've used five or six personal printers in my life, mainly because I bought all of these printers for hacking and I just switched between them by whatever one's by the door when I need to print something. I've never really had issues with printers. They've always fucking worked. Um crazy to me that people have issues with printers. I'm pretty sure people just fuck them up. <laughs> In the same way, I've never had a cracked screen on a phone, ever. I've never broken a dish. I just, I'm gentle. I'm delicate. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Let's get this going. figure out what we want to do. Oh, shit. I was going to move my desk today. Yeah, I'm going to move my desk. Uh, yeah, so basically, I don't have long enough HDMI cables. They come on Wednesday. Um, and that leads to me not being able to reach this desk with my HDMI cable. So the camera is at a shitty angle, and I couldn't position it and do other things. So what I'm going to do is move this desk over to here, uh, and that'll solve all those problems. <laughs> so. Uh, Really nothing in there is plugged in, so I should be able to just move the desk. Um, all right, uh, okay. I'll turn up the game so you can hear me uh, complain. So, the first thing that I have to do in organizing my room is, uh, oh god, dude, oh shit, crop, the, crop that out. Yeah, so in my very clean room right now, um, okay. <sighs> Actually, the reason it's a mess is pretty much only because of yesterday and pulling out all of my, like, double E boxes. It's not normally like this. I swear, chat, I promise, I promise it's not always a fucking mess. I'm actually a pretty damn clean person. I swear. <laughs> Trust me. Um, okay. Okay. So, everything on here should float. Now, some of these things are very heavy, so I don't know if this is going to move well, but, and maybe it will. makes it harder to get to food, which makes it worse, objectively. But, not bad, not bad. Alright, now unfortunately, that means the camera is now behind this desk, which means it's harder to position things and stuff like that. Um, because I don't know if I'll be able to reach this camera from where I stand, which could be an issue, maybe, potentially, and I think this tripod is too short for me to put on the desk, but I'm going to attempt, I'm going to attempt to put this tripod on the desk by collapsing all of the legs, and then if I can put it on the desk, then, hypothetically, I will be able to get better position. 
positioning on the camera. But I'm going to hazard this will not work. Ah, I don't know. I don't know if you can hear me right now. You probably can't because I'm behind the microphone. Kind of sucks to be you, chat. You know, maybe you just should be cooler. Sometimes you should just be cooler. Okay. So that HDMI cable is wrapped around my microphone. Eh. Problem solved. And. God, even still the HDMI cable is fucking short. But, now I just have to clear out the desk enough to find a place for the feet to go, and huzzah! I now have a camera on a desk, which means I can do stuff like this. Look at that! Look at that. Oh, we did it, chat. We did it. You did it, chat. Sorry for peeking. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is um, do exactly what we talked about doing. I'm going to take a couple things off my desk to hopefully make a little bit more space. Um, so then I'm going to move the stream preview to a different location such that I can see that better, and then I'm gonna turn my micro uh, my microscope away, and hopefully we can uh, do stuff now. All right, and let me pop out chat so I can read chat uh, and look at myself. There we go, there we go, chat. Look at that. I'm basically a professional. Uh, All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take apart this printer uh, like we did the other day. We don't have power to anything here, but we can get power pretty easily. So to take apart this printer, we are going to uh, take it apart. So I need my screwdrivers, which I have right here, and we're gonna take this apart. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to take a uh, we're going to take one of these. It's probably not in focus. Probably nothing's in focus right now. And let's just focus on that. Okay. So that's like ballpark focused on the area that we're going to be doing stuff. But it's not going to be perfect. So um, what we're going to do is basically install. And now that's not going to be in focus. We're going to install one of these DIP8 sockets externally on the printer. And what that is going to allow us to do is that will allow us to plug in a socket like this into that socket. Holy shit, that is tight. That's a little concerning how tight that is. Holy shit. Oh, I think the pitch is going to be fucked on those pins. Well, there goes my brilliant plan. Um, hmm. Well, now I have to think. Um, unfortunately, the pitch on these sockets does not match up. Um, what I might just do is solder that on there. Potentially. Can I get that to stick at all? I, I could I could probably just solder that on there. I don't really care too much. I can buy more of these. Um, so basically that will allow me to plug and play, like pull out the, um, I don't know how visible that is, uh, but this will allow me to basically pop in the flash and take the flash off very easily from outside of the printer while everything is assembled and all plugged in uh, and that should be good. Now, unfortunately, hmm, what do I want to do about that? Uh, let me see if, like, these pin headers work in here. No, what the fuck is this? 
Why do these have such a tiny... These things suck. I can kind of force those in there. So like worst case, we can run it out to a breadboard by jamming in wires into there. So we have multiple solutions. So I think we're just going to install one of those uh, and just go with it. So, cause it's all I have available. All right. I actually did buy some, uh, I think I placed the order for it. I bought a couple uh, boards that I can solder that are like, uh, uh, I can't remember what these are. Uh, like SOP 8s or I don't think these are not SOPs. Whatever this SOIC format or whatever I have. Um, and let's see. I think, so those screws, yeah, those screws need to come out. So I theory crafted, I think the other day, I theory crafted that there were some screws that I don't think I have to remove. I think it's just the one up here where it retains that springed piece. So if I can skip removing a piece that has a spring, I'm gonna be happy. So what I think I can do is remove these four screws instead of five screws, and I think this will just, the lid will just come with it, so I won't have to remove the lid. Uh, and this theory there is that it will make disassembly and assembly faster, and I was correct. Okay, so I'm going to, unlike yesterday, I'm gonna gently pull out these cables from the motherboard, and I can remove the top. Easy as that, okay, so, now that we are inside and I'll get you focused, Honestly, I can get you focused maybe on the board because that's the area of interest. Uh, there. That should be relatively focused and then I can move it a little bit more in frame. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna pull out that board. We did that yesterday, not too difficult. It is just uh, one screw to pull out this plastic retainer. This is a weird self tapper and then these remove and then we just have to remove all of these connectors because they're kind of threaded through uh, in a way that they retain those wires a little bit better. Um, it's always good. And then we have one more in there. Disconnect those and then this will pop out. Once that is out, then we can remove the actual board itself. Technically, we're gonna have to remove a couple wires to do that, um, but those wires are easy to remove and then we will uh, get power to our desk and desolder that chip. Okay. Remove, remove, I think. Bunch of connectors in here. Not too hard. And sorry if I'm too quiet. I don't think I'm too quiet. I turned gain up a little bit, but I can go a little bit more. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is the board. I guess that's all we really care about. And then what we need to do is physically figure out how these things interact. Um, and what I'm mainly looking for is basically if any plastic is going to block where I'm going to drill and it doesn't look like it. So what we're going to do is basically where this board, where the board sits right here, we have the flash chip right here, which we will remove. So we'll remove that flash chip and then we will run wires, just eight wires to the back here where this is plastic. This is a very thin piece of plastic. I can actually stick my finger through the uh, USB connector port. So what we're gonna do is basically make a hole that is large enough to hold, um, one of these, you know, dip sockets. And then once we have made a hole that is big enough to socket that, we will kind of just stick that in there. Uh, and hopefully, uh, given I looked at the clearances, there is nothing in here like this. This actually fits into here a little bit. Um, 
But basically, I'm trying to figure out if I need to drill in here. And I don't need to because there's a screw hole right here, and the hole for that screw is here, which means that this uh, actually sits on top of a small lip here that is basically going to be impossible to show on stream because it's too dark. Um, but... Yeah, that's effectively the plan, is to cut a small little square hole in there. We know that there are a couple connectors that come down from the top, but other than that, there really isn't anything on this side of the board except for this, uh, this thing here, and that's ribbon flexible. There's no rigid things that come in here, uh, and there's nothing that is conductive. So we should be able to just drill a hole in there, file it out until the square shape, and then uh, place one of these chips in there. And so what I'm going to try to do is measure these such that I can figure out the dimensions. We'll scribe it onto here such that we know how big of a hole or thing we need to file out. And then once we have that, uh, we're going to try to do a clean job. I want this to be a pretty clean job. I want it to be a, um, a friction fit. I might super glue it in to actually seal it, uh, but I would preferably have it be a friction fit such that it's easier to position and, and get in there, right? If it's loosey-goosey, it's harder to glue and get stable. So I want it to be a nice, uh, clean cutout on there. So that would be basically the plan. One fa fun way to do this would be uh, use a Raspi to emulate the flash chip. Yeah, that's what I've thought about doing. Um, I'm just too concerned about latency, right? If you get context switch once and you can't satisfy a request, it's gone, right? So I've thought about maybe with an FPGA doing it or something. Ultimately, I need to get the pins out anyways. So, um, I mean, the other option is literally have just headers coming out the back. Uh, the problem with having headers come out the back is just knowing the orientation of the pins. Um, but that is maybe a little bit more versatile option. It's a little bit messier. Um, and basically the goal of using one of these is it, it's basically a pin header. Um, you know, I do actually have... This is not the best way to do this, right? I, I want to make that very clear that I'm not doing this in the best way I can. And that's largely because I'm doing this based on the supplies that I have available. Um, so, um, I actually have this um so i have a little board here that i can actually i think that is the correct uh setup for that yeah i think i can actually socket the ic onto here by just soldering it on which is not hard um on the back i have uh basically a dip eight and on the front i have headers uh, this is not a dip 8, so I can't actually just plug a dip 8 onto there or whatever, but I can plug in headers to there, right? I can just, you know, plug in any any standard thing and run wires to something else. This would allow me uh, to f solder on that chip and be able to quickly remove it off and put it on and remove it off. Um, I guess, hmm, let's see how those pins interact with these. Um... It would have to be a little bit more permanent on the device, where basically I would install this board onto the back of the device, which means I would have to like desolder that at like a weird angle to get that off, but that's not impossible. Uh, and then I could use the headers if I wanted to. Um, I could use the headers such that I could run this to a breadboard, and then I could have uh, basically socket this on the breadboard and then have uh, this kind of pull on and off. So that is one solution um, based on what I have, right? Once again, not doing the best possible solution. I do think a dip eight on the back would be the best or headers on the back would be the best. Now, unfortunately, I don't think I have 
all headers that I could potentially have. So I have, um, I have angled headers, right? These are like 90 degree bent headers that I could install eight on the back and then plug in eight wires and run those to a board or run them to this or however I want to do that. There's a bunch of ways I could do that. But I think straight headers would be better. And that's basically what I'd be using this board for is I would be piggybacking on the fact that this already exists. Uh, and another nice thing about this is uh, since uh, it's actually a PCB. This would actually keep it from falling into the printer. It could maybe fall out of the printer, but it wouldn't fall into the printer, which having it fall out of the printer, you just stuff it back in. But having it fall in means you have to take it apart, which sucks. Um, so that would potentially be nice. Now, this would be a permanent fixture that I would install into the printer, and it would kind of just expose uh, different ways to solder things onto there. And then the headers, which could be any temporary things. So that's another solution. What else could I do there? Um, so that's one option. Um, unfortunately, actually, if I solder it onto there, I can't, I can't take it off uh, such that I can do testing on it. Um, hmm. I really need a dip riser board that I can actually plug a fucking dip into. But for some reason, or I guess headers. So I, I, I guess a, a dip chip will probably go into this, but headers will not. Um, damn. I know at one point I would have had them. You know, I wonder if I can just... Actually, hmm, yeah, that sucks. I don't want to have wires running out. I would like to be able to just have one seamless clean thing plugged into the back in the situation where I just want to run it. Um, hmm. I'm going to search a bit. Be right back. think if I can salvage one of those off something like a motherboard or something but I don't know if I can Kind of just comes down to me not having the right solution for this, which kind of sucks. Um, I mean, I can literally just put this in there, right? I was hoping that what I could do is socket this in a dip eight thing. 
uh, a dip bait riser. And if I did that, then I would be able to just pull this off if I wanted to. Now this is like a $3 part, so it doesn't really matter if I use it, right? Like physically install it into here. Um, so I guess that's probably the best option. And then I can just take the chip out, put the chip in, take the chip out, put the chip in. But I was hoping that I could leave the chip socketed in something and pull the entire board out with a dip and then plug it into the program or whatever, rather than having to, you know, take the chip out and then put the chip in another, uh, in another one of these sockets, which I do have another one. Um, cause that requires transferring it, which is just harder when it's a smaller chip rather than a big thing that I could pull out and plug in. Um, but unfortunately, given the supplies that I have at hand, we don't really have an option. Um, the downside of this approach is I will not be able to use a, um, I won't be able to plug in headers, which means I won't be able to just like, this will basically only handle this chip, which means I won't be able to emulate this device. Uh, but if we want to emulate a device on stream, we can fucking pull this thing out and put a new thing in. So I, I guess I don't need to be too concerned we're only gonna invest probably an hour into doing this. I know that sounds like a long time, um, but I want to do a clean job, and uh, sometimes soldering these wires can be a pain in the ass. So, kinda really comes down to how quickly my soldering goes, and if my flux wants to work today. So yeah. Headers are probably better if you decided to uh, get a flash emulator, yeah. And that's, right, I can install this board. I can, I can do this. And honestly, I like the form factor of this a lot. That means whenever I want to run this printer, I would run these headers, right? Basically, what I would do is I would just take one of my breadboards and I would whack this into there. And then I would run headers to here, right? And then I can pull this out and put it in, pull it out, put it in, you know, do whatever I want to do there. Um, and I have the advantage of, you know, being on a breadboard and this is a sturdy vertical surface. Um, but it has the downside that I have to float this and eight fucking wires that are flying all over the place and getting tangled and making a mess. And that is kind of the only thing that I care about avoiding is basically those wires, right? Wires are annoying as fuck to have flapping around because uh, it means I can't just... Like, if I had this installed, or not necessarily this, but if I had this socket installed, right, onto the printer, I could physically pick up and move the printer to somewhere else. But having this breadboard attached to it means I either have to disconnect it and then figure out where all the wires go again, which isn't that hard, to be honest. They're numbered on this uh, very visibly, which makes it easy. Um, but... This would either have to be like, I throw this on top of the printer and this is sliding around when I carry it. Basically, it sucks. I know this because I have similar things that I use for USB hacking on phones. Um, this is amazing. This is so nice to have. But on the flip side, the wires floating off of here are a pain in the ass because you jerk them out, you pull out a lead, and it's kind of annoying. So... That being said, a printer is a lot less mobile than a phone, so maybe I shouldn't care too much about that aspect and go with the headers. It's also a cheaper board. I don't care about it as much, and I do like the concept of at some point coming back and revisiting, and I also really like the form factor of this in terms of ensuring this won't fall into the printer. All we have to do is cut a hole that lets the, uh, lets the uh, pins through, but as long as I do that, I can be pretty sloppy on the hole and this will sit in there and we have a lot of surface that we have to glue to the printer to make it a little bit better. Um, yeah, if you have female headers, you could just plug the adapter or wires into the flash emulator. Yeah, I just don't have a flash emulator. So I don't know if I want to optimize for something that I do not have when I could literally just buy one of these uh, and optimize it later. So basically the question is, Put a removable socket external uh, connector here to replace the flash or future proof and install something that is more frustrating for now 
for something that would be nice in the future because I could run these wires easier, right? Um, and these do not connect, right? Uh, if these connected, then that would be the answer because then I'd just plug this on top of there. But since that is not the case, it's basically, do I want to plan for something that I might own in the future but probably won't? Or do I want to do the thing that I think will be better for now but also is a little bit less convenient for pulling out the chip because I basically this would be on the side of the printer. I'd pop out the chip. It would just fall out. That's easy. Put this in another programmer, take it back over, and put it back in. And putting it in will kind of suck uh, with gravity fighting me. I'll have to like hold it in there and release it, which isn't awful, but it would be nice to just pull this out, which I could do if I installed this now, ran wires as a header such that I could, you know, plug the wires into the breadboard and then plug this into the breadboard and then pull this out and put it into a programmer. And then I can kind of, you know, move this piece rather than the other. Although this is actually relatively difficult to grab without compressing the springs, which would cause the uh, chip to basically lose its socketing. So, I mean, it's still definitely easier than trying to avoid resocketing the chip is a lot easier than always resocketing the chip. So, having the wires come out is a little bit more annoying for now for basically size constraints and complexity constraints and wanting to hack this up at some random point in the future constraints. But it will be easier for programming because I can move this from the programmer to the breadboard, from the programmer to the breadboard, right? The upsides of this is it's more compact. And I basically, do I want to have wires and a breadboard, right? So where's eight wires? I guess if I kept the wires next to each other, it wouldn't be too bad. But let's just say that's eight wires. So do I want this basically sticking out of the printer or like plugged into the printer such that it makes it easier in the future and it allows me to socket things a little bit easier with this? Or do I just want only this plugged directly into the printer? It's a little bit harder to like get the chip in there, get the angle right, uh, but this is a permanent fixture and will move with the printer. <laughs> That's why it's tough. That's why it's tough. <laughs> Would the SOP adapter plug into the header adapter if you replace the pins with the female header? No. Well, I guess I would have to I think the answer is no with th this header. Um, just because I don't have any, these are standard header sizes. These are not, basically these are too small. Uh, if these were bigger, then it would be fine. Now on the other board, where's the other board? <laughs> Here it is. Um, this one. So, problem is I have male, male issues there. Um, basically, could I use this, desolder these headers, which is very easy, right? Headers are so easy to solder. Anything through hole is so easy to solder, so it's not even a concern. Um, the problem is I would need these headers, these male headers, to also have a female back end that comes through it, which is kind of ridiculous, right? That would be a pretty crazy, I mean, definitely doable, but you would basically have like a male adapter on one side, like this plastic thing for alignments, and then you would have a female adapter on the other side, which is doable, but a little bit hard because how would you solder the, the female part on here unless it's got one complete piece of conductor going through it? So... That kind of like, and I don't want to permanently affix this, so that's mainly the, the problem there. Unfortunately, I don't know. There's not, a, there's not an amazing solution to that, to be honest. Um,
I think for a coolness factor, having this directly on the printer is cooler because you, you have an externally accessible, replaceable flash, which I think is just fucking cool. Like, it will just be a funny photo in my, like, it will look fucking funny. It will be cool. Since it has the coolness factor, that is what we're gonna do. Stackable headers have long pins. Yeah, unfortunately I don't have any stackable headers. I mean, I have these right angle ones, right? But I don't actually have straight headers. I only have right angle headers. I have no idea why I only have right angle headers. Clearly I needed them at some point. Um, but yeah, unfortunately that is a clusterfuck. We're gonna put the other adapter on there. Your DA Nano has 60, 32 megs. Yeah, I've thought about emulating Flash with the DEO Nano. Now, here's the thing. We aren't going to make a Flash emulator today. I, I don't think so. I mean, we could. That would actually be really fun. But you still have to, like, program the DE Nano and, and write the memory to there. So you're effectively just programming one Flash to go to the other Flash. So unless I can, like, real-time feed it data from my computer, it doesn't really offer that much more convenience other than not having to physically move something because it could just program without moving something. There is something to be said for that. But that's not the most amazing thing, to be honest. So I think what we'll do is we will permanently affix this to the printer. A, because the photo of a printer having a socketable replaceable thing on the back, I think will just look cool and be funny. And then if in the future we decide that we want to make a flash emulator, which would be some FPGA dev, which we've never really done on stream before. Uh, and I think that would just be fun in general. So we could do that. If we do that, I will just spend two days ordering something before the stream and then we'll rip this thing out and put a new thing in or do it to a new printer. Doesn't really matter. There's so many ways that we can solve the problem. Uh, I don't think we should future proof for something that in the future we can just have a solution to, right? We are basically planning for something that in the future we might develop when in the future we could just have a better solution to the problem anyways. So we're going to do this because it's the right solution for today. Okay. Um, just need to plug this in so we'll find an extension cord. Okay. I really need to get some non-surge protectors, because I only have surge protectors. It's kind of annoying. Okay, so this means we should have our lights. Good. We definitely have power. Uh, everything here is good. Okay, so all right. Basically, uh, what we need to do is, uh, let's see how bad this is gonna look. We can uh, adjust the level of light here. Um, what we wanna do before we do anything with the printer um, uh, is basically solder wires onto these uh, pins. So obviously I can use, uh, here, here's, the, here's the basically the conundrum, right? I can use headers and I can plug these headers into here. And then these headers can be what goes into the printer. And I have male, male, female, female, male, female. I have all the possible combinations. So I could plug these in and these would go into the printer. Unfortunately, I will not be able to solder these connections onto the pins of that uh, chip. So I either need to run these header pins to here and then have these go to a smaller wire, which then exposes conductor. Obviously, I could 
grab heat shrink if I have it, which I, I think I have a supply of heat shrink somewhere. So I could do that. The other option, which is probably what I'm going to do, uh, which sucks, um, is solder wire, uh, th like super thin wire directly onto, um, here's some thin wire, solder that wire, which you probably can barely even see, uh, solder the wire directly onto these pins um, outside, and then solder these wires uh, onto the actual pads of the chip. So that's basically the uh, problem there. How can one hack a printer? Um, I mean, there's many ways to hack a printer, uh, but we're mainly just trying to get code execution on it. That is what we mean by hack a printer, by getting code execution on something that we're not supposed to have arbitrary code execution on. We don't care about any other meanings of hacking or definitions of hacking there. So that is a very loose definition of hacking, uh, but it is all we care about here. So basically, I need to make the decision if I want to have chats on the microscope, um, which I think I do want to do, especially for when we're actually soldering onto the pads. But uh, I need to also think about if I want to have chat on the microscope uh, for when we are... Um, if I want to have chat on the microscope for when we are soldering uh, these wires to this dip, uh, which is honestly going to suck. And you're not going to be able to see much, I think, unless I move you there. I will have another camera uh, in two days, which means that I will be able to uh, have a B-roll, or I guess a B-camera, um, and that would allow us to do both. But right now, both is not an option. So... Um, Technically, I could plug in a shitty webcam, but I really don't want to plug in a shitty webcam. Okay. All right. Um, so, okay, where is that at? All the way over there. Come on. Come on. Okay. Um, that should be good. I think you're looking at the same orientation I am. I'm just doing this to make sure. That should be one looking through those. Yeah, they do look like they're numbered correctly, which is good. And then let's see, um, let's remove my, my tape, because um, now I shouldn't need it. And I'm going to basically uh, focus this on the numbers. Actually, let's zoom in more. The, the more you zoom in, the more sensitive the focus, which means the easier it is to kind of find the focus. So, I also don't know, I guess, okay, let's see. That looks pretty focused to me. I'm looking mainly at the two there. Um, and then here, I'm going to try to get you in focus of that as well. It's actually really hard to tell. So that's going out of focus. So now we're coming into focus. And that's coming out of focus. So it's somewhere in there. Honestly, like that feels pretty good. There's a lot of chromatic aberration, unfortunately. But I feel like that's, that's about as good as uh, we're going to get there. So I, I hope that's not too bad. Um, OK, so that means that I am now in sync with the camera. So I can focus optically through the eyepiece. And you should be focused on the board. And it, huh. Oh, let me uh, change lenses to this. 
Okay, so now we have a 2x lens. So now this, uh, my eye, I, I had the wrong eyepiece in. Basically my eyepiece was uh, not the correct one. And that led with a different eyepiece to having a different view in both. So I have to do the same thing again. Wow. I uh, like that ink is almost too thick. I almost need to find something else to focus on. Okay, I'm focused on the trace. I guess I don't know if I can tell the focus on the trace, to be honest. Um, that looks pretty good. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. So then, hopefully, I can now focus. There we go. I'm focused on, like, the two. God, that chromatic aberration is so bad. That's so bad. What a terrible fucking lens. Like, it is crystal clear in my lens, but to you, that is disgusting. I almost need to put like a, a like color filter in there and just make sure that we see the exact same, uh, make sure that you only get one wavelength. Um, Cause that is some really bad chromatic aberration. Wow, that fucking sucks. Okay, well, just too bad, chat. You gotta just deal with it. Um, so what we can do is uh, we need to figure out how we want to uh, work with these pins. Um, so what we can do is, um, yeah, so basically on the back of this, uh, we have the, these pins going through here, and then on this side, which is where we actually socket it, uh, you see that there, is, uh, there are the pins there. Now, unfortunately, we can't get to all of the pins. You can see the fourth pin uh, is actually probably about a half a centimeter behind there. So what that means is that we would have to um, take off this uh, socket, and that's not too bad. Um, trying to get light on here. Um, that's not too bad. Uh, what we can do is we can basically desolder these four uh, pins, and then that will allow us to remove this black socket. That should be the only thing connecting it is just those four pins, just floating otherwise. Might be maybe some supports in there, but no other soldering there, which is not too bad. So what we can do is um, desolder those four pins, take this adapter off, desolder these headers, and take those headers off. Um, and then once we have those headers off, we can actually put wires through these. Um, and then for perspective, um, this is the wire that we're going to be soldering, right? So what we'll do is put that wire in there. And the only reason we're gonna do that, instead of soldering to these pins, is it's just a lot easier to do through hole. Even though it means that we're gonna have to desolder and take off this chip, uh, which really sucks. In fact, it's actually going to be hard to desolder um, those four pins. Um, yeah, it's going to be relatively difficult to desolder these pins and these pins at the same time. We can we can use hot air. We can do whatever we want to try, uh, but it might be relatively difficult to take those off at the same time. So I'll probably hit those with hot air and go back and forth and back and forth and just hold this up and let that black piece uh, fall out under gravity. It's kind of the plan of approach there. Once that's done, take these headers off and then uh, just solder in those wires. And we might, um, hmm. So, um, I'm trying to see if there's a place, right, so, what I'm, what I'm thinking right now, which is a new thought, is basically, is there a way that I can, basically, when I, when I have this header off, I can bridge, you know, these wires to different places, 
Um, but unfortunately, I don't have the clearances to put more headers on here. But ideally, what I could do is uh, basically like put uh, another header on here that would allow me to access, uh, hmm. Yeah. And I can't put it on the back, right? I can't put it on the back. Uh, I mean, I, I could like put a block of wood as a spacer such that I could like put uh, right angle headers here and have right angle headers coming off the bottom of this board. Um, and then I could use those to, while this is in the printer, maybe have headers coming off the side where I could actually plug leads into there. Um, hmm. I don't know. I, I'm just basically, I'm just trying to think through, um, I'm trying to think through ways that I can kind of accomplish this because before I was kind of not thinking uh, in the permanent fixture mindset. This is the other board that I was talking about potentially using. Um, so, yeah, this needs a different pin pattern, unfortunately. So, I think we're just going to go with this. We're going to do kind of that plan I talked about. So, we're going to probably use hot air to take these off. So, let me... Uh, it's uh, got to kind of adjust where things are on the desk so I can get hot access to my hot air because um, it was kind of to the side. Okay. And hot air is coming through the camera leg. <laughs> Whoops, there we go. All right, and then that's don't want the power cord there, and everything should be clean. I've got... My solder wick. Got my solder wick. I've got my uh, flux. I've got some wire. I've got tape. And where's my solder? Got my solder. Just making sure I have everything here. We're going to turn on the hot air gun. We're going to go to a very low temperature. We're going to go to about as low as we can go on there. Hopefully that does the trick. Same with the soldering iron. Um, I actually was pretty stupid. I had a soldering iron on 350 Celsius yesterday, but I actually only need it on 300 Fahrenheit because uh, I have, uh, what is it, 63, uh, 62362 solder, which should melt at like 355 or 360 Fahrenheit. Um, so, which is literally the lowest possible setting. The lowest setting on my... Uh, on my soldering iron is 400 Fahrenheit, 200 Celsius. So, that would maybe, maybe that would explain why we had, uh, we lifted those pads yesterday. Um, although, that doesn't necessarily mean the solder that was on the board uh, was also in that same temperature uh, range. So, sometimes it's hard, especially once things have actually become kind of corroded out. So, I'm gonna grab, um, I do have my wire strippers here. Nice, I've got everything I need. So what I'm gonna do is get in here. Unfortunately, I can't zoom out more than this due to the, uh, the, lens, on the, the lens on the camera is unfortunately a 2X lens. Um, okay, and Due to it being a 2x lens on the camera, I actually can't get you more zoomed out than you are now on this microscope, which personally I think is a little bit too zoomed in. I would like to take you out a bit more, but what we're going to do is we're just going to grab this uh, with a pliers just on the back. That's all we're doing, and then we're just holding that. We don't care if we hurt these pins at all. We do care about hurting this, so we're going to try and be careful about our heat there, uh, but this should shield it for the most part. We just want to take out those four pins and drop out that, that black piece here. So mainly we're, what we're going to be looking for is uh, that solder melting on, those, uh, on these connectors. So we're coming in here with hot air. And there's a chance that this hot air is not hot enough. Um, 
I do have my Titus nozzle on there. But it looks like that air just isn't going to touch those, which is fine. So we will uh, put that back. And then we're going to turn up the temperature to a 4. We had it on a 3. Now we're going to a 4. <laughs> it's really hard to basically determine the temperature you need uh, for random solder. Who knows what kind of solder this is, what temperature you need. So things can vary and, and be really difficult there. So, all right. And then hopefully that is hot. Uh, takes a little bit longer for the hot air gun to warm up. The soldering iron takes like seconds, but this takes about a minute to kind of get to the temperature that I, that I typically need. So we'll see if that is touching it. And it just, I'm melting the plastic on that side. Um, but that is not going to be enough. OK, so we got to go hotter. Think. That is the unfortunate nature. We don't really care that we are uh, melting. Um, we don't really care that we're melting those headers because once again we are taking them off and removing them. So mainly just want to make sure we're not melting uh, this plastic on the other side. So honestly, this plastic this looks like. Uh, hmm. Actually, it looks like a slightly better plastic. I have a feeling that this plastic will burn and this plastic will melt. So, because I, I do think they are quite different types of plastic. This one almost looks uh, like glass fiber reinforced. It's hard to say. I don't want to scratch it. I want to preserve it. So, all right. Now we're in a higher heat setting. And we'll see. I'll try to frame this in. Unfortunately, it's a lot easier to do the desoldering. Um, OK. So it looks like we're walking this out. But yeah, unfortunately, it's a lot easier to do the desoldering um, with my eyes than looking through the microscope. So it's really hard for me to frame this for you guys. OK. Hopefully, that's in frame. Come on. Strategy might not be the best. I think they're just, they're cooling down too much on one side or the other. Perfect. That is exactly how I wanted that to go. Um, and the reason I wanted it to go that way is that um, I didn't put any pressure on this at all. None. Uh, I literally just was holding it uh, a little bit above the desk. And uh, just by. Uh, heating it up, it fell out on its own, which means none of these pins got bent or damaged or hurt at all, and those are very, very, very clean. So that was the point of that. That's why that took a little bit longer, because I was going for, um, I was basically trying to, you know, keep that the highest possible quality that I could. Um, so next, we are going to uh, take off the... Um, Trying to get that in frame. So next, we're going to take off the uh, other things there. So you can see where those, where that thing came out. You can see the pads where it was before. 
And those pads look fucking fantastic. Because we, we haven't forced anything here, just the hot air. We haven't really used that much heat, in my opinion. That is... Hmm. I think there was like a small like QC sticker on there. Yeah, I have no idea what those are. What the fuck? Unless that's literally the board peeling back. Is that? Am I melting the fucking fiberglass on there? What the fuck? I have never seen that before. Yeah, that looks like the top lip. That's like melting the fiberglass. What the fuck? <laughs> I have never seen that on any board I've ever worked on. This must be the cheapest possible board. <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> I have never seen that. Um, huh. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, right? It shouldn't really affect anything, but... I'm curious if I should adjust my approach um, to taking that off. <laughs> I have never seen that. All right, so let's, uh, let's just see if we can uh, get this out quick. Yeah, that solder is not fucking melting, <laughs> but the fiberglass is burning. What the fuck is that shit? <laughs> that is so weird. I've never seen that. All right, so uh, we'll just... Uh We'll see if we can just uh, touch this with a soldering iron, and then we might have to... I guess those are disjoint, so we can see if we can just hit those with the soldering iron. Honestly, if we just hit them with the soldering iron, they'll probably actually be fine um, to do the hot air. That is so weird. It's like the top layer on the fiberglass just, just like, shrank due to tension. Maybe it is like a, a surface thing. But I think once we got under it, we were literally burning the fiberglass. It must just be, like, the cheapest PCB. That's kind of annoying. Not kind of annoying. That's really annoying. Because now this is going to look kind of messy. Um, I just don't like that. I, I, I like when these things come out a lot cleaner. Okay. Um, holy shit. That solder is ass. Okay. Like, it is really hard to melt that solder. Oof. Sorry. I'm trying to hit these at the same time so this falls out as well, like I was doing before. But it's going to be pretty difficult with an actual iron compared to air. So I might have to, like... Now, oh, there we go. I think I, I think I got it. So... Probably going to have to put a little bit of pressure. It hasn't fallen out yet. At least I don't think it's fallen out yet. Nope. It is not. <laughs> More lead. Huh. 
Come on, I want that to fall out. I really don't want to have to like rip it out, grab it. I'm trying to baby this as much as I can. It might just not have enough mass on its own, to be honest, to just come out. It, it like might, it literally might not be able to overcome the surface tension of solder. You like this technique? Come on. Okay. I'm gonna try and grab the board by it. And hopefully, literally grab the wrong one. Hopefully the board has enough weight that I can now kind of do it, but I have to do it like weirdly upside down. Oh, fuck off, dude. Come on. I hate this board, dude. Need a three hand, yeah. So, uh, here's what I'm gonna do. Um, okay. So we're gonna go into here. So this is front side of the board. And then I'm gonna come in here and we're going to cut these. Oops. Okay. All right. Um, so we've now made kind of individual pins. Come on. Come on, dude. Is this just lack of flux? Need something to pull it apart. Um, let me just, I'm just gonna dab it with some flux, see if it behaves a little bit better. Um, I can actually get my, I can kind of get my, here. All right, uh, I cut the, I cut it off so I have some pin in there, so uh, that might fuck me over, but uh, the goal is maybe those pins will come out now. I guess we can come to this side. And then I can kind of push on that pin. Why is my focus way off? I feel like my focus was fine. Oh, I, I guess because I was working on the back side. All right, and then hopefully we can push that pin out now. In before we made it impossible to grab that pin. Well, it doesn't really matter because when we push our wire through, there we go. All right. Uh, 
Come on. Come on. Maybe I can wick it at this point. We'll see. Let's try that. Can push that out. Yeah, well, unfortunately, I can't do that with two hands. <laughs> That's the problem. I mean, I can maybe, maybe I can get some mass on here. Let me see. Hopefully that's enough mass, but then I'm pushing it down. So I need, I basically need uh, something to set it on. And I don't really have any uh, thing that I can set it on. I guess, no. I just need to prop it up a little bit is all I need to really do here. I guess we can use this other pliers. All right, <laughs> there we go. We did it. Now we can poke it. Because hopefully I can desolder and it's off camera, which is kind of hard. But I have it like kind of propped up and a little bit of mass on there. Um. I don't have enough mass on it. Um, I think one of them is out. Maybe? No? Are you, are you, are you, are you fucking serious right now? Look at, look at, look at, look at that. Look at that thing hanging on there. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Fuck off. <laughs> All right, let's just, uh, I'm gonna see if I can get it with that angle. Hey, we did it. We got one out. I actually really just enjoy doing this. This is why I'm not like trying to rush or be super impatient. Um, anyone who's done soldering shit knows that it can be frustrating at times because sometimes things just don't behave. Okay. Um, I'm basically trying to find an artificial way to prop this up and also hold it such that I can poke those pins, but it's not easy. All right. Um, so I think that one is done. Is that the one that we did? Yeah, that's definitely the one that we did. Come on, come on. God, it's so fucking, ah, it just moves so much. God, that's fucking annoying, dude. Holy shit. I can't believe there's that much pin in there too. So. Try 
Trying to tap it out. In before those don't have pins in them. I think they definitely do. God damn. I can't use hot air on this board. It'll just burn. Um. Otherwise, I would use hot air, and this would be super easy. <laughs> it's a, it's definitely a lot easier with hot air. I can give you that. All right, let's get the other one out just so we can get this flat. Um, once we get a, get it flat, we can we have a a couple more like work holding uh options. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm holding this with the pliers and then I'm using my thumb under it. So I, I'm basically applying pressure, upwards pressure to the board. Come on, you fuck. It's just I so hard to get all of those pins hot enough at the same time. I think I'm making progress. Maybe not. Maybe not. It felt like they came through a bit, but I don't know if they did. If you tear off the plastic, that's what we did on the other one, but then it's harder to hold. <laughs> it's tough. There aren't the best options. Okay. Yeah, we can try and cut that plastic, but it's not perfect. The other problem with cutting the plastic is I risk marring the board when I cut them. But I did anyways. So now all of the pins are independent. So what I should be able to do is pry one pin at a time. And hopefully it's not too bad. So let's try this. Come on. Come on. How is that not coming out? What the fuck? How is that not fucking coming out? Holy shit. What? <laughs> what the actual fuck? That is fucking ridiculous. Come 
What the fuck is that made out of? <laughs> Holy shit! Well, no wonder these pins weren't fucking coming out on their own. Holy fuck! I don't think I've ever had- well, I guess I literally would just use hot air in any other situation. Yeah, so one of the- the, the pin literally broke. I put so much pressure on the pin when the solder was melted that the pin broke. What the actual fuck? Let's try the next one. I could just dump more solder on, but I really don't want to because that's just more work later. Yep, that one's also having problems. That is fucking stupid. Okay. Even pulling the plastic off to make sure that somehow that's not like welding it to the board. All right, here we go. Question is, will they come out? It's factory solder. I just don't want to add solder to it because we have to. We're cleaning out the board. Um, but we might have to, to be honest. Probably just making this harder on ourselves at this point. To to B H. Oh my god. There, it's wiggling. It's close, it's close. We'll just push the other ones. Okay. Push that. Push that. Okay. So now they're like hanging in by a thread. So hopefully I can just knock them out by heating up the solder on this side now. Ah. Uh, get out of there. Get out of there. I was hoping there'd be enough friction on it in there. It just doesn't seem to be. Like, come on, dude. We'll give it some gravity. <laughs> you piece of shit. You piece of shit. <laughs> Jesus, what the fuck, man? All right, will the mass of the board be enough? So now I'm holding the entire board by one pin. Probably not. With these pins, I think we already know the answer. Oh, there we go. We got one. Jesus. This board is so scuffed. And here I thought this was just going to be an easy little, just boop the little, you know, hit it with some hot air, have everything come off. <laughs> come on. I know it's out of frame. It's impossible to frame this when I'm trying to fucking solder a board that is floating in midair. There we go. One last one. And then we have pins in all the other holes, but whatever. We'll, uh, we'll deal with that as the time comes. God damn it. How is that not melting? There we go. All right. Um, all right, so now what we need to do is just desolder, um, 
these pins, clean everything up. And then we just need to put uh, some wires in here. So. God, what is this cheap ass PCB? <laughs> what a fucking terrible PCB. I don't think I've ever seen a board burn. <laughs> Literally burn before the solder melts. That's a new one to me. Definitely a new one to me. So, let's go here. Let's get some, uh, where are we going to get these nice and fluxed? A little bit of flux, never hurt anyone. And then... I'm using a flux pen. Honestly, the flux pen just doesn't put enough flux on for my tastes of flux quantities. I like using a fuck ton of flux. I think it makes life a lot better. All right, so let's see if we can, uh, let's see if we can clean up the solder here. Um... I don't know if that's actually gonna wick out of the hole there, to be honest. Pretty hard to say. Ah, it looks like some is. Oh my God, I see daylight. I see daylight. I don't know if I'm on it. Ah, I think I am. There he is, wicking. Didn't wick everything yet, but maybe we got enough. Oh, it's so close. It's so close to being enough. The problem with wick is always like getting it to hit the board at the right angle that you need it to. Come on, dude. Really? Is there more solder on the other side then, maybe? No. All right. This I feel like I'm not getting the right, not getting heating in the right spot. There we go, got it. Solderwick just seems so spotty. In this case, it's just hard because I can't see what I'm heating. There we go. I'm reusing some of the wick in some of these places, but I think it's okay. There's, it's not too used up. I don't want to use it right there, but there we go. Okay. Seems like the wiggle helps a lot, to be honest. I don't want to lift a pad though, and that's why I'm kind of concerned. Okay, this one has, um, this one has a pin in it still. Is that a temperature controlled tip? Yes. Um, so I'm curious if this pin's gonna fall out or if the pin is gonna make this a pin in the ass. Because we've got m more with pins. We've done the three easy ones. Everything else is gonna be hard here. Might have to push that pin out, but that's gonna be fucking hard. Hmm, I just can't get the fucking purchase on that. <sighs> I 
Fucking annoying, dude. I had real solder. Yeah, let's do that. But it might just be fucked due to the um, do that due to the pin being in there. But we'll uh, we'll add solder to all of these. God, that feels so nice working with real solder. <laughs> Weird to add solder to remove solder. But I do know that feel. I'm curious if that's going to actually come out, though, because that pin in there. You know what? I think it wants to, actually. Oh. What? Mm -hmm. Come on. I really don't want to push that pin out because it's going to be a fucking pain in the ass. <sighs> I don't think I have any way of grabbing that pin. Yikes. All right, I think I might, um, Okay, so I think I'm just gonna knock those pins out uh, off stream, just so, um, or off camera, just so I can actually get at them. It'll just make it much easier, so let's see. Do do do. Do you have any solder suckers? Solder suckers I have never worked in my life. I have some, but they have never actually done shit. Okay, one out. Oops. Two out. Three out. That's a thing. Uh, four out. And five out. Okay, so should have all those pins out now. That's new solder tips? My solder tip's fine. I've got no problem with it. What temp do you have your iron set to? 350 Celsius. 
way too hot, but that's what the solder needs. All right. Okay. Um. So now, uh, I just want to clean up the rest of the solder. Nice, that one came out good. Mm, I don't know if that one is through. One of these still has a like fleck of a pin still on it. Come on, there we go. All right, um. That was one of the pins. Okay, now that those are out, uh, we just have to re-hit these because I think two of those still had a little bit of a uh, pin stuck in them, so. But we should, this should be the end right here, at least for these pins. The other pins were easy. Really, the, the main problem is this, the, whatever's going on with this fiberglass, this PCB itself, like, these pins have been fine. It's the fact that we couldn't use hot air here that is absolutely outrageous to me. And hopefully those clean up when we touch them. And it looks like they will. Maybe not that one. Come on. Those ones look good, and then checking the other side. Basically just touching these up is completely unnecessary, but I like uh, making sure everything's flowing there and behaving nicely. And it looks like they are, except for this one. Might be easier to access that solder from this side, so let's try this now. And there she goes. All right. So those ones are all good. Now we just have four. What's funny is we could literally just put the pins down here or some shit. <laughs> but yeah. What are we looking at? We're looking at a, well, technically right now, we're looking at a riser board that we have to desolder so we can put uh, new custom wires on it. So we're basically taking a adapter of wire, uh, adapter from a SOP to a dip, and we are rewiring this board. This is the board that that adapter sits on, and we are going to put wires through it, which is going to allow us, uh, once we have wires on this, we'll be able to plug this into the printer. So we're basically replacing a chip on the printer with a uh, remotely accessible, well not remotely, but uh, externally accessible chip with which can be resocketed. It's gonna be pretty cool, I think. So 
So what's really interesting is that there's clearly a different solder that was used uh, on the same board. So they must have had multiple processes. I Like, that's really confusing to me, but I guess maybe they bought them. Uh, maybe they bought them with uh, different stages of prep. It's kind of weird to me. So we're going to add uh, fresh solder to all of these uh, four pins. And just make sure that we're able to uh, dilute it with a little bit of lead. And then hopefully we can suck it out a little bit easier. Do the same thing with the ones down here. Just touch them with a little bit of fresh solder. Depth of field is hard with one eye. Okay. That looks good. All right. Hopefully I can cut out some of that chromatic aberration here, but it's it's just tough. It kind of depends on the focus level, how bad the aberration is. It's fucking stupid. I, I have no idea how they made such a bad lens on the camera uh, thing. Really frustrating to me. Oh, I wish that wasn't the case. Okay, we'll add a little bit more flux. Okay. You might want a Paul level of flux on that. So, uh, unfortunately, I have a flux pen right now, which is the flux that I have next to me, um, which sucks. Fucking hate flux pens. Let's see. what the best thing to apply flux with is to be honest it's actually like kind of a hard problem we'll use uh i don't want to go upstairs and get a q-tip that's the only problem how much does flux matter for removing solder Like, that's something I never really think about, but I guess it's pretty important, isn't it? Keep a couple syringes around. Yeah, I really need to get that. Yeah, the, I thought the pen was going to be convenient. No, it just fucking sucks. Put flux on the wick? Okay, I'm down. I'll do that. I guess I can, like... Here, this is what I'm gonna do. Look at that, look at that. I put, oh, you can't see it. You can barely actually see it due to the coloring. But I, I there's some flux. <laughs> I put a little bit on there. It's not too much. But yeah, that's actually a, a good idea. I don't know why I didn't think about that. I think I'm just too stingy with flux, to be honest. Like, that might be one of my biggest issues with soldering, is I'm just way too stingy on flux. And that's why sometimes it just feels like it's so hard to get solder to connect. Because I'm fucking making it hard on myself. Because this is so easy. <laughs> so fucking easy. Let me, uh... I gotta move my fan to a better spot. Um, hang on one second. Go farther down on the wick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was doing. But, uh, well, about to do. It's actually got, like, a really weird twist there. Open up the braid? Oh, that makes sense. I'm guessing it's just literally a, a matter of surface area. I actually wish I had a little bit pointier of a tip. Damn.
Huh? I don't know if that's through. Yes, it is. I guess it's not maybe all the way through. We'll just touch it. it should do the trick. Actually, is there something in there? It looks like there's something in there, but there shouldn't be. I think that's just like a weird reflection. All right. That was good. That was good. I, I like... I guess I'm just a fucking under under user of uh of flux. All right, one second. Way too much shit on my desk. <laughs> Way too much shit on my desk right now. Whatever. It's not. It's not the worst. All right. So, uh, let's do this. Turns out, maybe I just haven't been using enough flux my whole life. <laughs> like, that might literally have been the problem. God damn. I used to dab the flux, now I flood. Yeah, like, holy shit. That was a, that was a fucking eye-opener here. Um... This is so easy. Why doesn't everyone do this? Shit. I could do this in my sleep. Okay. Add more flux. Uh-huh. Oh man, dude, do I love flux or what? Friendship ended with not flux. Now friends with flux, you know? Oh my God, that's a fucking game changer. I was way, way too passive with flux, I guess. Holy shit. Oh, that one's not completely out. It's actually going to be probably pretty hard to get the remainder out of that hole. To be honest, a lot of this is just really hard uh, to do in the microscope. Because I'm trying to do it in the microscope. Like, this stuff I wouldn't be doing on the microscope, to be honest. But I can't get you guys a better view. But that looks good. Okay, everything looks cleaned up, I think. Maybe that one isn't. Like this one? It seemed like that had a little bit of debris. I guess what we can do is just wave something with a different color underneath and see. Yeah. It looks like this hole right here is not clear. I don't know why. It must just have like one little fleck or something in there. We're just gonna touch it. This is just fun. <laughs> I'm just having enough fun right now. 
I'm just gonna touch that and uh, re-extract it out. Now that I've discovered the miracle that is uh, Paul Flux, I'm not even using Paul levels of Flux, to be honest. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. Gorgeous. And that one's definitely a clean through. Okay. We did it. Two hours to remove 16 pins. Yup. It ain't easy. Alright, so then... Yup. All of those holes are clear. Yeah, honestly, that would have been a lot easier if that fucking board could be hot aired. I, I have no idea what the ever-loving fuck is up with this board. <laughs> like that, that just sucks. That made it really tough. Luckily you didn't kill those traces. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I did. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely did not, but actually the burns aren't even by the traces. I guess, where's that trace? I actually don't know where that trace is. Oh, is this a multi-layer? Yeah, where, where is the trace? Where's the chase for this hole? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, it's this one. I'm uh, it's literally this one. <laughs> mirrors. That's how mirrors work. <laughs> That's how mirrors work. Woo! I was literally looking at the wrong side. Yeah, that's the only pin on this side of the board. And that trace is fine. And then here. Yeah, I was expecting it to be on the top, but that's uh, that's not how mirrors work. <laughs> okay. All right, so what we need to do is uh, just get some wire. So... Um, interestingly... <laughs> One of the reasons why I wanted to uh, go with the connectors, I actually found this. Strangely, I found this that I actually made. Uh, this was made for a um, a BIOS, where I basically socketed. Um, I basically used this so I could uh, have. I did the same thing to a computer. The same thing we're doing right now. I did do a computer TLDR. Um, but. I'm just using that for the wire because they are in good shape. So, because we're we have a little a little bit of a wire shortage right now, um, unfortunately, <laughs> due to this, uh, I've got like a tiny amount left on my spool, uh, but I just ordered some new wire. Although it's probably not going to come for two weeks because I actually. Got some like really nice wire and it wasn't super available. So we're going to, uh, first thing we're going to do is just strip this. Okay. Cool. So that is good. I need to make like a pile of good wires. Put the bad wires over here, and I need eight wires. Um, unless my wire strippers can do these, but I think it's gonna struggle. I've kind of always just, uh, I think this is a 32 gauge wire. Okay, I can strip this actually. I can strip it just fine. 
I can strip it on the 30, but I have to like uh, slightly twist the uh, strippers such that they engage a little earlier, but it, it, it's fine. It's good enough. Maybe I spoke too soon. One of them was easy. Okay, there we go. Two. Three. Four. That stripped like too easy. <laughs> the variance on this seems pretty high. Here, we'll we'll get one we'll get one action shot. I'm gonna have to like raise the focus quite a bit. I wish the, the zoom wasn't so high on this uh, microscope. Here comes an action shot. You ready? Bink. Oh man! Wow, what an action shot! Thrilling. Woo! <laughs> Okay, uh, we've got, how many wires is that? One, two, three, should be seven here, I think. Four, five, six, seven, one more. This one I'll need, uh, I guess I can use this. I'm literally going off wire scrap here. It's, uh, it's rough. Alright, that's eight. Okay. Have you heard of printer yellow dots? Yes, I have. Okay. So, what we want to do is... We want the brown side of the board to face the printer. So this will be the printer here. And this will go up against there, so we can just hide that that ever happened. And then that means we will want to socket our connector thingy. Um, and let me make sure that that slips in, but it should. Oh, um... We actually have to go uh, the burn mark facing out uh, because these are not reversible holes. Well, I guess technically we could. Um, we could actually use the, the clean side. We could just flip it around and use the clean side and just use new holes. But. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't put that upside down. Well, I could I could put it upside down if I go one row down, right? Is that how that works? Yeah. So I could go one row down. If I put it upside down, I could go one row down. Uh, and then I could have the gross part facing the printer. But I would need to make sure that I don't fuck up the wiring. <laughs> Because there's non-zero risk with that. And I think that is my concern. It is basically fucking that up. Um, what is that? I just skipped the first hole, I think. If I, if I do that. Um... Yeah, I just skipped the first hole. I think I'm gonna do that. <laughs> so I think what we're gonna do is we are going to put in the socket. It's kind of hard to see, but the socket is basically going to go um, into, instead of this hole, it's actually gonna start in here. So one, two, three, and four, which means that we don't want to solder a wire into these top two holes. Um, and that's going to mean that we're going to get to use new traces and fresh everything. And the kind of burnt side of the board will be able to face uh, to the printer, uh, which will just make it look better. So let me double check. 
that I can actually insert that there, but I can. Yeah. Yep, that will work just fine. Yeah, uh, we're gonna do that. It's just it's just going to be more aesthetically uh, pleasing. So that means that the wires are going to want to come up through or go down into the burnt side of the board. And then we'd need to skip the first two holes. So chat, when I go, when I go to place a wire, when I go to place a wire into the burnt side of the board or into the first holes, you're gonna say, no, stop, you're stupid, don't do that. And then I won't do it. So that's all, that's all I need out of you, chat. <laughs> that's all you gotta do today. It's your one goal. I'm gonna try to change the angle of the light here to give you a little bit more contrast. And hopefully that works. All right. So the question is, how do I want to solder uh, wire into here? Um, I guess we can just, uh, I think I'm just gonna put solder on the tip of my iron and poke it uh, through. I think that is my plan. Okay. And unfortunately, since this is sitting flush on the ground or on the table, um, it's a little bit of a weird angle. Okay. And mm, yeah. Hmm. I want that in there more. I guess, uh, let me see if I can find like a riser or something that I can set this on. Um, something, something. Because I really want to be able to push that through. Let's see if this roll of tape works. Nope, it's too big. Um, damn it. <laughs> I don't have... There we go. I have a spool of wire that I can use. And this will just let me push the... Uh, It'll let me push the wire in further, which will give us hopefully a better solder job. Okay. All right. And let me make sure that there is a good amount of solder on that and that looks good so my only concern is I need to make sure that there is contact on the wire and that I don't go too deep and I go through the hole because the um, this wire will go through the hole so I need to make sure that doesn't happen okay let's, uh, let's bang these out This wire is so fucking hard to work with, but I love it. Love this wire. I bought a, um, basically a set of wire of various sizes. God damn it, dude. Literally, this is why I hate fucking wires, because they just are all over the place. I'm going to try and flatten that wire and hopefully that behaves better. In fact, I might like use some flux to stick this down. Looks like it takes the solder well. Yeah, this wire is fantastic. But it, it's so, um, it's so light. 
that it's really hard. I'm trying to get this in frame. It's so light that it's really fucking hard to work with. Yep, I went too deep on that. I don't know if it actually matters with this wire, to be honest. Like, I might be able to just melt the, uh, I'm curious. I might be able to just put it in. But, uh, that went through. That's kind of the main issue with this, is the wire's gonna go through. Um, so I'm restripping this wire. I need like maybe wire with a thinner insulation so I can uh, just melt it in there. Although honestly, I feel like I might literally be fine just uh, putting the wire in to be honest. So whatever. Um. So, I'm, basically, this is all very difficult due to the, um, it's just hard due to the microscope. Because <laughs> I'm trying to get it in frame for you guys, but um, I have no depth perception in a microscope, which means I can't see how deep I put the wire, which is a little bit of a problem. So let's, uh, here we go. So I'm gonna try to frame it, uh, and then I am actually going to look at it and not through the microscope. Here we go. Okay. Um. Need more solder on my tip. Come on. All right, and let me see. God, no fucking solder came off of my iron there. Okay. I'm gonna just touch all of them actually. Uh, did that get fucked because the wire moved on me? There we go. Yep. Literally, the like fume extractor has enough power to literally blow that away. It's fucking ridiculous. talk about your setup if you're gonna do more streams like this it's just really hard to uh, capture things like this on a camera there's not really a great way to do it all right 
So we got four more wires. I'm actually gonna try to tin the pads. Um, so we're gonna go and try and fill in those pads and then heat them up and stick the wire through. I think that's gonna be easier for this next round. This should be a lot easier. I M O. God, that lens is so fucking bad, dude. Yeah, that that was the play. For sure, that was the play. Holy shit, that was so much better. Done. And these are coming out so much nicer too. It's not, it's not even that it's easier, it's that it's literally just better. Just do a quick inspection on the other side. Make sure that we have a decent amount of solder on those. And they look fine. And then I'll trim off some extra wire. I think there's one of these that I'm just gonna maybe touch up. I don't know if it's worth it. Nah, it's fine. It's actually one of the first ones. One of the first ones. I'm gonna just touch it real fast here. This is where the regret happens and I make it worse. I improved it. Okay, so now we have to um, do the easy part, which is uh, we have to um, actually cut up the printer. I think. Come on. Wait, what is that stuck on? What is that possibly stuck on? There we go. There we go. All right. So, now, now what we want to do is actually um, cut open the printer. So, got to move this out of the way. Good, 
Good. Good. Move that out of the way, and then let's just try to clean up a bit here. So the, I guess we're not completely done with that. I don't know if I want to put, yeah, I think I do actually want to put the, um, this back on. So I think we'll do that. So we will go and take that piece and we'll, um, I think just one of these lights is probably funny here. I don't need both. Turn it down a bit. And then I need to basically change where the camera is aiming for white balance. Which I can just use the dirty pluck spot. All right. Um, so now that those wires are in, we can go and uh, add this to the board. And let's just make sure, yep. That is pin number one, all the way down. And this one should be really easy because this one will kind of retain itself, hold itself in there. You know, one of those, uh, one of those other pads got touched somehow. I have no idea how, but one of those pads ended up actually getting touched. So I just need to clear out one of those pads quick. That shouldn't be too bad. Come on, heat up. Okay, we'll have to probably wick that, I guess. Now that all these wires are hanging on here, it's gonna be a pain in the ass. Not that it was easy before. Come on. Oh, it's so close. Uh, it's like just almost not enough solder on there, to be honest. To really wick it out. I think I'm gonna have to add solder then. Son of a bitch. No helping hands tool? Nope. I think I have one somewhere, but to be honest, it was a pain in the ass to use. It was like really actually not that nice. It, it, it felt like it actually made things worse. Um. I probably just had a cheap one because I had it when I was younger. Maybe I could just get one that actually has mass now and it would actually work. But goddamn, the one that I had when I was a kid was fucking useless. Holy shit. Is that out? Nope. Oh my god, son of a bitch, dude. I actually don't fucking know. <laughs> it would probably be useful now, even if it's fucking trash, just because this board is just all over the place. I think I got it. Okay. Even just a big clamp. Yeah, that would probably be useful. I mean, that's what I did to actually, uh, off, off camera, I did that earlier. But didn't work with my s camera setup. All right, so that is in there. So now all I need to do is just tack all of those quickly, which should be relatively easy. 
lay those flat, try and get them out of the way. Now we're just gonna hit all, uh, all of those pins, which I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get you an angle. Honestly, maybe the, maybe the microscope hurts more than it helps. God, this fucking camera tripod is so bad though. Um, honestly, that doesn't look terrible. All right, uh, we're just gonna touch all those pins. That's all we gotta do. And now this is like normal soldering where it's easy. Fucking easy, dude. It's so easy when work holding is easy. That's how it kind of is with like most things in life. W like building shit is uh, work holding is kind of the most important part. And kind of more specifically like patience in work holding, like waiting. waiting to set things up correctly. All right. This looks really good. Yeah, this is a great. Um, quality work holding is also CNC must. Yeah, absolutely. All right, now we got to check our work. Um, we're just gonna make sure that uh, that should be at the top one, I think. Good, 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 good. Good, good, good. All right. And now I'm actually checking the side, which has the actual pins that will make contact with the chip. It's hard to get on camera. Okay, so now the really the only failure point is basically if the wires uh, uh, do not make contact. So. Now the question is, do I have any isopropyl alcohol so I can actually fucking clean this? Um, is there an alternative to isopropyl alcohol? I'm trying to think where I would have some. If I do have any. I know I bought some. The question is, did it survive a move? Because there's a good chance that, uh, like, I wasn't allowed to move it or something just because it was, like, liquid, which sometimes you can't move. Let me see. I'm going to do a quick look.
All right, what are what are my alternatives to isopropyl alcohol? Glasses cre cleaning spray? Hmm. Nope. <laughs> Everclear strong vodka. Uh, hmm. <laughs> God damn it. Windex. Check hand sanitizer ingredients. I bet it's just ethanol, wouldn't it be? Best I can do is ethyl alcohol. <laughs> Shit. Um. I clean up my desk first. God, that's that's a brutal man. What is it about uh, eth ethanol or not ethanol? Isopropyl that works. I'm gonna I'm gonna try the hand sanitizer. This is my experiment for what works. Does hand sanitizer work? Ah, no, not really. <laughs> Ethyl alcohol, yeah. Yeah, maybe that worked a little bit. Can, can you use ethanol? Is ethanol fine in electronics? I feel like it is. It probably, it probably doesn't matter, right? Doesn't fucking matter. There's no way it fucking matters, right? No, I, it can't. It can't matter. We're just gonna, we're just gonna do it. We're just gonna clean it. But there's also water, yeah. I mean, water doesn't matter in this, right? I could also use water to clean this. As long as it's dry by the time that I uh, squeeze a lemon on it. I also have Goo Gone. I don't know if Goo Gone would work, but Goo Gone would definitely make it not fucking sticky. Like, I don't even care about how it physically looks. I just want it to not be a sticky mess. Some of those leads are pretty sharp, fucking up this uh, vinegar. Can I use balsamic? <laughs> it's still like really sticky. I'm trying random things. I like this. I feel like this is a this is a good experiment right now. I'm gonna try this. Can that work? That's acceptable, in my opinion. And then there's still like some stickiness on the top and shit, and just on sides. Places I've grabbed. I'm really just trying to clean up the stickiness. I don't really care too much about the appearance, how it looks.
hard to tell how much is that or my fingers. <laughs> Might have to clean off the Goo Gone, yeah. That's, that's basically what I did there. Is I used Goo Gone and then I just cleaned it off. That actually works really well. Um, okay. I would say that is good. There's nothing here that's sticky, nothing that's really visible. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. So it is time to install this into the printer. Um, yeah. All right, so we have to grab the printer. Now we get to do the fun part. Okay, had to make sure my hot air gun wasn't still hot because I'm kind of moving it in a weird spot now. All right, so for this, what I want to do is we want to go to the lowest temperature we possibly can. That will melt the solder. I'm going to go, I'm going to see if 400 uh, Fahrenheit, 200 Celsius is sufficient for the solder. It, in theory, should be. I know you're not really going to be able to see this. Okay, that's not touching it. Even though it should be able to, but maybe it just can't get through the oxide layer. Um, all right, we'll go to 250. Okay. Uh, 250 seems to work. So that is basically, we want to go to the lowest temperature because we actually need to be pretty gentle to this. And I don't know why I moved the printer here because we actually just need to go to the... Uh, so technically, we need to... Um, well, we need to desolder that. So yeah, let me get my hot air running. Okay. So we're gonna need to, we need to desolder the chip on the board, uh, which should be pretty easy. Um, and then once we have done that, um, we just need to uh, solder to all of the pins, which is, uh, or solder to all of the pads, which is going to be fucking hard. And we also need to probably do it inside of here um, because we're going to need to cut that hole. And actually, we no longer need to make a big hole. So before I was basically, uh, I don't even know where I put, I don't even know where I put it. All of that work. I guess I just need to look for wires. Where the fuck is it? <laughs> what? Oh, I said it over here. Yeah. Okay. Um. So basically, all I need to do is make a. Before it was going to be a relatively large hole, but it's no longer really a big hole. Um. I just probably want something that is large enough such that this can sit flush. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do, um, so I'm actually going to try to file down the, uh, the leads on there and the solder because I want this to sit as flush as I possibly can. So I basically want the, uh, the leads to be flush with the uh, fiberglass. 
And I'm not I'm not going too aggressive on here. I'm not doing anything too crazy. Just trying to get it uh, a little bit flatter. Okay. Looks pretty good. Okay, and then we'll uh, take this off. And I just need to be careful that I don't solder. There's actually no, uh, there are no traces on this side of the board. So it's really just a matter of making sure I uh, get it clean enough that I don't uh, bridge with the, um, I don't want to bridge a connection with this dust that I'm creating right now, but. <sighs> Honestly, that worked a lot better than I thought. Um. Okay. And I need to be careful that I don't break one of these wires. They are quite thin. And breaking them at this point would be very difficult, or a, a big issue, because I wouldn't be able to, um, I wouldn't be able to really get in there to re-solder them. So, clean between those. That's good. So now those are flush. Everything is quite flush there. I'm gonna do one quick continuity check now that I have filed those down, which um, potentially could have damaged the uh, connections, but I kind of doubt they did because I was pretty careful about that. So, um, let's go down the line here. Non continuity mode. Holy shit, I was scared there. Good. Good. I'm also checking the pins next to it to check for shorts. It should only be a one to one. Good. 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 Okay. Uh, we should be fine on all of those. All right. So now. I hate how that like gets so washed out on the camera. So now those are in there quite good. Um, so what I need to do is basically make a hole that is large enough to fit all of these things through. But I want the wires, basically I want all of the pads to make it through uh, into the printer. Um, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to end up in a situation where, like, the wires fit through down here where you can clump them together, but they don't fit through at the base. Um, because if they don't fit through at the base, I'm going to have a problem. Well, I won't necessarily have a problem, but it won't be able to fit it flush. So we have, uh, it looks like, pretty crude measurement, but it looks like, Probably nine nine point one millimeters on that dimension, and um, about eight point three. So, just gonna make note of that quick. Um, nine point one millimeters by eight point three millimeters. 
Uh, that's not perfect, right? Not an absolutely perfect measurement. And those should be on the small side. Uh, and that's what we want. So, uh, I guess we start this adventure by filing and or drilling a hole in the printer. So, we're just going to do it right in the back here. Uh, it should be fine. There's nothing that really comes through here. So, we should be good. And then le let me make sure um, that we'll have enough clearance where it sits. Okay, so I'm going to uh, grab, I brought up my X-Acto knife, but I don't know, oh, here it is. I'm basically just going to kind of scribe approximately where I want this to go. Okay, and then down to here. All right, somewhere in that ballpark. And I'm just gonna double check my work here. Looks like we're pretty good. So um, I'm basically finding the, the top and the bottom of where I want this hole to be such that I can, and you can't really see this, and I don't know if I'm gonna get a good view on this. Um, so I made kind of two marks there. And those marks should be basically the height of the board. My plan is to have this go in sideways, uh, just because it will fit better. Uh, this board has a height of 21.63 millimeters. And then the height of the scribe marks hopefully is close to that. It's probably a little bit off. 21.22. Uh, so we just need to half that. So half of 21.2 would be... Um, I guess uh, 10.5. So we just want to go 10.5. Say 10.55, and we'll just try to cut a small little mark in there, and that should be about halfway in between. Let me just double check that quick before I cut a hole. Good and good. Okay, so um. We know that our smallest dimension is 8.3 millimeters, so let's just say 8. Uh, I don't know what that comes out to in size, so I'll just measure a, a drill bit. Because I'm just going to, I'm going to drill the biggest hole that I possibly can. That's 9.4. I just want to make sure I don't oversize it. Not that it matters too much to oversize it. Uh, honestly, maybe oversizing is fine. If I just do a straight hole, actually... So that's a 7.76. If I do a, a 3 8 inch, if I do a 3 8 inch, basically I'm trying to figure out if I want to make a square hole or if I just want to make a round hole because this is 9.3 millimeters, 9.4, uh, which means that I would just be able to put, wherever I keep putting this piece, I would just be able to uh, put that through the hole in all dimensions. Um, it would be oversized on one of the sides, but it doesn't really matter because all of this would end up going through anyways. So, question is, do I want a square hole or a round hole? I think we're just gonna go for the round hole just cause it's a little bit easier. So we're just gonna put a hole right in there And then uh, we're going to do this on, a, on the lowest torque setting that we can. Um, I'm going to pilot drill this just to be careful. We'll go with a relatively small bit, but nothing too crazy. I would center punch it, but I don't even know if this could, if plastic would survive my center punch. <laughs> okay. Wow, that actually melted the plastic. So I, I have it on torque setting one. 
I don't even have it on a high torque setting. I thought that was gonna torque out. Some soft fucking plastic. Should be uh, reinforced. Okay. It's so hard to judge. Oh yeah, that torqued out, okay. All right, we'll just put it on drill mode. <laughs> it didn't drill. It literally is just going through. Son of a bitch. <laughs> that fucking sucks. Uh, let's, uh, I guess we'll just try and go to a smaller bit size and try and clean it out more and more. It reminds me of when I was drilling a hole to put a reset switch on my Wii. Huh. I remember uh, doing a mod chip on my brother's Wii when I was a kid. That was so fun, dude. Just want to break those chips. Um, and then try to uh, go to a slightly larger size. So Slowly but surely, we will try to progress to a larger and larger size. Otherwise we can just get in there with a file. It doesn't matter too much, but I prefer to keep it relatively uh, circular and it's just, it's just not gonna go. All right, um, let me see if I can use a real file rather than the small little files. I think these are gonna probably be too big. No, sweet. Come on. Okay, uh, so what we can do is just uh, clean that up on the other side. Um, I don't know what file I want to use here. Let's see is, uh Okay, and on this side, we're just gonna do, since this side matters cosmetically, um, I'm gonna use a circular file and just put a small little chamfer on that. Not that this hole is gonna be visible anyways, to be honest, but... You know, it's just fun getting in here, cleaning it up, making it look good or look bad, depending on your views. Okay, uh, sweet. Then uh, we'll just get in there, just kind of clean this out. Okay, that actually worked as I was hoping, where it actually picked it up on the cloth rather than uh, just pushing it all over the printer. Not that it really matters, because I'm never gonna really use this printer to print, but I would like the option to be able to if I had to. Okay, and then my clean paper towel. 
just brush this all off. Alright, so, um, we might have to embiggen the hole, but that isn't too big of a deal. So, I'm going to feed these wires through and just see if we are good on the sizing here. If we're not, then we'll just expand it a little bit more. Hmm. Like, I feel like that's not going to be big enough. Oh. Oh, it's off by, like, a few millimeters. Uh, there's a kink in that wire. I'm going to take that kink out just so I don't end up uh, pulling that lead off. Okay. Isn't that a good sound, chat? You like that sound? Mmm. <laughs> mmm, ASMR. Mmm, mmm, mmm. You know what? I am going to straighten out these wires and then cut them all to one, whatever their shortest size is. I don't, I know I'm not going to need all of the, uh, definitely not going to need all of this wire. <laughs> Boom. All right, so now I can hopefully feed all of these through in parallel. I'll speed up that process. Okay. Okay, that sits flush. Look at that! Look at that! So that is the, uh... I'm trying to figure out if it's still putting a little bit of tension on those. So I want to make sure that it is, uh... I want to make sure that it's not putting tension on that. And I think it is just a smidge, just a small bit. Having the SSD on the outside of your case. Okay, now we've got probably like one or two millimeters of play in each direction, which means we are definitely not pinching any of those wires, uh, which is really good. Okay, so uh, we're just going to grab a vacuum cleaner. I'll be right back.
Chat, don't forget to vacuum out your printer today. <laughs> very important to vacuum out your printer every once in a while just double check make sure your printer's been nice and vacuumed out I'm just breaking this edge here is a work of art. <sighs> Look at that, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, we didn't really make a mess of that. Clean, clean. So now, now we got a hole in our printer. There you go, trying to get the light in there. <laughs> it's actually a pretty good looking hole. I'm pretty impressed. That is a work of art right there, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> if you see a chip on the outside, your printer may be hacked. <laughs> oh man, yeah, we're taking we're taking our sweet time. Honestly, I just really enjoy like working with my hands. So, to me. This is just kind of enjoyable. I'm not really rushing through this because we can rush through code when we get to that. All right, so the question is, should I glue this on now or once I've put all the wires on? I think we'll do it after we get all the wires in. Um, and I think I am going to, uh, so I'm kind of planning on just literally installing the board and then soldering it in um, just so, well, we're going to desolder the, we're going to desolder the chip on it first. But then I'm going to probably solder the new chip on, or the wires on, while the board is in. Uh, just so it does the work holding for us. So, we've had that hot air gun prepping for a while. I can move the drill. We'll just move it over there. Uh, put my drill bits back in. I'm just going to organize everything up quickly. We do have a bit in there. Don't forget to put your tools away where you got them from. Shit is a good idea. Okay. We have two files here. And then we have the uh, two files here. I'm glad I got those files. Put them to good use. I think that's the first time I used those. Mutinous, thank you so much. Hell yeah, thank you for the three months. Three months of advanced support. Holy shit. I didn't even know you could do that. Thank you so much. All right. Um, we're just going to lift that chip off. We don't have the best uh, way of grabbing that chip. So I don't know if I'm going to use needle nose pliers. or if I want to use these pliers. Little channel locks. My favorite pair of pliers that I have. I think we're gonna go with these. All right. We're gonna pop 
chop this chip off quick. Done. Donezo. Okay. So we have popped the uh, the flash off of there. Now that the flash is off, we'll just put that in a safe spot. Um, cool. And now all we need to do is... Uh, did I turn that off? No, I didn't. Okay. So we just have to... Um, solder those wires on so unfortunately this isn't going to be trivial it's actually probably gonna be harder than what we did before and let me see if I can get you in on this without using the microscope and I'm gonna make sure I have you focused on the right spot and that looks good so unfortunately, I am left-handed, and the camera is not in a left-handed friendly spot. So I'm going to try to move the camera. I'm going to try to move the camera as much as I can to a better spot. Um, and basically, we're going to go through and put those uh, wires on. I guess we need to set everything back up again. Um, because we need to do this in the printer. Um, Okay, let's install this board quick. This board goes in this way. All right. And we'll just install this board. This is really just to give us an anchor, which is the printer. gonna allow us to hold this a lot fucking better which will hopefully make this a lot easier now the hard part here is gonna be holding the wires um, and unfortunately not a great solution to that that's so just gonna kind of suck yeah you can't see shit sorry <laughs> um, I'm just screwing in the board Okay, good, good, okay, that should be in there, just fine, all right, not flapping in the breeze, and then I'm going to plug in these connectors for no reason other than to keep them out of the way, just want to make sure that there's nothing flapping around getting in the way. In fact, this one I'm actually going to put under the board. Chat, don't let me forget that I stuffed this connector under the board. If I forget, I there will be something that won't work. <laughs> All right, we'll plug these in. Actually, that's the wrong one. It's this one. I'm actually kind of impressed that they color-coded all of these wires or all of the connectors, it makes this so easy. I guess if it makes assembly easier, then it technically probably saves money because it saves time on the manufacturing side of things, which is kind of interesting. So then these, I think those I can tuck under. I'm trying to tuck things under, but I'm just really afraid they're gonna like spring out while I'm soldering and I'm gonna touch one of those, which would kind of suck. All right. So that's what we want to hit. I'm gonna have to change kind of where the camera is pointing and the white balance. Otherwise we can go back to the microscope, but uh, I'm hoping this will have a higher quality. I'm gonna go down just a bit. God, this, this fucking tripod sucks. 
I ordered it and ordered a new nice tripod. Okay. So it's not the best, but it's it's a it's a it's an artistic different perspective. So it doesn't it's maybe not it's definitely a higher image quality than the um microscope, but I think it's a, a worse angle. You won't be able to remove the board without desoldering the wires? Yeah, that's fine. Um, there, there's nothing, um, I mean, to be honest, what I could do is just cut a small, like, slit vertically in this, um, and that would allow me to just pop it out, so. But yeah, like, there's nothing under this, right? There's nothing under this board. I mean, I won't be able to take the board out, but yeah, I could make, I could literally cut that straight, like a cut, not actually even file it out because I could bend the plastic enough to get the wires out. So um, I'm not too worried about that, I think. I think I'm not too worried about that. I'm gonna put this away. Don't want that to get dirty. Um, all right. So, and we can do that after the fact as well. So we're gonna leave extra wire here. Um, yep, and that's popping out. We'll just stuff this in this connector. Even though it's the wrong connector, we're just gonna stuff it in there. Um, Okay. Hmm. How do I want to do this? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, it's a little out of frame. I'm going to temporarily just back this off. Um, I'm going to clamp this to the, um, to the printer. Just a little bit, nothing crazy there. Um, I'm going to clamp that, and then what I'm going to do is feed through one wire at a time. And this will allow me to try to keep the surface as clean as possible, but also uh, will allow me to line up which wires are which. So right, this one coming through right now, this is going to be pin number one. Um, and thus, that's going to come across to here. And we're going to have a lot of extra wire, but that's fine. That is planned. Uh, I think the goal here is to have a little bit extra wire than what I need. That will allow us to move things around if we need to. Oh my god. Unfortunately, this wire uh, this wire stripper, or the wire is thinner than what the wire stripper can do. So I'm kind of just playing around there with, uh, playing around with that wire stripper and kind of trying to twist it such that I can actually make contact with the wires. Okay. So we're gonna get some flux on there. And then, yep, that has the pin one designation. I mean, we technically get to pick which one is pin one, but uh, this is going to be pin one. I'm going to do one last check to make sure, with continuity, to make sure that I understand which pin goes where. So, pin one is going to be to the top and to the left. Um, that is the plan. So, we have this wire. We're going to come through to that pad, and we'll zoom you in as much as we can. And bumping the table kind of sucks here. Sorry about that. But, all right. We have solder ready. We have our iron ready. And... I think there is maybe enough solder 
on the board that we can kind of just use that. Because I think I'll want to pre-solder the pads here because uh, I'm not going to have another hand free. So, um, that's technically on there, but uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to add more solder to that pad. Um, damn, I had it on there good and then I ruined it. All right, that is definitely on there. Okay, next pad. My biggest fear is bridging. Um, I don't want to bridge these wires, and I'm really scared of that. So, going down the line, this is the next wire. We'll feed it through, get it stripped. Okay. Okay, tip is clean. And then we're just kind of waiting for that wire to end up bending into the right shape. So I just keep adjusting the shape of the wire to try to get it to the right angle. Honestly, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna trim that wire. I stripped it a little bit more than I, I want. I wanna, I'm gonna have a very small amount of wire exposed because these are pretty close. So, here we go. It's on there. Um They're on there pretty good. There's a little bit of a, a whisker coming off. I might have maybe had a little bit too much solder on there, potentially. I feel like I didn't, but... Yeah, I definitely need more on these pads, the next ones. I'm adding solder to the next pad. And we're gonna pull in the next wire here. which is right here. Number three, I'm going down the line. Perfect. We're getting better at this. That's on there. I'm just trying to adjust it to a slightly different spot. All 
All right, I think that is the best one so far. I'm actually really impressed with how that one came out. Come on. Just trying to add a little bit of solder to that pad. And it's proving to be very difficult. Honestly, I think I just need a little bit more temp because the it's just taking way too long to melt that solder. God damn. I don't know why that solder is not wanting to melt on that pad. So we're going to add some more flux. Um, okay, I think we have enough solder on that pad now. Um, and the fourth wire, final wire on this side. This actually isn't going too bad. I can't remember what time estimate I, I had at the start. I think I said like four hours or something. We're, we're in that ballpark. I don't know why I'm trying to do that right-handed. That, that's, that's not going to work. Um, Okay, I think that is good. Um, those look fine. Uh, what we're gonna do is check for uh, bridging quick. Okay, there should be no bridging there. I'm gonna check my, uh, I think that's chip select. I think this is ground. Yes, it is. I'm gonna check for shorts to ground. Okay, I'm gonna check to shorts to VCC. Okay, that looks good. Um. So far, no problems. I guess we can do one check and make sure these actually make it to the uh, reader. Okay. That's good. Okay. 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 And that should also be ground. Beautiful. So we have uh, no bridges, no grounds, no shorts uh, on that side. That's pretty good. All right. So now we do the same thing. 
for the next ones. It's like trying to grab these wires out, feed them through. Okay, one wire here. Good. Uh, uh, strip it a bit more, I think. Beautiful. Um, okay, and then we'll do a we'll do a microscope shot once this is all done, as well. People who are curious, I'm I'm actually really curious if that pad we pulled because I just oh. <laughs> I was about to say the pad we pulled definitely just took solder. Yeah, I was talking. I was on the wrong one. Yeah. Okay, so I basically just tinned up those pads. I uh, just added a little bit more solder to them. And uh, now what we should be able to do is just go and uh, bang all these wires on there. So the approach is a little bit harder here, but the visibility is a little bit higher for the, these pads. Wow. Beautiful. Best one so far. Um, okay, next wire is this one. Zink. Damn. Uh... Okay, too long, and then we'll just cut that down a bit. All right, next one. This is pin number six. Damn, that was going well, and then I jerked it off. What do you think about the Chrome Zero Day? Which one? I saw one in the clipboard. It's like uh, the Windows specific one. So I'm not surprised about uh, clipboard bugs. The clipboard in Chrome on Windows has always been quite easy pickings. Um, it's kind of funny, but uh, that used to be one of my go-to areas for bugs in Chrome. Okay. Going to solder to the resistor for the trace with the pulled tab? Yes. Yeah, we're going to put that in right now. Holy shit. I, like, didn't even see. I was literally covering it with my hand, and I think I fucking nailed it. I 
think we're good. I think we're good. That leaves one last wire, which looks to be the last wire. All right. Felt like that stripped too easily, but uh, looks like we're good. Okay. Damn. All right, I think that is in there. Um, all right, definitely weird that we have the one wire that doesn't go in there, but that is correct. So uh, we're gonna do one final check. One, pin two, hello. Pin two, just oxidized. Yes. Okay, so that is all of those. Okay, and now I want to try the other side. Make sure all of those are good. I'm going to have to clamp it again just so I can uh, hold it. This time, I'm going to clamp it upside down. I can zoom you out a little bit here. Basically, I'm just going through making sure we have contact on all of these pins. This should be pin number eight, and we are good. No bridge. That pin seven. Looks like we're good on seven. Okay. Five looks good, and four looks good. Okay. Uh, so we know a couple of these pins. This should be, I think, VCC, and it is. And so we know VCC and ground are good. None of the pins are shorted together. I think, I think we did it. So, um, given all of those connections are good, I'm curious if I should just glue that on right now. Dots? I just glue it on right right now. Um, alternatively, I could just clamp it on there um, and then glue it on once I've tested. Do I have a lip? Anything here? Hmm, I do not. I don't really have any way to clamp that. You have rubber bands? I don't, I actually legitimately don't know if I have rubber bands or not. Um, I think we're gonna put it together very carefully. Um, uh, put it back together very carefully and um, what we're going to do is uh, just glue it on when we know it works. So, Wi Fi. Wi 
whatever this connector is, NCU. Something control unit would be my guess. Um, and somewhere tucked in there. Now it's just like Lego, it's just plugging in everything. Um, connected, connected. This one is the one that goes for a little trip over the board. In, in, in. That one is in. Those three will come from uh, atop the board. And those three are in. That is in. So we need the little plastic shroud. Probably should have waited because I think... Um, so... I think I'm going to route these behind this just because it adds kind of a, it just helps route those a little bit. Okay, and then this shroud goes in here like this. Just gonna make room. Um, that comes around, that goes under that. That is under here. I'm gonna latch that into that hole. This will clamp under that metal once I find the right spots here. That is indexed. Okay. And then our wires are under a little pressure. Relieve those. And they should be good. Nothing has popped out, everything looks fine. Wrap this wire around. This is just uh, basically strain relief on that. Okay, and then we just have, that's on there. So we should have one self-tapper into machined metal, which don't ask me why. <laughs> it's like they used the wrong screw at the factory. But it does actually supply a clamping load, so I am impressed. Let's tighten that up. That is in there. Nothing else actually connects to it. Everything else floats. It's retained by a clip on this side, which is in. And then the rest of these wires we can go and feed in. This is the power supply cable. Uh, and then we just have two others, which I don't really know what they are, nor do I care. And I'm trying to put everything through the strain reliefs uh, just to make sure, you know, things are done properly, correctly, in there snug. This should be kind of a, a permanent closure. This should be kind of in here. Uh, it's probably the last time we actually really pop in here, which is kind of cool. So we can access that. All of those are screwed down tightly. This is in there fine. Um, I bet. Yeah, that retains that quite well, so that's not floating around. And then we'll just pinch these wires under here just to make sure those are retained, and that looks good. So now we just put on the lid, and the lid has uh, three little uh, three cables that we have to kind of get in here. One of them has to go through a magnetic um, little magnet piece there, which I actually didn't pop out, so we'll... Uh, Slide that out quick here. Okay. So. I don't know why they need a magnet on only this one. But we will respect their wishes. And we'll use it. So that ribbon cable is in. And we have this big ribbon cable, which you probably can't see shit right now. Sorry. Big ribbon cable is in, and we have one more ribbon cable. Also pretty big. That one is the panel, which is apparently the screen. All right, so all of those are in, and then what I can do is put in the magnet in the retention spot, or I guess it's not magnet, ferrite bead, core, whatever you want to call it. Um, All right, and then uh, I think we are good there. 
Just make sure everything goes in here. And we're good. And nothing in here put pressure on our wires, although that plastic thing technically um, I am basically making sure that I can actually insert this in because that plastic thing technically covers up some of the hole, but it is, it's like a couple millimeters back, which is far enough back that it's actually not interfering um, with the fit, which is fine. Slight miscalculation on our part, but that's fine. We could have just gone without having the plastic shroud on there anyways. So it's not a critical component. It's mainly just uh, stress or strain relief on those wires. So I'm just putting the screws in, basically buttoning up the printer. Um, yeah, two more screws, one underneath this. God, that sounds so unhealthy, but I think it's fine. <laughs> Pop these in these holes. Good. Last screw. Pog champ. Okay, as engaged, close the lid, close the front flap, and now we have one good looking printer, making sure all of my tools are off here, and they are, okay, that is cooled down, it's turning all those things down. And now we have one printer fully assembled and all we have added is we have a, a little hole in the back. This is a small little hole here. Get a light on that just so you can see better. We have one little hole, has some wires come out and they go to this little board or this little, uh, I guess this little uh, thing. And what we should be able to do is take the chip. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, move the printer temporarily, make sure we don't snag that and rip it out. That would suck. Uh, and I'm going to quickly heat up this iron and we're gonna just touch, we're gonna touch these, uh, these pins on the chip. So, I guess it's not in frame. So we're just gonna touch the pins on this uh, just because some of them have a little bit excess solder. Um, we could maybe try to wick it off, but basically my plan here is hopefully uh, just by touching this, it will uh, just flow the solder onto the pin enough. Basically, I'm trying to make sure that this uh, chip is cleaned up enough uh, that it makes good connection in the socket. Yeah, like that pin had a lot of solder on it to the point that I do think I want to wick it. Um... if I can, which I might not be able to. Okay. Definitely a lot more solder on that pin than I want there to be. But I think I cleaned it up decently on that. 
So we'll rotate it around. Same thing there, just making sure all the pins are cleaned up and I think they're fine. Yeah, they look good. I think those are plenty cleaned up. All right, um, so now all we have to do is uh, socket it into the printer. which hopefully, hopefully we haven't destroyed. So all we're gonna do is, uh, if I can get the angle right on this, probably be able to see it there. Um, oh, there's the chip. It's like, where the fuck did I put the chip? Um, okay. So now we're just gonna take this and pop this chip in. Um, just had to find the pin one designator. Okay, so in theory, that now houses the chip. Um, okay, so in theory, in theory, the printer now will boot. Um, yep, it is plugged in, and here we go, power. Oh no, oh no. Damn. Let's make sure I actually have contact there. Oh no. Hmm. Got a lot of things that could go wrong. So the question is, which one did? Um, unless I like literally didn't plug something into the board that I should have. But uh, I don't know, all those wires look good. Those connections on the socket look fine. All right, let's see uh, if we have power to the chip. Didn't <laughs> plug in the power button. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so we're, I'm basically going to check the voltage on the chip. Let's see if we have voltage to the chip. I can't imagine it's that sensitive to timings that, like, Having the wires just kind of wound randomly like we did is a problem. Um, I think that is. Which one was ground? I think that is. I've got 3.4 volts to the chip. So, the chip is getting power um, to the right pins. Let me double check that. Um, Yep, 
we had 3.4 volts between VCC and ground. Um, so basically, something is fucked. Um, one of the pins is not getting the right, the right thing. So I'm gonna check, uh, I think chip select. There's a couple of these things that we expect to be receiving power. So I'm just gonna see um, if things that I expect are getting power are getting power. Um, point four. Okay, so there's only three pins that actually aren't getting full voltage, and that makes sense. Uh, clock is not, um, clock is not, and then I guess hold reset is not, which makes sense. And uh, I think write protect are the three pins that are not getting any voltage, uh, which is fine. But given all of the other pins have voltage, either we have a short between them, or those are connected just fine. Uh, because I would not expect to see voltage on something that is broken or not connected. So let's just, uh, I guess we gotta pop this open again, don't we? Hmm. Some decoupling might be necessary. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about that being necessary. Uh, but I feel like in this situation, it probably doesn't matter. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised because I think everything's in there. It would suck if... Uh, if it's literally just due to wires routing the length of them or, you know, something in that territory. Um, so I'd prefer for it to just be a very concrete problem. But we can also grab the O-scope. It could also be that the, like, some pins haven't made contact there. Um, which I've seen before, basically, like, with the socket, sometimes the pins don't line up perfectly, and if the pins don't line up perfectly, then they don't make contact with the chip, even though there's power there, so we're gonna do, uh, let's see here, oh, power cable's on that side now, um, let's just see what we can look at. skimmed on voltage any or any extra voltage drop kills it yeah i mean i wouldn't really expect there to be much voltage drop here so i'm going to try to basically expose things um okay i know you can't see anything in here i am mainly doing an inspection to just see, make sure everything is indeed making contact. 
Um, so we're going to do a continuity test with ground. Basically going to make sure that none of these pins got shorted to ground, which is actually the problem that we made yesterday, where we had um, basically one of the pins was shorted to ground. Okay. Come on. That should be flat ground. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So I'm going to check. the wire ordering, but I was pretty careful about that. So we can pull this out a little bit. Um, Actually, like, kind of hard to see where these wires go. I know you can't see much here, unfortunately. Um, I'm really curious if it's the socket and the connection to the chip, just not having, um, it's totally possible that the, uh, chip just doesn't, um, okay. It's possible in my opinion that the chip, um, is just not making contact due to more solder being on some pins than others. Oh, there, it's on. Yeah, so I haven't changed anything, right? Um, but I did fiddle with that chip a little bit, and I think it just wasn't socketed. So I think that did actually work first try. Unless closing this or stuffing in these wires breaks it. <laughs> like, maybe the, maybe the wires being pushed in caused them to, like... <laughs> Basically, like maybe I just had the wires push in a weird spot where the, the magnetism on them just fucked them. So we're turning it off. And then I'm just going to hold it where it's actually going to sit. Make sure that we can power it on. But yeah, that did just... It did just work. We didn't actually do anything on the inside there. Okay, here we go. Yep, good. Okay, so we're shutting that down. Uh, we'll just screw everything back in. But yeah, I'm I'm guessing that the chip just wasn't socketed perfectly. I resocketed it a little bit. Just fiddled around with it. I've had. I have, seriously, I've had that problem when I have tried to read the chips with my programmer, uh, where basically it just doesn't, the first time you try to read it, it just doesn't read. Uh, and that's usually just a sign that uh, it's just not socketed. Some of the leads just aren't making connections. So, yeah, I think that actually did work first try. Um, I, I, will take, I will take first try for that. I think that's fair given we didn't actually re-solder anything or fix anything up. Um, all right, good. Okay, I grabbed, all right. Um, 
So, I think maybe it's YOLO, but I think it's time to glue that on there. So, we'll do the honors. Chat, now is the time. We'll get you some lighting. Is that too much lighting? Let me just change where the uh, white balance is. Okay. So now we play the game of is this super glue dried up? Not 100% sure. I'm gonna see. No! Wow! It came out. I didn't even have to fucking clean up the tip. Wow! Color me impressed. Alright, um. So I guess we're just gonna put the printer. Like this. This way we can make sure that we hopefully get the best contact. And then make sure everything is kind of aligned in there. That looks pretty good. Um, I might just score a tiny mark just so we know where this actually ends up sitting. I'm just going to put a mark there. Mark there. Mark there. And a mark there. So that should basically show me the boundaries of where um, I need to put glue. Okay. And I think we'll just probably just go mainly around the hole. We're gonna try to be light on glue here. I actually pretty much never glue things. Um, I normally don't really trust glue. So I can't say I'm honestly very good at gluing things. That looks good. It's not all too much, but we're trying to go light. And then let's just bop it in there. Make sure my fingers aren't in glue. I'm trying to put as much pressure as I can. I don't know if super glue is pressure activated or not, because that is I don't even know if that's making contact. Unless I was just too slow. But uh, that's like not even making contact. I expected that to get kind of squished down there. But there's a chance that... Um, yeah, we'll see. I'm just holding it down. Kind of hurts. But I don't know if it's actually making contact. Uh, I just need like a poking tool just to apply pressure. Yeah. Um, does super glue just not work on PCBs? Or does it just take a lot longer? 
then I'm giving it. You have hot glue? I do have hot glue. I'm just trying to avoid it because, like you say, a bit messy. Flex may not be all off. Yeah. It looks pretty good. It does seem like it's making progress. I think it just isn't instantaneous. Um, I would clamp it if I had, uh, if I had anything I could clamp it to. It's like kind of sticking on some sides. I don't know if I just need to give it a little bit more glue. Let's see. There's a small lip in here. And maybe... I can get leverage off of it. I think that's putting too much uh, force on it to the side. Yeah. Like it's still uh, pretty liquid. I think maybe it's just not dry yet. I don't know. I can try and put a little bit more on there. Put a heavy book on top. Yeah, gra uh, gravity does work. Thank you. That um, that wasn't sarcastic. That was literally like, I didn't even think about that. So we're going to put a little bit more glue in. Just to add to the fun. Clean the tip, because that is a disaster. Um, and then I just need something to set on it. So we have to line it up. So I want it to be flush, or I want it to be level. I'm like definitely overthinking it, but uh, you know, I appreciate nice things. I think that's kind of sticking. I want a little bit more mass, just because it's spring dampened. Why are these books all so light? Okay. And I think it's relatively level. I want to move the mass a little bit more this way. I'm just trying to adjust the mass to be uh, a little bit more equally distributed. And then we'll find the cap for our super glue. There it is. OK. 
Okay. And that looks, that looks decent in there. I don't know how long I should give it to cure. I don't know, maybe 15 minutes. I guess I can just start cleaning up my desk. Chat, how have you been? Hope you have enjoyed fiddling around with uh, a very limited lab. Definitely ran into some constraints here, largely around just not having the right tools for the job. But that's fine. All right, um, files, those came in handy. I think we used most of the stuff I actually took out. Took out files, small files, large files, and I think we ended up using kind of everything. It's pretty good, in my opinion. These files I actually really liked. They performed quite well. Bach, Baco files. I remember reading a little bit on them being good. All right. I'm going to try to put these things away. Um, Okay. Oh, what a mess. Actually a mess. Do you think that glue's gonna set, chat? Is it gonna work? Let's see. Okay, soldering iron is cooled down. That is good. Um, Okay. 
in before after all of that, the glue doesn't fucking set. And that's the hardest part of the night, is gluing it. Um, all right. One second, vacuuming up. we go. Clean. Do you think it's been long enough, chat? I think we did it. So, does the chair have rollerblade caster wheels? Yeah, of course. What the fuck else would you use? What kind of, what kind of peasant uses normal wheels? Do you think it's time or do we just wait extra long? Because I feel like it's going to suck if I take it off and we have to go through this again. Like, maybe it just doesn't make too much contact. I don't know. I feel like it should be, for the most part, making contact. Go jumping around on a couple Xenotic maps. Sounds good to me. So, sounds, sounds good to me. I can, I can do that. Sounds fucking easy, dude. Because I really don't want to use hot glue, because hot glue looks like shit. A stream watching the glue set. Yeah, that's what you get. I know you want that angle. It's a good angle. Gonna beat some records. No, I've been sucking at this recently. To be honest, haven't been playing too well, but I also haven't been trying too hard. Hope my audio hasn't been too quiet that whole time. I had it on like a little bit higher than usual gain, but not super, super high. But I was pretty close to it, I think. Use double-sided tape. Technically, I do have double-sided tape, but I hate using tape. I was actually, like, when I was laying in bed last night, I was thinking about if there was a, a good way for me to uh, basically screw it in. 
what I was thinking is basically take a, uh, take like a pin and put it, like drill a tiny, like super tiny hole through the, um, you know, through whatever I actually ended up mounting and then uh, put a pin through it so that it can't fall in. And in theory, I could put a pin on both sides, but I don't really care if it falls out. I just care if it falls in. So luckily, with the design that we ended up going with, uh, falling in is not an issue because obviously that hole is tiny. So I guess now the concern is falling out. Oh, jeez. This is a 34 second map. What a long map, dude. God damn. Nice. Nice. Now I'm getting antsy though. I'm fucking stoked, dude. I hope that glue sets and holds. I think 15 minutes is reasonable. We've definitely been like eight or nine minutes by now. So we'll just play this map for seven minutes until the uh, timer runs out for this map. And then that, that'll be it. I do have a hot glue gun. It is absolute trash. It's a terrible hot glue gun. Uh, but uh, we could make it work. I just hate hot glue. I, like, I, I know a lot of people who, like, swear by hot glue. But in my opinion, hot glue doesn't really bond ever. It just, it just feels like the hot glue just peels off. Apparently the good guns with thick sticks work much better. I'll have to get the one that Adam Savage recommends. He has a hot glue gun he swears by. And I feel like I trust his fucking word. He's definitely... He's used a stick or two of hot glue in his, in his life. Jeez. Already a second behind. Oh, I have speed. Oh, I didn't realize he got speed partway through the map. High glue is just fast. You can use it without gloves and without having acetone. That's fair. I don't know. Maybe I maybe I just don't trust hot glue for a, a bad reason. Maybe it's maybe hot glue is actually good. But I have always viewed hot glue as kind of kind of F tier bonding material. Oh, damn. Oh, that dude's like setting good times. Oh, this is a new map. Yeah, this is a new map. Someone who purchases $3 glue guns from AliExpress, I share that sentiment. I drenched some of my electronics in it so they can be uh, outside. I think that's actually fair. I think hot glue does a decent job due to its springiness. I think hot glue is decent. Like if I wanted to cake the back of that thing in hot glue, like the wires, it would just, it acts a little bit as a, um, like basically something to take some of the strain off, like a strain relief for wires. Just due to the rubbery properties of it. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully this comes out just fine. Got four minutes until we're gonna check on it. It does look like it's flush. Uh, it does look like the, the board is flush with the plastic. So I'm hoping. It does its thing. And I'm not really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna resist the urge to test how strong the bond is because it will probably just continue bonding. If it's just on there slightly, as long as I can take the books off and kind of use it, uh, I, I want to see how strong it is, but I also should probably wait and just let it keep keep kind of uh, doing its thing over the next few hours by just uh, being delicate with it, letting it kind of set. But yeah, I don't know how long it takes for super glue to set. 
I don't even know if that's, uh, I think it's cyanoacrylate is the super glue, which I think is the standard, uh, standard super glue. And what is it? It's plastic to fiberglass. And I don't know what PCBs are coated in, but I don't think fiberglass is supposed to, I missed a checkpoint. Uh, but I don't think fiberglass is supposed to have like a sheen to it like it has. So there's definitely some coating on top. <laughs> the coating that we fucking burned. Or, I guess, what I think happened, I think the reason that board burned is I think the, um, like, I don't really get why, but it felt like the, uh, like, whatever clear coat is on that fiberglass, it felt like it shrank, which then caused it to rip, and then that exposed, like, the raw fiberglass underneath, which started to burn. But I, I've never seen that before. I mean, we used, we used the hot air gun on the same temperature for a longer time on the printer board, right? The sa that we had the same exact settings, and on one board, it started fucking melting through the first layer and burning the board after, like, a couple seconds, and on the printer, it didn't give a shit how long we had it on there. Like... It's fucking strange. Like, maybe it's my fault, but the solder... The solder didn't even start to melt. It didn't even remotely start to melt. So I guess maybe from now on, like maybe from now on, I'm just gonna uh, use some pretty heavily leaded solder uh, and just throw that onto uh, existing solder. And I guess that'll mix in the solder and then hopefully that will lower the melting point for it. And then I can come in with the hot air gun and try and be a little bit cooler. Missed out on a 1660. 1660s are great cards. I think that's what my friend got. Their their graphics card just like fucking conked out. And then uh, they went to like Best Buy and picked up a 1660 or something. Maybe the ground plane can conduct the heat away. Oh yeah. Yeah, this board is definitely, the one I have is definitely a one layer board. And it's actually a pretty thick board, to be honest. Um, and there's no, yeah, like, it's not even that there isn't a ground plane. There isn't even like a ground fill, right? The board is empty. There's nothing on the board except for the, the traces between the pins. Uh, whereas most boards, even if they don't have a ground plane, often will still have, uh, like, a ground fill, uh, which is still, you know, something. So, yeah, that could be it. Time is up, Shirley. Yeah, I, I guess it is, isn't it? Because that added 10 minutes. All right, chat. What do you think? What do you think? When I lift these books off, is it just going to pop right out? I'm going to lift one book off first. Okay, one, one other book. Okay, now let's see how good our aim was. Pretty good, pretty good. It's, I'm not gonna put too much weight on there, but I can definitely press down on this. And that looks acceptable. It's not really... Nothing seems off. It seems... It seems like it's in there. I think it's a, a wee bit crooked. Um, maybe a, a millimeter over the, the length of it. Actually, probably half a millimeter. I'm not happy about that. That's poor craftsmanship. Unusable. But that seems pretty good. So let's... Uh, Let's see if the let's see if the printer boots. There you go. All right. I might have to re uh, recenter it as well, but there's the there's the shot. 
<laughs> There's the beautiful chip. What a, what a work of art. Now it probably won't fit in the box anymore. Powering on? Okay. Works just fine. We have a, we have a fully functional printer. <laughs> Operating, that's where the code is, right there. That, my friends, is a, is a great place to store your code. Every, everyone needs one of those. <laughs> everyone needs one of those. <laughs> But yeah, it looks like, yeah, it looks like the uh, PCB isn't perfectly flat. Um, but I do see a decent amount of glue kind of through a crack. I can kind of see a decent amount of glue on there. So I'm pretty happy with that. So let's, uh, let's get in there for a, for a shot. Yeah, it's a little crooked and it's pissing me off. Damn it. <laughs> we waited for glue to dry. Oh yeah. Is that is that the most boring thing that was streamed today on Twitch? Because we we literally we literally live streamed waiting for glue to dry. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Um yeah. So that's uh that's a thing that we did. Um, <laughs> cheapest 1060 is 373 CAD. What is that, like $8? Ha! Ha! Canadian fake money, fake news, fake currency. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get a photo of this. Bink. And then we'll take one in uh, landscape mode. Bink. All right. Okay. So we'll, uh, which one was better? I think that I think that had an artistic flair on it. That was a that was a good photo. Uh, it's weird having my legs on camera. That's kind of that's kind of fucking creepy. You weirdos. You weirdos. Um. So now we can tweet that, and we can say, uh, uh, wow. I. This. Is. My new favorite printer. It has a special socket for easy firmware updates. Cool design. Exclamation point. Um. Uh. Yeah. I think. I think that's. Uh, I think that's a good tweet. That's a good tweet. Sending it. <laughs> uh. Let me see if I can. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a little fucking crooked. God damn it. <laughs> What's funny is it, it does not, honestly, I think we did a good enough job that it looks not necessarily like a Photoshop, but just look like we just randomly glued something onto the printer as a meme. But it's a that's actually where the code lives. <laughs> it's actually where the code for the printer runs. <laughs> Opsec failed, got the serial number. Oh no! 
You, what might you possibly do? <laughs> My OPSEC. Your printer is now registered. Oh no! You might get warranty. <laughs> Registering for the expired warranty. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think they make this printer anymore. <laughs> oh, that's good. Void that warranty. <laughs> All right, chat. Um, let's. Uh, I guess we can turn that off. Cut down on some background noise. Um, I guess this printer now makes more sense to be facing me than to like. It makes more sense for this chip to be in my direction, which is kind of weird. And then I'm gonna try to uh, set up a new uh, camera, a new streaming camera setup position thing for streaming camera positioning. Uh, maybe we just put the camera on top of the printer. Mm, it's not, the printer's not big enough, sadly. Otherwise you're gonna get this angle, which is a little, a little artistic. Um, and I can't quite clear the printer. So what I could do is I could move the printer and you know what chat? I don't know why you're being so rude and suggesting, oh, just move the printer. <laughs> Like, yeah, I know. That's that's why I'm that's why I'm moving the printer chat. So rude. Okay. So then the cable barely reaches. Ugh. Fucking scuffed. Now this camera feels like too close to my face. But printer cable I guess we can get under I want to make sure it doesn't snag that um, good I'll put this on top uh-huh uh-huh look at that um let me see what the framing is like there it's not, it's not the best. I, I do like the side angle a bit. But this might be too side angle. Um. Alright. Eh, it's acceptable. I'm not happy about it, but it'll, it'll do the trick. Let's just make sure we get the focus right. I can actually reach the camera, which is kind of funny. Let me, uh. I can even change where it focuses. Look at that. All right. I don't need the focus flute. That's the that's the main issue with that camera positioning. But I don't need a focus flute. How do you live without a focus flute? All right. Um I I think that's okay. Not too bad. All right, so we're going to, um, I guess I can now listen to music. It's actually pretty nice. That camera quality isn't terrible, but the new camera is gonna be where it's at. All right, I'm gonna refill my water, be right back. All right, so uh, what we need to do now is uh, something with that firmware. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with some boring stuff. Um, um, can you change the brightness metering on this camera? I think I can, but it, it, it can be fucky with this setup. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not super worried about it. I think it looks okay. 
It's not perfect. So it should be. Yeah, so I guess I need to figure out where I am, but it should be metering on basically I can set the square. Um, I think it's better to have it end up on the black screen than on the white screen because it was ending up on the white screen. So this should be better. It shouldn't be changing. If I'm out of frame, if I'm out of frame, kind of, then it will focus. The, the square is right here. Um, and since the square is right there, it lands on the black screen. So we'll uh, kind of fail open instead of fail dark. So that should be better. Sorry, I didn't realize that was uh, the case. Um, okay, uh, so what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna go and grab, we're gonna try and get uh, Windows 10 working with this thing. So I, I, I know I used Windows 10 like a year ago when I got this flashing device, but uh, I just want to have support for the like guest tools and stuff um, And without those guest tools, it just kind of sucks So we're gonna go and grab Windows 10 and hopefully we can make that work. I'm gonna try hmm. um, Do have a lot of monitors? Hell yeah. You gotta, you gotta lure in those viewers somehow, you know? All right, one second. Uh... Okay, um, trying to figure out why Visual Studio downloads are like fucked right now, but I think I got it. Um, what do we want? Windows 10 Consumer Editions? Yeah. Let's just go with the, we're gonna go with the most like basic setup of Windows 10. Hopefully that has the highest chance of success. It's the NAND that's a pain in the ass. Oh yeah, I, I've done some NAND. Definitely. I, I, I don't mind the serial 8-pin setup. A little bit better. Oh, uh, God, that scotch, dude. Fuck. Fuck, that's Petey. Holy shit. I like it, though. It has a great aftertaste, but goddamn on the tongue, it's a bit strong. Isn't there a VM image that you can download? Yeah, those things fucking suck, though. Uh, the VM images take longer to install than the ISOs. Um, forty gigs is often not enough. To be honest, I could maybe just use my parse VM. I don't know. This software is pretty sketch. We'll just say this is um, uh, Flash Programmer. Okay, customize. We're gonna add a CD drive. Might as well show you what we're seeing. Not that it really matters here. Uh, CD-ROM. We'll uh, attach vert.io. Okay. 
Um, then we're going to set everything to vert IO. The more vert IO, the better. Can you do vert IO on that? No, you can't. Um, mainly all that matters is that we want... Uh, Oh, that's adding this. Okay. Sata. Vert IO for the disk. Wait, did I not add that CD ROM? What the fuck? Yeah, I, I got confused. I didn't know which window was which. There we go. Uh, vert IO on that, and then Vert IO on the NIC. And that's really all that matters, is just Vert IO on those two. Good. I've had issues like switching over Windows caches your disk information too too thoroughly. Uh, that it's kind of hard. Um, uh, ah, fuck it. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna activate. Uh. Just because it's easy. Takes no effort. Um, key. Okay. Come on. Okay, uh, we should be good. Um, load driver, browse, vert IO. Uh, I guess we have to like kind of point it in the right direction. We'll just say Windows 10, here you go. Um, SCSI controller. Highly recommend setting up vert IO during the install process because switching to vert IO after you have installed Windows is a pain in the ass. And then not using vert IO uh, just leads to lower performance, especially for things like disk and network. I always have issues setting up a Windows VM with vert IO drivers. Oh, yeah, just make sure you have the disk. Make sure you have the disk connected with a s standard like SATA controller. Uh, that way it works, you know, by default out of the box. And then just hit load driver, go into the correct folder, AMD64 Win 10 for Win 10. It'll just find the driver and you're good. Um, I've never had it fail, to be honest. Does Microsoft give you free keys? Yeah. But I've always had, like, not free Microsoft keys, but I've always had a Visual Studio subscription, even uh, individually. Um... Like, if I leave Microsoft, I will literally just buy it, pay the, like, one or two grand a year uh, just so I can, you know, get Windows licenses and keys and Visual Studio and all that shit for uh, basically zero effort. Installing Windows 10. What have we done? We've watched glue dry. And now that's getting even more dry. It's going to be so damn dry. Is it possible to modify VM settings on Vert Manager after creation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's not hard at all. But Windows will blue screen when you boot it. Um, you base it, It's very difficult to change your disk on Windows. Um, it's very difficult because Windows basically caches the driver that should be used for your disk. And uh, there's, like, registry keys you can delete to try and make it work. There's, like, things you can do to try and make it work. But it's, it's a lot of times some of the options don't work correctly. It's just don't fucking do it. TL, TLDR, just don't fucking do it. Uh, just make sure you just stick with this same disk controller that you have. It's not like Linux where it just auto detects on boot for some reason windows needs to save one millisecond to fingerprint the disk on boot it can't fucking automatically dynamically fingerprint it like linux does like even though linux boots 10 times faster than windows i don't understand it's so stupid it's such a fucking stupid idea Um, 
What did I miss? Oh, we watched uh, we watched Glue Dry. <laughs> it was good. We watched some Glue Dry. We we glued on uh, we glued on uh, a PCB to a printer <laughs> at the end, and then waited for it to dry. <laughs> it was great. Super good content. Um, other than that, we just we got everything working, but everything kind of worked out of the box. We we took it slow. Yeah, limited setup. Why? Why would I? Why would I want to do any of these things? Mhm. Mm nope. Nope. <laughs> Just click next. Yup. What programmer do we have here? TL8662 Plus! The 2 Plus version. Yeah. We got the we got the big boy flashing programmer here. Why not read the privacy po oh I did. I, I skimmed it. I, sk I skimmed it. You can use Mini Pro on Linux for that? Really? Really? Is that true? I've never even looked. What 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 is what is this? It just doesn't support NAND. Yeah, we'll just use this. I I like I like the interface. It's on GitLab. Yeah, I only use GitHub. Sorry, I, I don't use GitLab. Too too complex for me. Searching for a display driver? Well, I can find you one. It's gonna be right here. Oh, fuck. I think this is the one I want to use. Install it all. Oh, that's why the install was so easy, because I didn't have networking. Nice. Okay, we don't need the CD. We don't need this. Uh, just nick and disk. Come on. All right. Um, do I need to say per VM? Auto resize, yeah. Okay, sweet. Nice, and we have 144. Even though you can't see that, but to me, I see 144 hertz, which is nice. Uh, Let's just grab this, uh, TL8662+. plus. We technically have it on the host, but we don't really care. Oh, yeah. It, we're just going to go to the URL on here. www.xgecu.com. .cm. Sick. Uh, download. New design programmer for the this, yep. Yep. Except the download from there takes forever. No, they improved it. They actually made it better. It was bad, but it's actually good now that they're using Baidupan. Yeah, look at this. Look at this speed. Look at that speed. Done. Done. Already done. 
Okay. Uh... Whoa, 32 bit. God, this censored version of this song sucks. Oh, yep, it tries to go to the D folder first. I find that so funny. There we go. Boom, USB driver install. Yes, I trust that. I trust that with my life, dude. Okay, and then it's gonna want an update. What do we got, the two plus? Yeah, nice. Um, nice. Plug that in. Okay, that should be redirected. Um, device, okay, it recognized it. Self-check. Noise, noise. That looks fucking great, dude. Uh, let's uh, let's delete the old VM. Um, this VM can go. Delete. Okay. Um, sweet. So, um, let's. Uh, this is where it's really tough that we don't know whether or not flashing fails. Or sorry, we don't know. Um, we don't know if we broke the firmware or if we just need to like resocket it, <laughs> since it's not a hundred percent confidence that it works when we socket it in here. So I think I turned off the printer. Well, nope. Okay, so shutting down the printer and uh, basically what we're gonna do is look for uh, checksums. Um, and then basically what we want to do is find something that we know that we control. In fact, we're going to boot the printer up again. And basically I'm going to look for a string on the printer in the menu or something. Uh, okay. Okay, so I see a copy, copy menu, special copy. I don't know how well that's coming through. But anyways, I just took a picture of kind of a random screen. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go through a couple more menu options, try to find something that looks uh, pretty unique. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just try to change the text. And that's going to be our first patch. That's going to be an oracle that we understand how to actually... Uh, you know, patch it. So I'm gonna shut that down. I gotta go find uh, another uh, socket for the programmer. Um. I don't know if this is the right size, but, um, so I found, uh, one that I actually haven't used. And it like, I don't know if that's going to clear that uh, bracket to be honest. Get in there, you fuck. Oh, unless it's supposed to go this way. Yep, it is. Weird. Um, then let's hope the pitch is correct on this. I don't know if it is. It looks... This is actually a different one than... I should have a copy of the one that I put on the printer itself. Um, 
Yeah, that's definitely a different one. Okay. I think that's the right one. Okay. I like need to clear off some of the flux on here because you can't, it's hard to find the um, pin zero index on it. Get in there, you fuck. I think we're gonna get really good at that really fast. Um, okay. Um, this is a uh, W25Q128FV SOIC8. This. Okay, and what we should be able to do Oh yeah, oh we did a system self check. I was wondering if I remembered to do that or not. Um read ID. Okay, cool. Read. Looks good. Looks like we're reading it. There we go. That was the fastest we've ever gotten firmware out of the printer. And then we'll just go in there and uh, probably hex edit something. I think that's going to be the plan. Save. All right, chat, what's your favorite hex editor for Windows? And I'm curious if this uh, checksum is going to match what we saved the other day. Nope, it has changed, but that's not too surprising. Just uh, things have probably changed on the printer a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do is it should, for the most part, be the same. I M O in my opinion. So this is the large decompressed area. So I'm going to look at that image and I saw an enlarge slash reduce. Um, guess we can just grab strings. Oh, we already have strings open. Um, enlarge, reduce. There we go. 
Unicode. UTF-16 Unicode. Uh, and we have Xrefs. So this is the only occurrence of this string. It's the only occurrence of the string, and it is exactly what I see on the screen. So uh, I think basically our goal is going to be to change that. Oh, yeah. Uh... Let's see, I'm gonna change up my music here. Um, boop. <laughs> change enlarged to biggin. It does look like it's null terminated, so that should be relatively easy. I was kind of curious if I would have to go and track down a, um, uh, whatever it's called, you know, where you have stuff and things. A length, a length? Yeah, a length. Um. Um, okay, so um, what we need to do is basically figure out, A, how to decompress and how to compress this. Um, we know how to, um, we know how to decompress it, but we don't know how to compress it. Um, and we also need to figure out if there's a checksum. We also need to figure out if this is actually the stuff being used. So, since we know how to decompress it, I think one of the first things I'm going to look for is basically whether there's a checksum. Um, so we know that th that code happens, if we look at our notes. Um, the decompression for this uh, can be found here. So the decompression code that we are curious about can be found here. Uh, yep, that lines up. And basically, it just decompresses it. Are there other xrefs to this code? Uh, basically, I'm not seeing any reason to believe that that is actually being checksum. So we're going to take a look at xrefs to that. Cam is already decompiled code. Yeah, that's fine. Um, load. Yeah, it doesn't actually look like it is verifying anything on it. Um, unless it actually goes through, this is coprocessor stuff, but I think that's just, an, I think that's just ca flushing caches. I actually don't think they check some this. They check some that other region, which is interesting, uh, but I don't think they're actually, uh, check summing this. Okay. Um, cause we know a checksum occurs on some other stuff. Let's take a look at where that checksum goes through. Check some here. Yeah. Um, huh. So the thing that's actually a little concerning about this um, is... Um, well, that does a right volatile. Okay, I think it just infinitely loops if it's not equal to zero. So yeah, I'm not seeing anything around that decompression code. So I actually don't think there's a checksum. So what I would like to do is basically figure out if this, since the decompression quality is quite low, or the compression quality is quite low, I'm hoping that I can find the string, the enlarged string. Uh, um, I need to find a null character. Here we go. Let's grab one of these. Uh, oh, come on. Let me select that. 
Is that literally that, though? Yeah, I think it is. How do I do a null? Let me put the decompression code. I don't know if I have. Um... V, control two. Damn. Okay, we might have to implement the compression. Um, and that code's relatively straightforward. So you're gonna, I don't know. Um, is it the same decompression for both? Yeah, I think it is literally the same code. Okay, uh, let's take a look at it. So, uh, we set up a pointer. Pram1 is the pointer to the compressed data. Uh, we read it. We then advance the pointer. Um... Then we end with three to get the bottom bits. If it's equal to zero, then we read the next byte, and then we advance the pointer in pbvar two by one. Um, I'm pretty sure it's probably just doing a um, Run length encoding. Like, that's what I think it's doing. But I have to be careful here. How can you understand this awful C code? Oh, yeah, it's great, dude. This is some of the best C code I've seen in my life. Um, okay, so... Deref that, then we get the next byte, and we put that in uvar6, which basically shadows it. Uh, so I guess if the bottom two bits, I wonder if it this then is of larger length, maybe? uvar4, uvar6. Um, then pbvar2, so that's just basically the pointer. I'm pretty sure, what's uvar4? Shift by 4, so it's getting the top Getting the top four bits, if that's equal to zero, then it reads the next byte. Then it basically loops for uvar6, which is either the bottom two bits, or if the bottom two bits are zero, uh, then it reads another byte. So I'm guessing the bottom two bits, if it's zero, it's a special encoding. Mean It means there is another byte, which is the length, which is a full byte. Otherwise, it is a one, two, or a three, which indicates the number of bytes, uh, I guess, to read. So it, it's the... Here's my guess. My guess is the bottom bits are indicating the number of bytes to copy verbatim, and then the top four bits are the number of bytes to repeat or something. I don't know. Oh, is that a... Um... um... Cause that's just a copy, right? Pram two is the output buffer. 
So it's basically updating the output, right? So for those bytes, we this is just literally a mem copy right here. It's a mem copy for uvar six bytes. Um, however, then after that happens, pram one is pbvar two. So we rewind. No, we update. Okay. Because we weren't using param1. So pvvar2, we just update param1. Then if uvar7 is not equal to 0, if it is equal to 0, then it, basically it's not compressed. It's just got that like prefixed information. Um, if uvar7, if the top four bits... Oh, it reads it again. Oh, same same thing. Basically, uh, if the top bits are zero, then it's a byte. Um, then, pvvar2 plus one. So advance a byte. pbvar2 plus 1. Why is that skipping a byte? That's kind of weird. Does the arm have an instruction like move sb? It does not. Um, That looks like it's skipping a byte, but whatever. Then we take uvar4, which was like the original byte. And that is, um, that is zero extending it. This is zero extending a, I guess if it's shifting by one E. A, hmm. Shift by one C, shift right by one E. Basically zero extending, checking if value is three. Um, then we read that, we read param one. Oh, so then we read the initial byte that we skipped over. Then we go to PV bar plus two. Pram two. So this is what's kind of curious. PB var two. Pram two. Okay, it is not um, RLE. This is. This allows you to encode a sequence that exists earlier. Um, yeah, it, it allows you to basically encode a sequence earlier. So I'm guessing it's up to like 256 bytes or something. Basically you can, uh, uvar six. Um, huh. I see. So this, uh, I don't know how many bits we have here. Uh, just two bits. So two bits times negative 100. So you can go two and then minus PBR two. So you can go up to two FF bytes before you. So basically uh, what this does is this allows you to basically repeat a sequence of bytes that exists um, you can basically reference bytes that happened up to two FF bytes before you in the, and it looks like that is on the compressed data. So you can basically, um, 
You can refer to previous sequences of bytes. Huffman? Yeah, it, it's kind of Huffman-y. I don't, like, Huffman is kind of generic, right? Um, there isn't, it's just LZ. Is this literally just LZ? Really? But which LZ? Yeah, custom LZ. Yeah, Huffman is a dictionary. Now, arguably, right, arguably, this is using a dictionary. The dictionary is just a sliding window, right? Um... Hmm. Is this LZSS? Um. No, I don't think so. LZ1, um, Um. Hmm. Let me see. Let's see if, uh, curious if there is a, uh, let's see. Oops. Crates. And then uh, let's look for LZ. And I'm curious if these implementations of LZ are um, configurable enough that we can use them. Otherwise, we have to do our own. Compression settings. Block size. I think this is for LZ4. We want like LZ77. How big is the firmware uncompressed? It's like two and a half times larger or something. Something in that ballpark. Um, with window size. So that's an encoder. So there's an encoder, but not a decoder. Hmm. 
Using an arithmetic coding step on top of LZ itself, yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if I can basically find an implementation that is generic enough that I can basically specify the window and, and stuff, but I'm not seeing that. Um, okay, well, we're just gonna have to do it ourselves. Um, so, uh, that's fine because we're going to want to do some custom things too. I think what we're going to want to do is basically make sure that our compression algorithm, uh, keeps the data identical size, right? So, um... That's basically going to be the goal here. We're just going to write our own. This is a, a simple enough um, implementation that we should be able to just uh, basically write this in Rust. And then once we have it written in Rust, we can uh, write the compressor for it. Um, now, that being said, it's hard to say if the compressor should be stable. I'm not 100% sure. Um decompress then we have uh, data we'll just do let data is standard FS read and we want um no uh, that is writing so firmware dumps we'll grab the firmware we'll read it and then we will slice it um at two eight one zero 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 until um f e five b twenty bytes read the data so this should be the compressed data um Okay. So um, I think that is the compress size or the decompress size. So whatever. Uh, we're just going to say uh, decompress. Oops. Okay. Decompress. This is going to take uh, data u8 and then this will output a vector of u8. Okay, let me ret is vec new, then loop, um, it's going to probably take us a couple tries to get this, but we're just going to do, um, let's do a loop, make this mute, we'll do this really naive first, uh, let, um, uvar4 does not get overwritten, so we can say, um, I don't know, uh, length info prefix, we'll just say prefix is equal to data zero, and then we'll say data is equal to uh, data one. Okay, so read the prefix bytes. If uh, prefix and three Oh, it actually goes to the next byte. No, it doesn't. It reads the byte again. Okay, so if prefix and three is equal to zero, then um, let me length is prefix and three, something like this. Uh, if length is equal to zero, then 
length is equal to data zero. And then we just do this again. Okay. So this is, I uh, read the length, something like that. Right, so if that byte is equal to zero, then uh, just basically consume. And then next, we want the original prefix. Let me, um, this is going to be like the uh, ref, reference length, which is referring to like previous bytes, is equal to uvar4, which is prefix shift by four. Um, then we can say if ref length is equal to zero, then ref length is equal to data zero uh, and advanced data again. So basically, if it is zero, then it is encoded as the next byte. Uh, pbvar advance pbvar two. Yeah, so we advance past there. Here we advance again. We just reassign, which is kind of weird. Um, and then here we just update past there. And then what we do is uh, while or for blah in zero to uvar six, which is the length, then uh, we just do a mem copy. So I guess we can just say um, uh, ret extend from slice data for length as u size, and then data is equal to data length as u size. Okay, copy the bytes. So that's all that's doing, right? We got a mem copy there. And then param2, that's the output is updated. Okay, so that's like, you know, kind of in the ballpark. Um, 223 here. So that's just going to chug forever. And then next, we want to, um, if uvar7, which is if the ref length is not equal to zero, then... Uh, pbvr2, that's just the current pointer. Uh, we update that kind of for... I guess... Why do we skip a byte there? We're going to have to read pbvr2 unmodified and we do we do it here okay um so we might need to make an like an original we might have to because we have to reference before here uh so we can't keep clobbering data but effectively what we're going to do is um so what is that doing shifting by c and then shifting back by e So it's, it's dividing and zero extending, which is kind of strange. So what, it, what is the net effect of what it's doing here? Um, so if we have all Fs and we shift by one C, um, shift, and then we shift that back by one E, Come on. I don't know how to get back to my uh, hex menu base. Yeah, it, it should just be.
Uvar 6. Oh, can it forward reference? Throwing away the top bits and the bottom two. Yeah, th this is the same as like shift. Um, well, let's see. Uh, Uvar 6. Yeah, it's unsigned int. So this is basically just uh, getting shift by two and with three, right? Should be the same. So this is uh, something is equal to uh, uvar4. And we, yeah. So basically, this, we've accounted for the bottom two bits in that prefix. This p, um, this uvar6, uh, or sorry, uvar4 is the original byte we read. So the bottom two bits are this length. The top four bits are this length. And then we have two bits that are unused, and it's the two bits that we're going to gra grab right here. So all we're going to do is get um, prefix. We're going to shift it by uh, two, and then we're going to end it with three, right? It's the same as what it's doing here. Um, this is just easier on um, erm to just do those shifts in place. OK, then we're going to say if something is equal to three, then. Oh, this is the same thing. Um, Uvar 6. Oh, so you can actually go uh, 256 times 256, which is a big number, right? 256 times 256, whatever that is, uh, 64K. So the window is actually 64K. OK. So this has a slightly different encoding here. But then we just say mute something, and then if something is three, then something is equal to, and this is like um, this is like uh, offset uh, two fifty six or something. Offset two fifty six is going to be equal to data. Hmm. Oh, okay. So this is um, let's offsets um, is equal to data zero. Data is data dot dot oh, one dot dot. So this is get uh, get the byte offsets. Then this is uh, data zero. Um, okay. Um, and then we can, um, let reference is equal to And then we copy for how much? Uvar seven plus one. Okay. And then we just do a copy from PB var two. Yeah, it's just a straight copy. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So we need to basically figure out if we want to switch to like using an offset. And I think I'm going to. Okay. Um. Consume one byte. That's consuming multiple bytes, but we advance multiple bytes. And then this is uh, offsets. 
offset plus equals one. Then a reference. Um, this is going to be offset minus. Ah, oh, fuck. We have offset shadowed here. Uh, we'll just say byte offsets. Offset is equal to byte uh, offset minus offset 256 times 256 plus byte offset. Okay. So we basically subtract that off, right? Param Pram 2. Oh, it is in the decompressed data. It's a reference to the uh, decompressed outputs. That makes a lot more sense, to be honest. Um, so then we can go back to this format. And thus, the reference is just going to be... Um, Uh, this is ret.len minus offset 256 as u size times 256 plus, uh, we'll just do this, um, offset. Okay, and then this is u size. So we get the current length, and then we subtract off whatever there, pbvar2, and then we just copy from that. Um, oh, fuck. We can't really do this in Rust easily. <laughs> uh, zero dot dot ref length plus one. So what is this loop? I have our five, we add one and then we loop. Um, So if that is one, subtract one. So that would loop two times. So we need to do ref length plus two, right? Um. I think it's uh, length plus two, because here you add one to that length, uh, which is this uvar seven. We add one to that, and then we loop uh, while it's greater than negative one. So let's imagine this was zero, add one, so it's one. We loop through here. Um, we subtract one, it's now zero, but we continue looping because negative one is less than that, so we loop again. So it is plus two. Um, okay. Print, uh, decomp is this, and then ret.len. I'm just curious if this is actually chugging. It's not, 38. Offset 256, uvar4. This is uh, uvar6, if it's equal to three, then we read another byte. We advance the pointer. Um, uh, 
What? Sixteen. Yeah, whoa. What? PB var two. I feel like I'm doing that right. Second loop is copy from slice. I, I mean, I can't. Um. God damn it. Um. Hmm. Try running it through this. We're just going to write it ourselves. Let's see, max ref bits 12, max len bits 4, min match bytes. Yeah. How oh, that peaks, interesting. Yeah, we're just, we're just gonna, we're just gonna write it. Um. So what the fuck? I'm really confused. Prime one, we read that. Oops. Plus two. Prime one, read it. Advance. Consume it again. That, like, all of this stuff is super obvious and, and makes pretty clear sense, right? You read a value, you check some thing. If it's a, a special value, then a, a whole nother byte is encoded. Same thing here. Um, shift by two and three. And that's right. That is what that is extracting out. If it's equal to three, PB var two, it's param one. So we read the second byte, and then we read the first byte here, because that we haven't updated that. And then we've set PB var, but that's fine, because we, oh. PB var two. Well, there's no loop here. Pram two. That's the output. Take u var six, which is that. Multiply that by negative two fifty six. So two fifty six minus that, and then add that up. And that's what we're doing. I'm confused there. Okay. Let's do, um, let's 
And then I'm going to printf here. Um, pram1, pram2. Sorry, that's not what I want. I want uh, dref pb var2. And then I want the u var6. I get a four zero. And let me pr print in here. I guess I don't have a print in here. Uh, print first copy this length. First copy this u var six. Okay, so we should have a first copy five, and then we want a four zero. Nude tuber twenty seven noob nude noob tuber twenty seven. Thank you so much for the two months of support. Hell yeah. Um. How good of a hack was Hots his best? I have no idea. He mainly seemed to focus more on CTF things, which is a different problem set, but I would say very good. Like, a lot of the work he did was more, like, CTF-y oriented. Um, obviously, he's done some pretty legendary uh, exploits, and uh, I don't know if he actually found the bugs or not, to be honest. Um, but extremely good. And still really good. He's just a smart dude. Like, just in general, he's a smart dude. 4 0. So, why are we getting a 16 there? So, we want first copy 5 and then 4 0. And we're getting a 16. Um. While that is not equal to zero, subtract one and then check. So that's going to loop five times, right? No. That's length minus one. Huh? Okay, uh, sweet. That makes, uh, that makes more sense, in my opinion, uh, because that allows you to encode if you... Basically, if you set zero here, that means you have another byte. So a one here actually encodes that you have zero bytes. What language is this? This is Rust. So that makes sense, and then we just chug. Um... Okay, so this is what we want. Um, I guess I want that first copy and then this decomp, get rid of that. Okay, so these should have basically equivalent outputs. 5, 4, 0, 6, 12, 0, 1, 4, 0, 14, 8, 0, 2, and then it's going to probably continue on past then. Okay. Uh, attempt to add with overflow. That makes sense. Eventually, we will just get to the end. Let's see what the last line is in this. Oh, uh, on 42. Um, yeah. There we go. Okay, that's going to run for a, a hot minute. So what we'll do is we will say um, this terminates on a specific decompressed size. So we'll say if ret.len is equal to this, then break. Ret. 
Cool. And that made it all the way to the end. And so what we can do is a uh, standard FS write test.bin decompress. Here we go. Um, MD5. Uh, we'll just do a SHA 256 sum on test.bin. And then over here, we can do a SHA 256 sum on decompressed large dot bin and they are different okay um let's see when they differ okay pretty quickly they differ maybe it's not plus two there but i I feel like it is. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this loop by basically making that not uh, write those updates. And this is just going to be a quick test. Oh, wow, that's seg faults. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, it doesn't make it to the end. Okay, that makes sense. Um, let me get rid of this print. Decompress large. SHA 250, uh, decompressed large. So I think ultimately I have some issue. Is it this? Like, I don't think so. I feel like I'm doing that right. Yeah, I feel like I am doing that right. Two eighty one. Hmm. And they differ pretty much right away. We know that it's one, two, three, four, four bytes at the start. And then we should have one X and we get a lot more X's than we should have. Let's make sure we're doing that right. U var five. Yep. U var eight. Um, ooh. so, if that is equal to zero, then we consume another byte from data. Okay. Offset, offset 256, and ref len length. Same thing here, printf uh, pb var 3, u var 7, and i var 6. Okay, cargo run head. Oh, those are negative. U var five, what is that? Oh, technically we're looking at the wrong one. Not that it matters, I think it is the exact same algorithm. Um, Yeah, I think it I think it is the same algo. Um you are 5. So that int cast is curious. 
It is uvar5 is a uint. They cast it to an int. Shift 4. U over 5 is an int. U over 8. Oh, I'm printing the wrong thing. U over 8. Okay. Um, and I got to add it to this one. This is the right one. Oops. So this is actually uvar 7 this time. And then this is uvar 6. So that's giving me a 0, 0, 14. Oh, that's pvvar 2. OK, all those things were shifted. Um, And you want to do it pre index too. Uh, okay, 4014, 1201, 402, 801, 1201, 1201, 801, 1204, 3602. Okay, so those line up and you don't see them, but they're off screen. Um, so given all those things match, then it really comes down to this loop. Did I really just. U bar 7, what's the type? U int. We add 1 to U bar 7, which is a U int. Okay, and then I var five, which is an int. Is that not plus two? Am I crazy? Is it just this? No. I'm so fucking confused. Um, woo. Let's just actually print the loop iterations. N50. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen iterations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Yeah, it is plus two, so I was right about that. Um Um, pram2 is the output, and that's just getting advanced. I'm so confused. Hmm. What dumbass thing am I missing? One, two, three, four, and then we repeat this 16 times. Oh, I'm an idiot. Sick. Um, test.bin. Identical match. Okay, sweet. So, um, we understand the algorithm. So, it's pretty simple. Basically, um, the first byte uh, contains um, basically a uh, reference length 
for four bits. Um, then we have a, um, this is ref offsets 256, which is two bits. And then we have a, um, length two. And then if length is, uh, zero, um, if length is zero, um, grab the next byte. I, I like, that's really just the encoding, right? This prefix byte. That's the encoding of the prefix byte, right? Ref length comes from the top of there. The offset 256 comes from that, uh, these two bits, and it's multiplied by 256. If it's equal to three, then it reads another byte. Um, hmm. How hard is it for me to put nops in here? What is a nop? Um, length one is a knob, correct? Well, um, well, technically, it decompresses for a fixed length. It, it basically it decompresses until the decompressed data reaches a length. So our compression algo doesn't really matter because there's actually no bounds check on the there's no bounds check on the source data. The only bound is that um Basically, the, the bound is that, uh, that's the length. This is the destination, the length of the decompressed data, and this is the start. And we know that, when is the next payload? 281. Two eighty one. And then it's empty until C81. Oh, that's not a coincidence. Okay, so what is that? Uh, so... Um... Damn, uh, I don't know how to get back to the main menu on this calculator. I'm trying to find it right now. Base hex. Um. Hmm. Damn it. Where is it? Well, I got it back, but I, I don't know how. Um, anyways, so, um, basically, uh, C81000, I didn't even see that before, 281000, not that is not a coincidence that it is exactly 81 and 81. So we this is definitely the region. So 281 to C81, uh, which is uh, 10 megabytes, right? Um, is that exactly 10 megs? Yes, it is exactly 10 megabytes. So we have how much compressed data? Like not that much. We 
We also still, there is like a gzip section, right? There's a gzip section and another RLE encoded thing. We might be doing all of this and we might be encoding the wrong thing. We might be looking at the wrong fucking data. <laughs> so, you know. But anyways, the compressed data uh, is like 16 megs. LSL, a little bit more than 16 megs, right? So this is the size of the decompressed data. So we need to hit a compression ratio of like 70%, right? Which isn't too bad. So all we need to do is make sure that we can round trip our data. So compress um, data, u8, vec u8. Um, so, how do we nop this? Uh, ref length, if the ref length is zero, that's the special encoding. So do we always reference something? That's what I find interesting about this. Um, basically, if that is zero, then we get the next byte. But if it's one, then we go into this. So I think if we want to have a ref length of zero, right? If we want to basically encode nothing, um, no, if we want to, if we want to not reference any data, then we have to actually spet, set it to zero and encode one byte, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Um, because here it's always going to do plus two. Okay, so, uh, how do I want to write this? What can we reach? So, like, we can reach, because we can encode offset 256, we can read a full byte. So we can go 256, 256, and then there's no implied one here. What happens if you encode a zero here? What if you encode both zeros? Because then that's technically out of bounds, right? That's actually like really weird, right? Um, If you add a zero here, multiply, that becomes zero, and then you subtract off uh, from that, you subtract another zero, so you plus nothing. So that would read out of bounds, would it not? It would crash and rust, but it would read out of bounds here. Um, well, here. So it would take param two and then plus zero, and that would be out of bounds. <laughs> okay, cool, good to know. Um, so 65, 64K, uh, and then we can go another 255 bytes, right? Because we can do, uh, what, 255 times 256, and then we can do 255 on top of that. So 65535, five, right? Makes sense. So that is the, the bounds that we can go. What do you mean by exploitable bugs? Uh, you see changing the executable itself as an exploitation? No, I do not. Yeah. Um, changing the executable is not, in my opinion, finding an exploitable bug. Uh, now, it could, depending on the threat model, right? Like, I would say being able to change the executable on a phone or an Xbox would be an exploitable thing or, or a bug in itself. But for something like this, changing the, changing the actual firmware is not an exploitable thing here. Okay, so here's basically my plan. Um, what do I want to do?
I, so what's the length? Length is prefix and three with an implicit subtract one. So if I were to take a length, that would be three subtract one, so two. So basically the largest length that I can include is two bytes per thing. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do a really weird model and we're just gonna see what happens. So, uh, we'll just tweak it as we see fit. So for uh, while data.len is greater than zero. Um, we're going to encode the maximum size that we can. So we're gonna set the length to zero Oh, and then here it subtracts one. So even if you have a 255, is that correct? Yes, it is, because that is pre-indexed. Um, and that is on the parsed value. So we can do 255 bytes at a time. So let's make our prefix byte. Ref length, let's just get a round trip working first. Um, mute data. Uh, so we're going to say prefix is going to be equal to, uh, ref length is going to be zero, zero, zero. The zero here is going to trigger reading another byte. The zero here is going to trigger reading another byte. Uh, that the bytes that we're going to encode, we're going to encode a zero and a zero here. So we're going to push uh, uh, let me ret is vec new ret dot push prefix ret dot push a zero ret dot push a zero. Um, so that is going to cause us to encode a ret both of these will be zero, which will cause us to read an extra byte, which means that we can supply whatever we want here. This byte, we will supply a zero, which is this. So this is the uh, ref length, and this is the length. Um, and since the ref length is zero, we won't actually do any referencing stuff, which means that these two bits don't actually matter in here. But what we're going to do is push... Um, a 255 or an FF, which is the maximum thing that we can encode there. Now we're going to subtract during this copy here. We subtract one from that length. So even though we encode 255, ooh, how is that done actually? Uvar six is a uint. So that actually gets upcast. Yes. So is that an un <laughs> is that an integer underflow, right? If we were to pass in, if we were to pass in a zero here, right? If we were to encode a zero, which causes this to read a zero, then uh, this would be zero as a uint, and then we would subtract one from that. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be looping for a while. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure this would just loop basically for max int. Sick. Um, yeah. Like, I would consider that an exploitable bug. Now, obviously, we don't actually control the input without changing the flat uh, the firmware. But if this were some lockdown thing or this was like a decompressing something that then gets, you know, checked for signature, which would be weird to check the <laughs> decompressed payload instead... Um, that is kind of a bug, in my opinion. So now we can do uh, ret extend from slice data for not 255, but 255 plus 1. And then we do data is equal to data ff minus 1. And then this should be, this should validly compress data. So what we should be able to do is decompress... Uh, decomp is equal to this, and then we should be able to do uh, compress is equal to compress 
decompress. And then we should be able to assert that decompress data uh, compress is equal to uh, decompress. And this is basically validating that we can round trip. Okay, and uh, we have a problem at 10 here. Oh, because uh, that's unconditional. Um, let's, let remain is equal to, uh, we can just do this. Um, data.len.min oxff as u8. So the smaller between the two encode as a u8. Uh, okay, and this is let chunk size is equal to data.land.min uh, oxff. And then this is chunk size as u8. And then this is chunk size minus one. Son of a bitch. Oh, and then this as well. So this should hopefully round trip. Mm. We're getting stuck. Um. You can send this printer updated firmware over your local network? Yes. Um, what the fuck? We should be hitting this code, and then we're... Okay, this is looping forever. Why? What? What? Doing something dumb. One. Because it's, ah, because it's encoding nothing. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is uh, raw um, size is equal to uh, data.len dot, uh, dot min. Okay, so this is the size we would like to encode as raw data uh, in this payload. Right, then what we're going to do is we're going to say let's... Um, Encodable raw is equal to raw size dot min oxff. Um, the maximum raw size we can encode is uh, 250 uh, is uh, u8 max, right? So we'll say that uh, u8 max just so it's clear. Um, Okay, so this will make sure that we get the smaller of the two values, uh, which means we will not be at 256 because we can't encode a 256. So then what we'll do, um, if, oh, and I guess it's that minus one. I don't know how I want to do the minus one, if I want to add one later, if I want to subtract one now, but I have to kind of figure that out. Um, if encodable raw is less than, um, um, so a zero means there's a following byte, which makes sense because we subtract one unconditionally. Uh, so we can encode a three. So if it's less than or equal to 
if it's less than three, um, um, so we know that it cannot be zero. So technically, we need to check if this is uh, greater than zero, but zero will never happen here. So we'll say, um, uh, and this is going to be let prefix um, size is equal to this, then encodable raw. <sighs> How do I want to do the subtract? It's kind of frustrating uh, because if I subtract one here, that's kind of more accurate in my opinion because then this is the actual size. Um, and then we must uh, subtract one from that value, right? So we take that and then we subtract one. And then that is going to basically give us uh, the number of bytes that we want to encode here. Uh, or do I want to add one to this? Fuck. I'm trying to figure out how I want to do this logic. There, there's many ways you can do this. But ultimately... I have to encode one byte less than the length that I provide, and that means that, uh, like, this value here, I actually, when I specify a three here, it's actually two bytes. It's not three bytes. Um, so, it's kind of annoying, because I think technically the logic is this is the maximum raw size we can encode is max minus one, right? Because the minus, minus one is implied. So if we, if we send a zero and then an FF, then it subtracts one. So then this is going to give us the actual uh, size. Uh, this is the number of bytes we will uh, consume from data and place into the outputs. Um, okay, so then, We can say if the encodable raw is less than two, um, then we can say uh, if it's less than or equal to two, we can safely encode one or two bytes uh, using the prefix bytes. Uh, we can, yeah. We can safely encode a one or two byte length with a, uh, the prefix. So then here, we will do encodable raw plus one. Because if it is a two, if it's equal to two, then this will add one, which will cause it to be a three, which is the largest value that we can encode in here. Otherwise, um, cannot encode the value we want. Um, Cannot encode the size we want in the prefix, uh, so use the um, extra, uh, use an extra 8-bit uh, value. And then here we will do encodable, uh, this is the prefix size is here. Um, And then uh, extra size is this. Okay. And then here, 
the extra size is going to be sum encodable raw plus one. Then here we will shift in encode uh, prefix size. Um, and we'll do the casting here. Okay, this is uh, construct the prefix and push it. Then we'll say if let sum uh, extra or val is equal to extra size, then ret.push val. And then uh, the ref length will always push for now because we are setting a zero here, uh, which will cause that's always get encoded. And this will encode. Uh, the extra size if we need it, right? And then the ref length, and then here, this is encodable raw. Same thing here. Um... Because this will be min, this would be fe. So if the start of the loop, this would be fe, which would cause us to add one. Well, fe is not less than or equal to two. So we say zero, which will cause this to be emit. And then we uh, emit this, which would be fe plus one, which is ff as a u8. And then we come down here, and we actually encode fe bytes not ff bytes, which is good. And then this should work now. And looks like that round trip just fine. Okay, so obviously um, this is not going to compress very well. So we can say uh, compression uh, ratio is this. Um, and we can do uh, compress len as f64 divided by decompress len as f64 0.5 yeah okay sweet it's larger that makes sense um and that should be close to uh 257 over 256 no yeah two bytes uh well, it's actually three bytes. We have a prefix, right? One, two, three bytes. Uh, so to encode 255 bytes, actually 254 bytes is the largest payload, we need to use 254 plus three. So uh, 1.0118, yeah. Look at that, 1.011811. Oh. And this is a little bit more. This is a smidge more. Uh, and that makes sense because the trailing data, right? The trailing data gets encoded a little bit uh, larger. Um, okay. So, while the compression is not great, um, <laughs> the compression is not amazing, it works, right? We round tripped it. Now, all this means, um, honestly, like the runtime of this just doesn't matter, right? This is probably basically instantaneous. Ship it. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we do need to compress. We need to fit 16 megs of data in 10 megs. So we have to compress. Okay, so this is uh, determine the prefix sizing to use. A brute force check of all sizes in the windows. That is my plan. <laughs> my plan is, it's not perfect compression, is it? I mean, I can, can I make this perfect compression? No. I can't make this perfect compression in hindsight. Um, 
And the reason for that... Wait, can I? No, I can't. Um, basically, the, so my plan is to basically, uh, you'd need to do two of the end operations, correct. But I can do a reduced form, um, and, and basically the, the, the goal is here is to do kind of a, a reduced form where basically, um, I will emit, um, I want to, basically the first iteration of the loop, I will see that there is no data in the compressed output. And if there's no data in the compressed output, then I can't refer to compressed output. Thus, um, if I can't refer to compressed output, then there's nothing to do. So I think the first loop iteration, I'm going to dump as many bytes. So the logic is going to be, if there is no data to reference, dump the largest amount of data that you possibly can right away, right? So the first loop iteration will dump basically 254 bytes to the, to the outputs. So that will cause us to emit 257 bytes. Then, on the next iteration, what I'm going to do is try to find the largest sequence in the previous bytes inside of the window from where we are. And then encode that. Um, and then do I just want to encode the next 256? I guess, what is it? The break-even point is four bytes. So I think the logic should basically be, if, if in the window you cannot find a repetition that is four bytes in length, or two bytes in length, I don't know, there's a break-even point, but we'll just, we'll just fucking write that code. Basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna scan the window for a blob that is threshold. And if we don't find a blob of threshold, then we will fall back to just emitting the raw data. Uh, and it's hard to know how much to emit. Um, it's actually really hard to figure out how much to compress here. But basically, I need to make the next primitive. So we can now encode by setting encodable by setting raw size, we are able to choose the size that we would like to encode. So we can just pick whatever we want. Um, so that is kind of like a high level abstraction where basically if we set that value, that data is going to get shipped. Um, oh, and can we refer to what we just shipped? You can. Right? Pram2. Yes, you can refer to data you have just sent. Um... Can you just do zero and FF and cheat? Oh, of course, but I don't want to cheat. I actually want to do this because it's going to be fun. You only refer to uncompressed data. Right. Um, but I can refer to uncompressed data that I haven't put into the, into the compressed buffer yet, right? Because this data has been, you know, We basically can refer to things that we decompressed based on the included part after the prefix. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to make a high level abstraction. 
such that I can basically just specify the prefix information and just have it chug. Um, so, basically, once the raw size has been determined, uh, or the encodable raw, we can do um, determine the window of data which can be um, referenced, right? And this is going to be window is equal to um, a reference. We'll just say, we'll just uh, set the end part right now, which is uh, encodable raw, right? We can refer to things that we just sent, correct? Um, if that makes sense. We didn't actually send anything. Uh, but basically, the, the logic there is that um, since we can refer to something, we can actually refer to something that's out of bounds. But we, if we set one byte back, it's actually, and we encode one byte in here, then we can refer to that, um, which, is, which is kind of weird. Um, but we're going to abuse that by basically, we are going to pick the size of data that we are going to transmit raw with this payload, which is encodable raw. And then once that has been decided, we can figure out our window. In fact, we actually need to know that information to know what our window is. Um, yeah, we actually have to know this first, which is kind of interesting. So then what we can do is once we have picked that, uh, the window is encodable raw minus uh, whichever is smaller. So uh, win start is equal to encodable raw dot um, len. Or sorry, I want to do yeah. Encodable raw ret dot len plus encodable raw. So this is the end of the window. So it's zero plus that is the end of the window technically inclusive, but we're going to treat it as exclusive so we don't go out of bounds. Um, so that's the end, correct? So then we can do saturating sub of 256 times 255 plus 255, right? Um, and that should basically be 256 times 255 plus 255, 65535, right? And that is because when we decompress, this offset, 256, uh, is just the raw byte, and we multiply that by 256, so 0 to 255, so somewhere in that range, and then offset is uh, 255. We don't subtract one or do anything weird there, do we? No, we do not. Okay. So this is the window start. So then we can say data... Oh, not ret.len. Let orig equals data. I want orig.len minus data.len. So that is the number of bytes that we have consumed from the input buffer. Um, orig.len will be larger. So let's imagine the first iteration of this loop, orig.len and data.len at this point will be the same, which means this will be zero. We will add the encodable raw, so the payload that we have here, and then we'd saturating sub this, which will potentially put us all the way down to zero. Uh, win start dot dot. And then that window 
end um at um oh yeah and this is on a ridge so the basically the offset we take the the window starts at the offset where we currently are plus the number of bytes that we can encode raw saturating sub the maximum amount that we can subtract and then it ends uh yeah so we'll just say windows end here and then win start is equal to this correct if that's zero plus encodable raw if we for some reason encoded zero uh then this would be win end is zero I think that is the correct logic, is it not? Um, so, compute how much we have already read, plus the amount that we are going to actually add in this. Um, the window is in the inputs. Okay. Um, cool. So this hasn't done anything, right? Um, and that makes sense because we're not actually using any of this information. So now what you want to do is, um, Uh, get the next data uh, point uh, slice. So this is uh, next data is equal to a ref of data encodable raw, right? Which is basically this logic. So now this is what is following us. And what we can do is basically now we can go through that window and we want to find the largest sequence in there. So, um, for chunk in window dot windows, um, Next data dot len hmm. I guess we just want to go through each of the offsets. Let biggest match is equal to none. Right. Matching is equal to zero. The number of matching bytes. Um, I think there's a good way to do this with an iterator, can't I? I can do like... Um, um window i i dot 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 iter dot um because i know i can like do a count on an iterator i'm trying to think of the best way i don't do iterators much in rust to be honest 
Um, um, do I want to count or do a find? I guess filter count. So iter zip next data filter. Then I should have an A and B. A equals B counts. No, I don't necessarily want to filter. Yeah, I don't want to filter. Uh, I can do a. Um, I'm going to do a find. T take while. Take while. So go through the window. And this will go all the way to the last window. Take while A is equal to B. And if A is immediately not equal to B, then this would be 0. Um, matching is equal to this, right? I think that's good. And we do need prints. Okay, and we're just gonna say like, if matching is greater than zero, just to make sure this logic works. But it's zero most of the time, which is good. Okay, biggest match um, is going to be equal to, so this is uh, get the number of matching bytes at this uh, index in the window. Okay. Um... If biggest match is none, or biggest match is less than, hmm. Yeah, I kind of don't like this. Let's say biggest match is zero, zero. If biggest match zero, uh, if matching, is greater than this, then biggest match is equal to sum, uh, is equal to um, matching the number of bytes that match and the index in the window. Okay, so a uh, tuple containing uh, largest number of matching bytes, uh, window index. Okay, find the largest uh, match in the window. Okay, so we have like 32s, 30s. Um, nothing too crazy in here. But there's definitely some big sequences in here. You a hacker? I am a hacker. Yeah, like some of these are pretty good. I think this logic is correct, though. Uh, slice up the window. 
zip it with the data, the, the subsequent data, find the biggest match. So that looks pretty good. Um, now, determine the prefix sizing. So that, it, basically, we have already assumed that we have encoded that data. Um, head. Are you a lead hacker? Oh, I'm the leadest hacker. Oh, I got rid of the print. And that's good. It means that we were able to find a match in the first data, which is fantastic. Um, then what we want to do is um, we encode the ref length. Wow. Um, if it is zero, huh? So if we don't refer to anything, we actually have to encode an extra byte. Um, determine the prefix reference sizing to use, and basically the reference length, we actually add two. The ref length plus two. So if biggest match dot zero is greater than or equal to two, um, basically, if the reference length is not at least two, we can't encode it because. Uh, I guess we can do a zero. Well, a zero means we don't reference anything. Uh, and that would be a prefix of zero and then an extra byte of zero would basically mean don't reference anything. Um, so what we can do is say, uh, let's prefix size, extra size, uh, prefix ref size and extra ref size. And we'll say if the biggest match is less than two, uh, cannot reference a sequence less than two bytes. Uh, thus, we must encode an empty length. And to do that, we actually have to say a ref size of zero, which means we're including an additional byte. And the additional byte that we're including is a zero. And then otherwise, if biggest match dot zero is less than um or equal to uh less than or equal to 15 plus 2 uh note there is an implicit plus 2 to reference lengths right so then we're going to say if it's four nibbles right yeah it's four nibbles and if those four nibbles are, if it's, if we have F, we have 15, 15 plus two is that size. So if we encode, um, if the biggest match is less than or equal to 15 plus two, uh, if it's less than two, which means it could be two here. Um, and if it is two here, then we would encode it as a, whoa. Oh, that's fucky. <laughs> oh, that's gross, dude. Um, technically, we can't really do a th three or a two because a two, we can do a two, but it would be another level of logic. Um, I guess we can do, otherwise, if, because if it is two, um, if it is a two, then we can't encode it as a zero. So we're just going to say a three. 
Um, otherwise, we need to add additional logic. Yeah, there's just no reason. We're just going to do that. So we're going to say, um, technically, we can encode a reference of length. Uh, we can't. Less than three bytes. We can't. Because a two-byte reference would be a zero with another zero. And that would cause it to not be anything at all. So we actually can't do this makes sense. So if it is less than 3, then we can't encode it. If it is 3, then uh, if it's less than or equal to 15 plus 2, then we can encode it. Um, uh, we can encode it without an extra byte, in which case we will do biggest match dot 0 minus 2, which we know is in bounds, and then no additional bytes. In all other cases, this will be um, um, then in this case, we will encode a zero and then a sum biggest match dot zero minus two. Okay. And then here, um, and I think that logic is fine. If it's less than three, then we cannot encode it. If it is three, then in theory, we can go here where we take three, we subtract two. That gives us a one. We don't encode an additional byte, so we just end up referencing something. Um, yes, so that is good. Um, and that makes sense because there's a lot of metadata that we need anyways to encode like this. So how quickly does this run? It's very slow. <laughs> um... OK. That didn't take too long that we're still going to do this perfect window, this, the, scan the whole window. But there's actually some logic in here that we also need. Um, matching dot the smaller of the two. Um, I think it's 257, right? The largest size that we can encode for ref length is FF. So 255 plus 2. Um, OK, and then here we'll say uh, cannot encode larger than this anyways. Okay, and then we'll say if biggest match dot zero, uh, we're just going to leave it. Technically, we could do an early exit where basically if, if biggest match is equal to this, um, then just exit the loop early, but we just don't care. Okay, so if the matching length is larger than that, the min is this, uh, and then that way, we know that this value, well, first of all, we know that that definitely fits in a U8, and then this one, we know this will fit in a U8 because FF plus 2 minus 2 is FF as a U8 is a valid encoding. OK. 
Okay. So then the prefix is now going to have a reference to um this is the prefix ref size. Push the prefix, and then we're going to say if let sum val is equal to extra ref size, then we'll push this value. Um, encode the extra reference size if we need it. So now this is no longer going to round trip. Right? Yeah, this should round trip just fine. Or this should not round trip because we're pushing shit that we're not using. Okay. Then this is determine the. Yep, perfect. Then determine the prefix. Um. So when is the encoding when does the encoding stuff come into play? Byte offset. Okay. So determine the prefix and offset two fifty six is that. If it's equal to three Uh, so this is determined the encoding for the um, uh, window offsets, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say if, what do we have? We have the prefix offsets. We're going to have the uh, byte offsets which is optional. And then we're going to have the um, large offsets is equal to if fuck. Um, if biggest match dot one and uh, if biggest match dot one is less than or equal to uh, 256 times two plus Um, right, because, uh, sorry, it's 255 times 2, right? No, it's 256 times 2, um, plus 255. So there's always an additional byte. If there's a reference, then there's always a byte offset. So we can always do that. And then if it is 0, 1, or 2, then we can use the prefix multiplied by 256. So 0, 1, or 2, 2 times 256 falls in this range. So in this case, um, we can say, uh, prefix offset is uh, equal to, this is going to be biggest match dot one divided by 256. Yeah. Because uh, if we want to encode, yeah, that's fine. And then the byte offset is biggest match dot one mod 256. Right? 
So if we had 256 times 2 plus 255, uh, let's just 256 times 2 plus 255. So 767 divided by 256 uh, is 2. And then mod by 256 is 255. And that makes sense, because we would take 2 times, perfect. And then the large offset is none. Otherwise, uh, so this is, we can use the prefix to encode the offset. And then in this situation, oh, fuck. This is not the offset, actually. Let window offset is equal to, um, The window offset is not actually that. It's not ii as we're encoding it. Um, it is actually win end minus ii. Right? Because the end of the window, and then our window is on original, no, it's not that, fuck. Um, how do I reference that? Uh, I have to do more math, don't I? Win end, and then I, I, no, I think this is fine. Because if we found it at zero, then it would just be win end minus zero. And let's say that was saturating sub all the way down. In which case that would be 256 times 255 would be the difference between those two. No, this isn't right. Wait, is this right at all? Consumed bytes, no, this is correct. Then window end is basically the index into original at the end. I think this is right. Okay, 64, okay. Um, we must use an extra prefix, uh, an extra byte for the offset. In which case, the prefix is gonna be a three, which is the special encoding. And then we can say biggest match dot one mod 256, and then we can say sum biggest match dot one divided by 256. Good. And then here we can say prefix off. Um, extra size, extra ref size. Then we have uh, encode the data. Um, encodable raw, okay, 
And then, once we have done that, encode the um, offset byte, uh, if let sum val is equal to the byte offset. Oh, that's optional. Um, if, if extra ref size is equal to sum zero, else if this, um, no referenced data will be used, and thus none, 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 technically zero, none, none. Okay, and then these have to become sums. Oh, we did that. Okay, cool. Encode the offset bytes, uh, ret.pushval, and then we have encode the um, extra offset bytes. If let sum val is equal to those byte off and then large off ret.push val. I'm going to do the cast here. Seventy four. Gross. As you ate. I am very skeptical this whole round trip first try. And it, it definitely won't because we now have to um, advance the uh, data um, data is ref data data um if extra f size is sum uh, is not equal to sum zero by the amount referenced and I subtract two for those encodings biggest match actually is the size that we're encoding here I'm really scared I have that referencing wrong. There's a chance this round trips, but I don't think it will. But I do, th this is like the logic. Um. One forty nine. Um, that compression ratio, first of all, is shit.
But, uh, something is also wrong. Okay, we're just gonna go, um, I window in. That round tripped. Okay. Uh, so the size that, let's say we want to encode eight bytes at a time at most. And this should improve it the compression ratio, I think. We're going to loop a lot more, though. <laughs> That's going to be a problem. Um... Um, ridge dot len minus data dot len as f64 compress size divided by data dot len a ridge dot len no ret dot len as f64 divided by this Um, right? The length of the currently compressed data divided by the number of bytes that have been compressed. Hmm. Like, in theory, that could plummet, but... We want the percent lower. So if I do like one, it should be quite high. It might go sub one. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Hmm. I'm going to say if biggest match dot zero is greater than four break. I mean, maybe bottlenecking on prints. Hmm. Um.
Do we just change the algorithm here that we use? Um, basically, it's just it's just too slow is the problem. Um, let's just see what these refs are. Next data. What if we do raw size is zero? Yeah. So what we're gonna do is next data is this. We're gonna find the biggest match. Then we're gonna say um, min thirty two. If um if biggest match dot zero is greater than four, then this will do eight else zero. Uh sorry. If the biggest match is greater than, let's say if it's equal to eight. Uh, that wasn't what I wanted. I want... Window. This. Plus zero. So this basically won't include bytes we just wrote. Um... But we can make a decision about how much we want to encode based on the match. Mm, yeah, I don't know. We're going to go back to the old algo. Try 32, just curious. Hmm. No 720p 30 option today? Huh, no idea why. What compression are we aiming for? Sub 50? I think like 30. Is it? Um, so 30 is like what they have, but we want like 60, 62 is kind of required for us. Why did that get so slow there? Eighty seven percent. Like, what tunables do we have? So, we can cap the window size. We can cap the window size to something we can encode a little bit easier. Okay. Now we can set this to a tighter value. Yikes. 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 Hmm.
Um. Okay, let's encode eight bytes. Uh, let's do deep refs, but let's require, let's require like a 16 byte match to encode anything. Actually, no, I mean, three makes sense. What if, what if we just go to like five? Like, we're not doing something wrong, are we? Compression ratio, so decompress that data. Let's just try zero. Let decomp is vec OU8 a fucking meg. Um, okay. And we can say, uh, print, yeah, the original decompression ratio, hmm. And we assert that they're on trip. Oh, we stop at a certain point. I think we have a bug. I think we maybe have a bug. Oh, maybe not. I mean, we stop when we get to this length. Which, we know that's the size of the decompressed data. Hmm. So if we did two there, we'll, we'll basically, by doing two there, we guarantee that, uh, we guarantee that this never gets hit. So we've kind of, Oh, sorry, not that one. Um, this. So we've capped the the size. Now this has to get encoded if we do an offset. And then this extra ref size and extra size, what we're going to do is, I guess if the reference is too big, we're not going to use it. So then that will prevent us from using this extra ref size. Really? Um, Um, I really don't like how hard it is to skip the reference stuff. What the fuck, dude? I'm 
Maybe like a four? That window size seems to matter quite a bit. Seven point nine megs, and what is this compression strat? So Um, their compression ratio, so I'm figuring that out. Their compression ratio is 53.8%. They get it down to 8.9 megs. Gzip gets it down to 7.9 megs. Um... Holy fuck, like, I, I'm actually, like, mind-boggled uh, what kind of, like, strategy must be, like, important to use. It's possible that they, like, had a, like, we are, we don't do any look-ahead. Um, obviously, look-ahead would be huge here. But we basically search through the win search through the window for the largest match. I like my hunch, my my gut feeling is that I would expect this to be very close to I like very close to at least a good ratio. And that's what's so crazy to me, that it's, like, not even close. Like... I can't even get in the ballpark. Huh. Like, I can play with this, right? Um, I think having access to the full window is good. Ah, here we go. Let's find the nearest match. So even if it's equal, then we'll go, we'll favor a nearer match, which isn't a big difference, but this means we will, we will bias towards uh, nearer matches. Min that. Okay, so let's take a look at their original uh, decompression. Um, let's say print reference of this, and then we can say uh, reference plus uh, ref length plus two. Um, so threes make sense, and, and that's what we say. We basically say, uh, if it's less than three, we cannot encode a reference. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Uh, Reference ratio is this. This is going to basically give... Um, this is going to tell me the uh, frequency that a reference is used. I just said it's fine. 99.8% of the time, there's a reference. That is a very high reference ratio. We're not, I don't think we're close to that, are we? We have a very low reference ratio. Very low reference ratio. Um... Oh, and then it climbs, but it's not 99%. Is this not working? Hmm. Um, we'll just do that. Dude, it like always has a reference. Five, six, one, fourteen, two, three, four, Like, it's always referencing stuff. Are you buffering raw? No, I'm not. I'm always, I'm using fixed raw. It's pretty bad. Yeah, of course. But I wouldn't expect it to be this bad. Like, I feel like there's, I feel like we have a bug, right? 
Um. Keep a buffer of raw data and only flush it once you have a good enough match or you hit the max size. I mean, that sounds reasonable, but how would I not be finding refs? Oh, I, I, I see what you're saying. Basically, we keep fucking up the alignment where we can't find matches. Okay. That's easy to implement. Um, So we want to do a forward search, but we don't want to do a forward search for any reason other than um, increasing the reference size. Um, let me, okay, for blah in zero dot dot raw size, uh, let's just say like data dot line dot min uh 64 then this is raw size um Rebel L L L Litter, thank you so much for the two months of support. Hell yeah. Little, 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 little. Uh. Raw size is that, and then that. Codable raw, so you compute that. So find the largest match for a window. Okay, and then we don't have a... raw size just kind of hacking this in right now it's not amazing It's gonna be very slow, right? But basically, we look through all of the raw sizes. Look through all of the raw sizes up to 64. And we're basically scanning forwards and we're finding basically what raw size gives us the best next uh, reference. Okay. Um, so then what we want to do is print the compression ratio here. Um, uh, 
let's comp ratio is equal to ridge uh, dot len minus data dot len as f64 number of consumed bytes uh, divided by ret dot len as f64 that should be the compression ratio the running compression ratio here so we can basically see the compression ratio um, and it starts out high uh, head n 50 hmm yeah it's pretty good pretty fast like it it doesn't settle in immediately, but we can just say um, comp r 10.6, and then we'll say uh, this is the consumed length. So we'll do ridge.len. Sorry, this is going to be the compressed, the decompressed length. Okay, um, I'm gonna do this at the end. Grep comper log.txt. Uh, and then we'll just uh, like panic. Okay, um, so. Now, what we have done is we have a log uh, history vim plot the plot plot log dot text u one two with line uh, set term wxt size fourteen forty by nine hundred persists be good enough so here we can basically see the compression ratio uh, versus the um, this is the compression ratio versus the number of bytes that have been decompressed um, okay so, uh, log2, log2.txt, and history C, cargo run release. Okay, and we're going to want to figure out that same compression ratio. Um, same sort of thing. What we're going to do, uh, once again, 10. This is going to be the ret.len, so the compressed size. No, we want the decompressed size. Uh, data dot len, and then the compression ratio. We'll just do ten dot six on here. Comper on that. So basically, I need to see whether or not we're actually getting deep enough to be upset about this compression ratio, because uh, we might not be deep enough, and that's basically the goal of this log dot text. Gonna let this run just a little bit. Then plot dot plot. And then we'll plot log two. And we can see kind of how they compare. Uh, and basically, we only want to look kind of at the start. Um, and we see that there are trends, but we are higher. Now that being said, the compression ratio isn't absurdly low for this one yet. So what we want to do is just play with this. Uh, raw size is uh, up to, what's the maximum size that we can do? Uh, 254 is the largest raw size. We'll just do this. So that has made it worse, and the reason that has made that worse is um, I think we might just be looking too far ahead.
because we end up not recompressing things. So we end up putting too much raw data in to get, to end up getting to a place where we save bytes. Uh, actually, what we need to do is math and find the correct ratio. Whoa. What happened here? What? What's going on there? It just stops processing things. I guess... Yeah, we gotta do this. Are you winning, son? Not sure yet. A72! 72? Okay. Alright, here's, here's the actual math. Scan up to 254. Let's... Um... We want to optimize for, um, basically, if we find a bigger match 20 bytes in the future, we don't want to, um, if we find a 5 byte match 20 bytes in the future, and we find a 19 byte match 0 bytes in the future, we don't want to emit 20 raw bytes just to save one byte, right? We need to find that balance. Uh, and that should just be simple subtraction, and we basically just have to change our optimization function here. Um, and the way that we change that is um, um, basically we just want the trade-off, right? Raw size, we want to maximize I guess we can just simulate the compression ratio. We don't know it 100% due to some of the padding bytes, but that is actually the correct way to do it. Um, looks like a good programming challenge, yeah. So basically, for up to 254 bytes, we can encode zero raw bytes, but we could potentially deadlock. Um, what I think I... I can literally simulate effectively what we're going to do, right? And I can just compute the compression ratio of the next chunk. And I can just find the most optimized, including the metadata. And that is the correct way to do this. And it doesn't cost much more. Um, I mean, it costs a lot, right? But what we do already costs a lot. Um... So, so far, what this is going to do, uh, so this should work as is. So, I need to compute this information here. I don't want to copy pasta this code, but I'm going to just for now. Um... I'm going to leave it indented like shit intentionally. So, let uh, uncompressed is equal to the number of uncompressed bytes that are going to be consumed is biggest match dot zero. Um, Uh, this. So you need this logic. 
Um, this is equal to raw size. Well, I guess this is encodable raw. Uh, so the uncompressed, so this is the um, bytes encoded, uh, raw, and then uncompressed uh, plus equals um, matching, or more specifically, biggest match dot zero. Hmm. Matching. We're just going to do this. Matching. Okay, and then this is the offset. Um... Uh, which is this. Just hacking this in right now. Okay plus equals matching. So this should still run, it's just none of this shit is used. And then, uh, let me compressed is equal to the amount of, uh, so this is the uncompressed data that will be encoded. And then the compressed data that will be encoded is going to be encodable raw, um, one plus encodable raw, because we have a prefix. So basically, anywhere that we do a push. So prefix is one, the encodable raw here, and then we've got four more. Yeah, we have four things. So if... Um, If XRF size is some, or I guess uh, we can just do this plus this. Um, um, can I do an option to bool? Yeah, I can. It's literally is some. That's what I was doing. Um, as uh, U32 is fine here, or U size, plus, extra size, plus, the byte offset, plus, the large offset. So this is the size of this, um, and those are all independent. So this now is going to basically pre-compute the size of the compressed data. So then we can say, um, now our optimization function is um, let forward comper forward compression ratio is equal to um, compressed as F64 divided by uncompressed ah, as F64. And we can say if the forward compression ratio is 
uh, less than biggest match zero one two three forward compression ratio. Okay, and then it's not happy due to this zero dots. So this is now going to basically go through and simulate the compression ratios for all of the possible combinations that we use looking forwards. Um, 